It is Wednesday, June 15th, Fed Day. We are here in New York City. Brian Sazi just gave me an energy mint that is Fired more up. spicy. Do it. And I'm ready to go. He's sitting over there next to Brad Smith. This is Yahoo Finance Live. Let's take a look at what futures are doing here on this a busy day here. And we are seeing futures indicating a higher open. It's interesting to actually see even this much action ahead of the Fed decision, which, of course, is broadly expected to be an increase of 75 basis points. We are going to dig more into that in just a moment. We are also watching what's going on with yields here this morning after reaching their highest point going back to 2011, 3.36%. We're seeing a drop in yields this morning. Again, interesting on a day when we were expected to get an announcement of higher rates, but perhaps that was already priced in. And now we're seeing a little bit of backing off or concern about the U.S. economy being baked in there. And then the other big, big move we are watching this morning continues to be in cryptocurrencies and in Bitcoin specifically, which went below 21,000. Now is back above that level, but still down 4% on the session. Guys? All right, let's bring in our very own Brian Chung, who is live in D.C. ahead of the big Federal Reserve meeting. Brian. Hey, morning, guys. Well, a big day here in Washington, D.C. I'm standing right outside the Federal Reserve building. They've got the fence up right now. I guess they're doing the lawn, but they're likely to bring that fence down later on today to show us a little bit about what they're thinking in terms of interest rate policy. The expectation now that the Fed is going to raise interest rates by three quarters of a percent or 0.75 percent. That is a dramatic change from market expectations just at the end of last week that the Fed would only move by half a percentage point as they had been messaging for the last five weeks. Obviously, that high inflation report that we got from the Consumer Price Index showing 8.6% year-over-year inflation, spooking the Fed into wanting to get more aggressive here. Things to watch for in this meeting. First off, we're going to get an updated round of economic projections from the Federal Reserve, not only showing where they could see interest rates going in the future, but also their projections on inflation. Does that report from last week get them to revise up their expectations for how persistent inflation will remain above their 2% target? And then the second thing, of course, to watch is any sort of commentary from the Fed chairman about how he's thinking about this aggressive pace and whether or not they're going to stick with 75 basis point moves in the July and then forward meetings. All that commentary expected at the Fed press uh, conference at 2.30 p.m. Of course, we'll have the full coverage of that right here on Yahoo Finance, guys. Hey, hey Brian, you know, continuing in kind of that thread of the thought where a lot of the fireworks could take place after the initial decision and in that press conference, what do you plan on asking Fed Chair Jerome Powell? Well, there's so many places to go. Usually I'm towards the end of the press conference, so I kind of have a lot of options to go with. Do I elaborate on something that he's already tried to answer or do I just ask something from left field? Now, of course, all of the attention in this particular meeting is going to be on certainty in the future. I think broadly that is thematic to how markets are reading what the Fed is doing. If they promised for the last five weeks they were going to do one thing and then last minute change it, what does that mean for the credibility of future forward guidance? That's going to be something that I'm very interested to hear from the Fed chairman if he wants to say, look, we're going to be more aggressive here. We're going to stay on 75s in the future. Well, how credible is that guidance given the pivot that we've seen just over the last few market sessions? But of course, a number of other things worth watching. First off, a lot of people forgot that the Fed balance sheet roll-off program began this month. Could they adjust that in the future? And then secondly, uh, how does the Federal Reserve think about the risks of recession, even perhaps financial stability with some of the route that we've seen in uh, crypto, for example, or in the broad equity markets? Is the Fed worried about that spilling over into other broader economic conditions? All things to watch for in that press conference later on this afternoon. Yeah, and the credibility issue is really important. A guest that we're going to talk to in just a moment said in a note to us uh, called the Fed policy sloppy and choppy. Um, Let's also talk about credibility when it comes to other central banks, namely the European Central Bank, which held an emergency meeting today, emergency, and then came out with a statement that one could argue wasn't necessarily an emergency type action. Yeah, a lot of central bank action this morning with that 5 a.m. Eastern time emergency meeting that the European Central Bank called together. I feel like I need six energy mints just to keep (laughs) holds of all of this news that's breaking. But look, all this is about 
the F word, fragmentation rather, fragmentation in the euro area. That is what Christine Lagarde actually hinted at when the ECB had its pre-scheduled announcement not so long ago. But uh, after remarks from another ECB member yesterday, it seemed like the ECB figured that they need to get around the table to talk about differentials in yields across the many different types of government bonds. And I want to just kind of take a step back here and remind our viewers that whereas the Federal Reserve only has one domestic sovereign bond market to watch, that is U.S. Treasuries, the European Central Bank has to watch every single domestic sovereign bond for all the members of the euro zone. So when you take a look, for example, at the Italian 10-year, that has risen by about 3% just since the beginning of this year. The German bond year, uh, bond about 10 years uh, in duration as well, only rising about 1.5%. What does that do to flows in and out of the eurozone? That's a big concern for the ECB as there's different realized inflation in those different countries. The statement that we got out of that emergency meeting this morning said, based on this assessment, the governing council decided that it will apply flexibility in reinvesting redemptions among, uh, coming due in the uh, portfolio that has to do with their emergency purchase program. Program, essentially their bond buying program. They might bias that towards uh, governments that perhaps are getting more differential than other governments. We don't have the details of that. And as you mentioned, Julie, the details of this are very slim. If anything, this seems to be more of a plan about a plan as opposed to a hard details about exactly what they plan to do. All right. Yahoo Finance's own Brian Chung. You can stay tuned to watch Brian break the Fed decision live on Yahoo Finance at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Switching gears here, everyone, we're getting a better idea of how inflation is impacting the retail space in this morning's retail sales report. And particularly looking at the headline figure that came out, it was actually a decrease of three tenths of a percent from the prior month, but then 8.1 percent above May 2021 for the most recent data that's come through. You're taking a look at the actuals versus what the estimate was here from May retail sales, which was a move higher of one tenth of a percent. This whole report screams a consumer under increasing pressure. I saw the I see the retail sales numbers weakness in uh, home furnishings weakness in electronic categories those big ticket purchases very much dovetails what we heard from Target also dovetails with some new data out of city that I got uh, that tracks a uh, credit card data uh, over at city you can see slowing sales really across the board versus trends in May. Uh, and look, I spent the day yesterday at Abercrombie and Fitch's Investor Day, and some of the top questions from analysts to their executive team was about recession and inflation. So, I, look, everything that I heard yesterday and continue to see in the data certainly played out in this report. And again, see a lot of week, auto dealers week, electronics week, non-store retailers week. Uh, and again, I think that's in large part because of the stresses on consumer budgets. Yeah, I mean, that really stood out to me, the auto dealers. That was the biggest move to the downside was the auto dealers drop of 4%. If you put in parts and auto dealers, you get a drop of 3.5%. And you wonder how much of that is uh, availability, right? Mm -hmm. How much of that is price with consumers saying, I'm not going to pay this, I'm going to wait. Um, it, it's difficult to say just from this number. We'll have to get more data points to find that out. But electronics, to your point, definitely. Non-store retailers, which effectively is mostly Amazon, right? Because right. when we're talking about pure play online retailers, traditionally, Amazon has been the bulk of that. So that could be an Amazon indicator there when you look at that non-store retail number down by 1.0%. I think it also begs this larger question, kind of forward looking from here, you were mentioning some of the credit card spending data, and we got that MasterCard spending pulse data yesterday. That's looking as far out as the back to school season. And so even if the consumer is weathering this in the month of May, and even some of that perhaps dovetailing into June, where is it in this data that some of the card operators themselves are also seeing strength to lead them to forecast 7.5% growth I, year I, over year? I didn't understand where those numbers came from. Right. Uh, well, that, that is completely detached from the realities of this retail sales report, exactly. the data out of city, and what executives or retailers are telling you. And of course, the likes of Target. Uh, when you saw this retail sales report below expectations, everything that Target said two and a half weeks ago played out in this retail report today. Yeah, we had a little bit of a preview yes. in, those, uh, in those target numbers. Um, and let's talk more about the economic backdrop and, of course, the Fed decision today, as well as market reaction that we could see. Let's bring in 22V research founder Dennis DeButcher and Anastasia Amoroso, chief investment strategist at iCapital. Good to see you both. Anastasia, I'm going to start with you because I already quoted you earlier when you called a Fed policy sloppy and choppy. Um, talk to me about the credibility of the Fed, because on the one hand, the message from the Fed had been that they were going to be data dependent and be nimble. On the other hand, getting the signal two days before the decision that it was going to be different than the market predicted. What does that do to Fed credibility, Anastasia? 
Good to see you, Julie. And I'll have to reiterate what I said before. It has been very sloppy. And, you know, it's just really difficult for the markets to stabilize here when the Fed says one thing one week and then immediately flip flops and says something else the following week. So unfortunately, I do have to say that I think the credibility is er is eroding here. They might have been better off. And, and I understand, by the way, what Fed Chair Powell was trying to do. He was trying to strike this balanced tone. And then the last time he did that, the markets traded up on that. But then you waste that all away in a few weeks time. And what I was going to say is I think the markets might have been better off if he clearly said that we need to get rates to two and a half percent as soon as possible. And we may do this in pretty aggressive increments. I think the markets might have been OK with that because what they need is clarity. They need a predictable path. And that's exactly what we have a lack thereof. I mean, just think about how much the market pricing had to move on basically hints from the Fed. We moved from 2.6% being priced in for February of 2023 to now almost 4% being priced in for that time frame. So uh, it's the Fed, unfortunately, that is very difficult to gauge the reaction function off of. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure that's going to change, but what it means for the markets is, is just going to continue to be a struggle for now. Dennis, would it be better for the Fed to come out here today Raise rates by 100 basis points. Let's start getting the, some of this done so the market can begin to repair itself. Uh, no. I mean, I, 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 that's a careful what you wish for a moment. I mean, you, <laughs> I mean, take that logic to its extreme. You want to go 100? Let's go 200. Let's go 400. You know, let's see what happens. Let's crush the economy. I don't think um, that would be the path to uh, a stabilization in market confidence, et cetera. Um, I think what we're dealing with, which is underappreciated, is an economy that has been hit with multiple shocks over the last few years and continues to be, which makes forecasting extraordinarily difficult. And the Fed is doing you know, the best that they can. They clearly made a mistake, by the way, uh, by getting way behind the curve. But they're marking to market now based on the data. And the data has been very strong on the inflationary side, very strong on the service economy side. It's not slowing as quickly as they need it to. Yes, on the goods economy, which you already highlighted, but it's not happening yet on the service side of the economy. And that needs to happen before we can talk about financial conditions not, tight, not needing to tighten anymore. Um, we have to really get to the heart of the issue, though. And I want to make this point. There's so much emphasis on how much more they may need to tighten or not. What we really need to know is, has the financial conditions tightening we've seen, which would include mortgage rates going higher, which would include stocks going down, which includes credit spreads moving wider, is that enough to slow economic growth and achieve the Fed's goal of slowing inflation meaningfully down towards their target. And if the answer to that question is yes, you have some chance for the markets to stabilize. So if the answer to that question is no, then we have a lot, you know, a lot more downside risk. But that's the unfortunate situation we find ourselves in. Anastasia, one of the common thoughts that we can continue to come back to is the fact that whatever action the Fed takes today, that's not going to directly be a silver bullet to supply chain issues. That's not going to necessarily rectify some of the other matters that have really prompted inflation to run hot to this point in time. That, that's absolutely right. And, you know, the Fed has to control what they can't control. But unfortunately, they can't control food inflation, really. They can't control energy inflation, really. And what you see in the retail report today, that's what consumers are forced to spend more and more of their money on because that inflation is running because of the supply issues that the Fed absolutely cannot fix. But I think the reason why they're talking about 75 basis points is that they're trying to perhaps counterbalance the surge in headline inflation that they can't fully control with trying to control the other parts of the core CPI component by raising rates. And I think looking at the retail report, they're going to say, well, our policy is starting to be effective. You raise rates across the curve, mortgage rates go up, uh, auto loan rates go up, and you see a slowdown in housing activity uh, you know, new home, new vehicle purchase activity and all the other factors tied to it. So I think it's starting to work. And I would say also, it's not even so much about how much they raise rates by today, but it's the forward guidance on policy. And that's a very important tool that's at their disposal too. I mean, rates are still pretty low if you think about the Fed funds rate, but if you look at the 10 year treasury, it's at three and a half percent almost. So that has already been, I think, exerting downward pressure on the economy. Yeah. The last thing I'll, I'll say on this, I think the reason why they're trying to do so much so fast is 
even though we see some weakening in the economy, most forecasters are still expecting 2.7% GDP growth in Q2 and 2.7% in Q3. So they have this window to raise rates to the appropriate level while the economy is too strong. Q4, that's not going to be the case, but I think that's when they might actually pause. Um, I was just going to say also mortgage rates, of course, have moved up a lot, and that has, seems to have put the brakes or helped put the brakes on, on the housing market to some extent as well. Um, Dennis, given all of this and given the challenge inherent in forecasting that you talked about, what should the strategy be right now? What are you recommending for clients in an environment that is changing pretty quickly? Yeah, besides hide, um, <laughs> I think the main thing we're focused on is um, very specific niche things within the market. So one of the things, um, any company that has um, high uh, leverage to fixed costs, uh, so that's going to be labor, input costs like oil, energy, et cetera, uh, they're in big trouble as the, the Fed eventually, and we've talked about this, uh, does the job of slowing the economy. So you probably have these sticky input costs that the Fed can't really control. What they can control is the trajectory of economic growth. So you have a lot of companies uh, that have these, you know, high fixed costs and are going to be dealing with a uh, pricing problem going forward. One of the areas that has been a major hiding spot that we recommend just being outright, you know, negative on right now is staples, as an example, and uh, getting a little bit more uh, confidence that some of the at least larger cap tech names could be a place to hide going forward because they don't have those same input cost issues. Anastasia, uh, have you been surprised by this route? in crypto, because coming into this latest route, crypto was seen as somewhat of a potential safe haven, but that trade has gotten completely blown up. It has. Look, what the Fed is forcing the markets to do is flush out all areas of froth. And I'm not calling all of crypto froth, but what is becoming really clear is that in a market that continued to trend up, there were structures upon structures and derivatives upon derivatives that were built and there's algorithmic coins. And if you go back and think about what happened during the financial crisis is you make one flawed assumption and then everything else falls apart. And unfortunately, I think some of the protocols that is now falling apart have made that one assumption that you know perhaps the prices can only keep going up and that turns out to not be the case. So the fact that the Fed is being so forceful is causing a flush out in very speculative parts of crypto. I think that is a very good thing. Uh, Bitcoin in particular, yes, of course, it's under pressure because it can be construed as an inflation hedge anymore. And what it's trading like instead is unprofitable tech. I don't think that invalidates Bitcoin. I think there is a price level of support, perhaps it's 15,000, which is roughly the cost of production. Um, but I think it's a kind of a good cleansing process that we're going through. We need to weed out the froth and we need to focus on the applications that have utility, that have an end use. And those are the ones that will survive this. Dennis, kind of want to stay on that same thread with you. Client calls you, asks, is this the time to add Bitcoin or any type of crypto to my portfolio? What do you tell them? No, um, you know, we don't have a strong view on Bitcoin, but uh, just taking off of what Anastasia said, uh, we're in an environment where the Fed is tightening financial conditions and a tighter financial conditions uh, backdrop, speculative assets are going to be hit. Bitcoin is clearly a speculative asset, has not done the job of hedging like it was advertised to do. So I'm not sure why the outlook for Bitcoin would change near term unless there was some real large change in the Fed's desire to tighten financial conditions. Is there any price to which it would fall, at which it would become attractive, Dennis? On Bitcoin? Uh, yes. No, not, not my expert. I mean, the, the 15000 on the cost of production sounds as good as any, um, <laughs> but it's not, not our area of expertise. Copy. 22V Research founder Dennis DeBusher and Chief Investment Strategist at iCapital, Anastasia Omoroso. Thank you both so much for joining us this morning. And everyone coming up, we're going to do a quick check of the markets on the other side of this quick break.
Another quick check on markets ahead of the opening bell on this Fed day. And actually, futures continue to move higher. As I mentioned earlier, a bit unusual to have this size of a move on a Fed day. Usually you get some treading water before you get the actual decision, statement, press conference, etc. But today's a different day. Of course, a lot of days have been very different days as of late. So let's take a look at some of the biggest movers that we've been watching that have been clobbered as of late. I'm talking about large cap technology. And you can look at the heat map here for the what they did yesterday. But what I'm seeing below for most of these stocks is that they're in the green as well here this morning. Amazon indicating a gain of almost 1%, even with that pullback in the non-store retail number uh, for the month of May that we heard about earlier. Apple up 1%, Microsoft up one and a third, Google up one and a quarter. So we are seeing a bounce back in many of these large cap beat up tech names. We're going to dig into what's been happening in technology a little bit later in the show with our tech editor, Dan Halley. But that's what we're seeing for the moment. We also, of course, have been talking about crypto. We're going to talk more about in a moment, but there is more red on the screen there, too. And as I mentioned, coming up next, we're going to talk more about those Bitcoin prices, which have fallen through a trap door. We're going to look at how some of the biggest Bitcoin names, that is investors in Bitcoin, are faring right now.
Bitcoin prices continue to fall, dropping below 20, the $22,000 mark and down about 30% in the last month alone. This is bad news, of course, for the crypto faithful. And during a TechCrunch interview, Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates had this to say on the sector. I'm used to asset classes where, like a farm, where they have output or a company where they make products. Yeah. To have an asset class that's 100% based on sort of greater fool theory that somebody's going to pay more for it than I do, uh, and where it has at its heart sort of this anonymity that, you know, you avoid taxation or any sort of, you know, government rules about kidnapping fees or things. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'm not involved in that. I'm not long or short uh, <laughs> just... any of those things. And there you have Bill Gates, of course, uh, TechCrunch, the sister publication of uh, Yahoo Finance. And good, good for Bill Gates for keeping it real right now. He's been, I would say, not a big believer in crypto and looks to be paying off. Yeah, very bullish on farmland, bearish on Decentraland as of right now for <laughs> Bill Gates. Uh, even in an Ask Me Anything, he had this Reddit thread um, from the spring that had taken place in, in May saying that he likes investing in things that have valuable output. The value of companies is based on how they make great products. And for what we've largely monitored within this most recent reaction. It's easy for anybody who did not believe in crypto before to easily hop onto it. It's more interesting to hear from some of the figures that have made large investments in crypto recently and where they stand right now, where they're adding on to positions, if at all, or where in some cases they might have to actually take some off of the table. Well, if you look at the differences between people who have been very outspoken about crypto and against crypto, someone like a Bill Gates, somebody like a Warren Buffett. Jamie Dimon. Charlie Jamie Munger. Dimon, <laughs> he's a hater. He's a hater. Rat, rat poison. Yeah, he's they, hated. They give no Fs, right? Like, like they... Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Most of the people who are super proponents of Bitcoin are invested in Bitcoin, right? They, they're, they're talking their book. Everybody's talking their book. And I guess it's just that Gates... Is so rich he doesn't have a book or it doesn't it's not or Buffett for that matter too like it's not as much in their interest to tout the thing and so they don't. I, I like Bill Gates flexing on this I think for him he's putting his mind to work and trying to change the world vaccine development helping people in poor and impoverished countries good for him good for him there is also an intriguing piece in the Financial Times today mm. that digs into the parallels between crypto and cultism that mm. is really fascinating and sort of um, also ties in with some of Gates' comments and just looked at the, some of the similarities, although crypto is a much bigger phenomenon than some of the cults that we have seen in the past. But there are some sort of parallels when you talk about the sort of profits of crypto, if you will, even though Satoshi is not, as the founder of Bitcoin, is not someone that we still hear from directly. There are all these prophets who spout the gospel, right. if you will. The apostles. Uh, yeah, yes, I'm, I'm exactly. fascinated, guys, because I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. Realistically, you can see management changes at these publicly traded crypto platforms uh, and across the industry. What does it mean for media publications that cover crypto? What does it mean to a company like FTX that has plowed mm -hmm. its a significant uh, amounts of money or the wealth of Sam Bankman Freed into various sports sponsorships? I mean, there, this is... I would say just the start of potential domino effect. You know, one of the domino effects, I know we had the uh, tickers there for Robinhood and Coinbase up a moment ago. Robinhood just got a downgrade this morning as well. That came in from Morgan Stanley. Um, and they had already seen downgrades from Goldman recently. And so this really just kind of adding on to the bearishness around Robinhood and especially considering the annexation that this company had in their growth strategy to the success of crypto on their platform. Um, and this is continuing to be one of the major headwinds that they're going to face in the near term during this crypto bear market or winter, as we've heard some of our guests define yeah, it. Yeah, I think we can talk about the cryptocurrency phenomenon as sort of this big picture philosophical phenomenon. And then there are these very real world examples that we are now starting to see. And as we've alluded to as well, there are real world examples elsewhere in the market from retail traders who have lost mm -hmm. on various cryptocurrencies. And now maybe they're taking profits in other places, too, and getting more risk averse in other places, too. But there are still an awful lot of people who are still holding on when it comes to cryptocurrencies. I'm switching cryptocurrencies to stocks and uh, the... <laughs> Feed-through effect, I suppose. You have the opening bell here okay. on this Wednesday morning, on this uh, Fed day. Belden, A maker Brian of Stassi. things around 120 years making industrial products. So they're not involved in the crypto uh, space. They've been around for 120 years, and it makes a lot of sense to me. 
and our opening bell coverage is sponsored by Flex Shares here as we have the opening bell on this Fed day and as we have a higher open on this Fed day, as I've been pointing out, somewhat unusual to see this kind of size of move, although perhaps less unusual given the action that we have seen as of late and the big drops that we have had. So I think one of the big questions, guys, that we have to ask as we head through today and the coming days once we hear about the Fed outlook is what is priced in, right? Yeah. What is priced in? Um, it seemed like, as Anastasia talked about earlier, the market very quickly seemed to price in that 75 basis point shift. But what does that do to the credibility of the Fed? What does it do to the further reaction function of the Fed if we're not getting as much consistency and stability in the message? I think for what the markets have also responded to, even with a move higher to start off the day right now, it's not erasing any of the broader decline we'd seen yeah. start and kick off even last week. And that just adding on to what we had already watched in this broader downward movement. And so even in this kind of dead cat or bear market brief rally scenario, mm -hmm. we could still see more severe down days should the Fed pathway forward be uncertain to the markets and be digested and looked at that way. And, and sorry, what you're saying reminds me as well to make the point deliberately here, the Fed is raising in a bear market. The mm. Fed is raising rates in a bear market. That they caused. Well, that they caused. I'm poking you. But I, look, I think it was very jarring what Dennis uh, DeButcher told him. And when he's one of the most plugged in strategists on Wall Street and in terms of trading. Be careful what you wish for in terms of a potential 100 basis point rate hike today. That commentary for me suggests really none of this is priced in. I know we always like to reference mm -hmm. Fed fund futures and where they have moved, uh, looking out to the fall and even to next year. But to hear Dennis say that suggests to me, to your point, we could see some more big down days if we get something more aggressive from the Fed today, 100 basis points, or even if we do get 75 basis points. Well, I mean, that's why when you say, well, that the, the Fed caused, mm -hmm. the market has been clamoring for the Fed to do this on the one hand, mm -hmm. right? But on the other hand, is also upset when the punch bowl gets, mm -hmm. you know. Can't have both over. ways. So, <laughs> yes, exactly. So you can't blame the Fed too much for giving you what you Fair. want. I I'll guess. give you that one. I don't know. I'll give you that um, one. Let's talk more about some individual movers. And one, of course, that is particularly pinned to the decline in Bitcoin as the prices continue to fall. We're watching MicroStrategy, which is one of the stocks that's actually bouncing back. CEO Michael Saylor has been out telling news outlets the company has not received a margin call against a $205 million Bitcoin-backed loan it took in March. It's not the first time, though, that Saylor has aimed to reassure investors. We asked him about that margin call back in May and whether it would be triggered if Bitcoin fell below 21000 Look, we have five. We started with five billion dollars of unpledged collateral. We borrowed two hundred million dollars against it. So that's a loan to value of four percent. If Bitcoin fell ninety five percent from that number, then we'd have to post additional collateral. Um, you know, people got their hands around the fact that we would adjust some collateral if Bitcoin ever got to 21,000, but it's really a non-issue whatsoever. You can think of it as like leverage of 1.04. If I was levered 10 to 1, we would have borrowed $50 billion against that collateral, but we borrowed $200 million. It's really a, a, it's a nothing issue. Now, the market has not necessarily viewed it as a nothing issue, but his comments also echoed by Mark Palmer, BTIG, who we spoke to the other day, mm -hmm. and effectively said the same thing. This is not, the market has been not understanding this issue correctly. But that said, they've been understanding the decline in Bitcoin and that MicroStrategy is heavily invested in Bitcoin. So that also has something to do with the sell-off that we have been seeing. And it's really a an evaluation of some of the crypto whales that are in mm. the landscape as well. When you have companies like a MicroStrategy or like a JP Morgan or even some of the broader bank scenarios that have set up their own trading desks, that catches a ton of attention because you have big money, institutional money, that is now getting thrown into the cryptocurrency landscape, specifically Bitcoin. Some of them have talked about Ethereum, but it's really Bitcoin right now that is taking it on the chin from some of those all-time highs, even though we've seen this broader move lower for the entirety of the cryptocurrency landscape. For MicroStrategy, what they represent is a whale in the space that if they did make any significant move, it's going to send a broader wave throughout the rest of the Bitcoin, um, the, the Bitcoin holders right now, if you will, too. You know, I have to give uh, an FTW uh, for, or I guess a, a for the win. That's Elon Musk, uh, because mm. keep in mind, he bought some crypto. He bought Bitcoin, I believe, what was that, last year, and put, right. it, on, put it on his balance sheet, but he didn't right. go out there and buy any more. 
Uh, and I liked that he didn't expose Tesla's balance sheet to these type of wild swings and risks like you're seeing over MicroStrategy. Well, can you give him an FTW when the stock is down 40% year to date? I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, he, he, I think, took a more rational approach to, you know, taking on that type of risk on a balance sheet that you don't want to take a lot of risk with because he's trying to make electric cars. So Elon Musk, you got to win for me on that one. He also took on a big risk by dubbing himself the Doge Father. Well, that too. too. Yeah. That too. You know. <laughs> Let's also talk about shares of Roblox this morning. RBLX, we're tracking them. They're moving higher by about 5% right now. That's after key metrics showed roughly a 10% drop in estimated bookings for May. They had a 23% decrease in average bookings per daily active user year over year. Uh, there were some bright spots. The daily active users were up 17% year over year. Now, this is this is just a May 22 uh, metric update that they were providing. And hours engaged were also up 10% year over year. And for Roblox, one thing that did get called out here is, again, something that we were talking about earlier this week, is the FX headwind. Microsoft had already signaled that, um, and it begged the question, or at least raised the question, of where are some of the other companies who internationally were going to be exposed to the conversion, or at least the value of the dollar versus other currencies internationally, where that FX impact would also have to get announced. Yeah, I'm surprised that the shares are trading higher now. They were trading uh, yeah. lower. Yeah. After, this, after this update came out, they were trading lower. Um, looking at that dollar exposure that we're talking about, the company gets about two-thirds of its revenue, or at least did last year from the U.S. and Canada, about 19% or so from Europe. Um, it looks like 7.5% from Asia Pacific and then around 6% from the rest of the world. So that's the exposure that we're talking about here. Perhaps that's why the stock has turned around if yeah. investors are just looking at it as a currency issue. As we know, Roblox has been slowing in terms of the growth that it's been seeing. So the stock has been down before today. So it also talked about, though, you know, a drop in those estimated average bookings per daily users and that um, revenue is still going to rise year over year, but bookings are an issue for this company. So, I mean, the stock has been down a lot going into today. For, for revenue being up in that instance, though, does it really just signal then that they are having more strength on the user base that they already currently have? And are they able to kind of upsell or continue to have more of those engagements with the current base of users that actually props up the revenue in this instance? And uh, at least at, in these forecasts, it seems so. I, I think you hit the nail on the head, Julie, slowing. So compared to what we just heard from Roblox uh, when they reported their April metrics a couple weeks ago, users slowed in this report this morning, hours engaged slowed, and revenue growth slowed. All of which tells me they could report another challenging quarter here when they ultimately report in a few weeks. We shall see. Coming up next, we're going to get more details on what's going on in the markets here. As we're about eight minutes into the session, we see stocks up more than 1% across the board. Inez Ferre will join us next.
10 minutes after the opening bell here. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. We've got markets that are on the rise, and our Ines Ferre is watching some of the details in the action here. Actually, we're, you know, it's interesting to see this boost here today, Ines. Yeah, that's right. On Fed Day, usually we see a lot of move after Jerome Powell starts speaking. We'll see what happens this afternoon. But nevertheless, we are right now looking at the Dow up 280 points. We're also watching the Nasdaq up about one and a half percent. The S&P 500 up more than one percent. Do want to mention Treasury yields because we did see the 10 year yesterday at a high of 2011 uh, from that year. And right now it's down about 10 basis points. Looking also at the U.S. US dollar index, that's edging slightly lower, but still above 105. Also taking a look at the sectors, we're watching communication services, consumer discretionary, financials. Those are the sectors that are leading right now. Over on the NASDAQ 100, look at the left-hand side of the screen at those mega caps, up more than 1% for a lot of them. Amazon, up more than 2%. You want to mention also some of the uh, pandemic plays, Mercado Libre, Peloton on the upper left-hand side, Netflix up more than 4%. Over on the Dow, we're watching Boeing up more than 5% right now, uh, adding on to gains from yesterday over the last two days up more than 10%. Also taking a look at the software stocks, I've been watching Snowflake up more than 5%. Uh, that's a two-day chart still, but here we go intraday. Yeah, 5%. This is after its investor day, management talking about uh, market expansion, new software capabilities, going beyond data analytics and, and, and Wall Street analysts really liking uh, what they heard. And finally, just mentioning the Chinese ADRs, a little bit of a mixed picture here. But guys, I mean, we have seen so many sell-off days uh, recently, and we've seen that over the last month. Take a look here. So uh, these Chinese stocks really rallying uh, to their highest level in three months. Investors betting on that uh, China policy is going to help the economy. And also uh, today, some data coming out of industrial uh, output from China uh, coming in a little better than expected. What do they say, Inez? There's always a bull market somewhere. Inez Ferre, thanks so much, somewhere. Okay, since 1950, only three years as the S&P 500 finished the year down more than 20%, uh, according to LPL Financial's Ryan Dietrich. They were 1973, 2002, and 2008. Maybe a little hope there from Ryan Dietrich. And this year, though, is shaping up to be the fourth with the S&P 500 down about 21% year to date. All right, coming up, we'll dissect the latest read on retail sales and see what it means for the economy moving forward. Don't go anywhere.
U.S. retail sales unexpectedly fell three-tenths of a percent in May as inflation sends food and gas prices to record levels weighing on consumer spending. The fall in May is a sharp reversal from the increase in April. Joining us now to discuss, we've got ProShares Executive Director of Thematic Investing, Scott Helfstein. And Scott, how do you read into today's data, specifically going into what the Fed is also going to be discussion on, discussing on the topic of inflation and where that is impacting consumers and showing up in some of the data now? Well, thanks for having me. The top line number uh, that we see on a month over month basis did show a little contraction in May and April was revised down. But if we look on a year over year basis, it still represented 9% growth in retail over last year. That is enough to beat uh, our elevated 8.6% inflation level. So I don't think investors should read too much into uh, this slight decline. On a year over year, uh, both regular sales and we track pretty closely the online and e-commerce, uh, what is the non-store category, uh, that similarly grew at about 9%. So uh, it's not all doom and gloom. I think the retail sales continue to show a strong consumer and the Fed is going to be paying attention, not just at the month over month high frequency, but the year over year. Uh, so I, I think it's one of those numbers that kind of just puts them in a, in a little bit of a gray area, if you will. Uh, I don't think it's going to, it wouldn't be information that would push them one way or the other. Um, let's talk about non-store retail in particular, aka online retailer, aka really Amazon, if we're talking about the retail figures from the government. That number was down um, month over month by 1%. What And you, as you said, you guys have some ETFs that track online specifically. What do you make of that number? So we're still, we believe, dealing with distortions from the pandemic. Uh, during COVID, at its peak, online sales topped out at just less than 16% of total retail in the United States. It subsequently come down and has been roughly uh, just shy of 13% in the most recent readings. So uh, people turned online. They turned online for things they'd never bought before, like groceries, uh, like clothes. And as stores have reopened, and we saw, for example, Nordstrom's and Macy's put up pretty strong quarters, um, you know, stores have reopened. People have wanted to get out of the house and shop. So we think that this is, you know, still a long-term expansion story. But we're walk, working through some of those distortions that we had from COVID. Um, the 9% year-over-year growth is still pretty close to the average of 10%, which is the year-over-year -year for the non-store sales going back 20 years uh, is, is the year-over-year -year growth rate. So we're pretty much on, uh, on the long-term trend year over year. So we think that that will continue. Well, Scott, I mean, looking at your online retail ETF, the ProShares online retail ETF, which we were just showing, it's down 42% year to date. If I look at a longer term chart, it's like the pandemic never happened. It's literally like it never happened. It's back, it's erased all of the gains from the pandemic. So if you're talking about this pull forward effect, does that mean effectively, I mean, if we're back at long-term trend, does that mean we're going to see the growth for these companies that we saw in 2018, 2019? Uh, we expect to return to trend. A matter of fact, not just we, but consensus estimates on the uh, ProShares online index uh, based off of Bloomberg do call for 30% top line growth over the next two years between now and 2023. And that's compared to the brick and mortar index which is only expected to grow top line at 9%. Uh, and then it's even more extreme if we look at earnings, where online is supposed to grow something in the neighborhood of 70% uh, compared to a, a number that is much lower for brick and mortar. So we do think that these companies have worked through the pandemic, uh, both the boom and then, if you will, the bust. Um, and we also think that e-commerce is really well built for the inflationary environment. If a Walmart or a Target wants to change prices, they have to send somebody through the store to go do that. Whereas the online companies, the digital first companies have dynamic pricing algorithms that are adjusting on a minute by minute basis. And so we've seen throughout the pandemic that online retail can maintain higher margins uh, and has more stable profit margins than the brick and mortar. 
which also has labor costs as well as the costs of the fixed costs of maintaining the stores. Um, and so we think the dynamic pricing model of e-commerce really does set them up. Plus there's some strong consensus growth ahead. Scott, I've been talking to a lot of consumers and, and some of them don't even have enough money to buy a bag of apples or a bag of bananas. You know, isn't the bottom line that you know, retail over the next few months can see margin pressure, free cash flow pressure, you could see some store closures, you could see increased promos. Why go anywhere near anything as it pertains to investing in retail stocks? Why not just look elsewhere or just avoid the sector entirely? So there is the tale of the, the data versus the anecdotes. And certainly anecdotally, I agree with you. And I think we've seen there is some concern voiced, not just in retail, but for profit margins overall. I would point out last month, the difference between producer price index and the consumer price index uh, was the highest on record going back to 1948. So producers have been dealing with this. Uh, the, the retail stores, the, the industrial companies, uh, they've been dealing with higher prices and trying to limit what they're passing on to consumers. Uh, and this has been going on for over a year. So I think a lot of these companies have adjusted to this inflationary reality and they're working very hard to manage their margins. But the consumer is still incredibly strong. We saw a consumer expenditure number of year-over-year uh, -year growth in April of 4.9%, which is well over the average of roughly about 2%. And over the last 20 years is the fourth highest reading. So consumers, uh, despite higher prices uh, at the pump and in the grocery store, are still spending, increasing spending at a faster clip uh, than pretty much any time in the last 20 years. So uh, the anecdotes certainly point out that there's high prices in pockets of the economy that can be painful, but both consumer spending and household balance sheets are still remarkably healthy. We'll leave it there for now. Scott Helfstein, ProShares Executive Director of Thematic Investing. Good to see you. Thanks, John. Shares of Sonos moving after being downgraded to equal weight by Morgan Stanley, noting that consumers are turning more cautious about spending. We spoke with Sonos CEO Patrick Spence in May about a potential spending slowdown. Take a listen. We've been hearing all of this noise, you know, in the broader uh, kind of consumer sector. And I know, and I know a lot of concern. Um, but when it comes to our consumer, every, from everything we see right now, and based on the results you just saw, you know, our consumer remains strong. And so, um, you know, we're very pleased to uh, bring a 20% year over year growth. So there we had uh, Patrick Spence, uh, CEO of Sonos. And I'm looking over this Morgan Stanley note, guys. It's, I think it's more of a broader look at the consumer. The headline on it is buckling up for consumer spending slowdown. And I suspect you'll see more notes like this on, on retail more broadly and companies like Sonos. But again, that was Spence about three weeks ago telling us he's not seeing any recessionary-like signals in his business. I mean, for anybody right now that is looking into not just the retail sales data that's coming out, not just the consumer confidence that is at lows right now. How can we possibly say that the consumer is incredibly strong when they are going to the store? Oh, I can't. I can't go back to that last, last I second. mean, oh, I look can't, here. I, can't, I, can't. I mean, you're, you're right, though. You're, you're right. You're 100 percent right. You're going into the store, looking at sections that have either been taken out because they don't have the inventory and looking at the sections you are going into where the prices are markedly higher. And I'm just supposed to wait for discounts to come across? Well, so here's, here's the question. Here's the question. How is the higher end consumer going to hold up? Mm -hmm. The people who are most hurt by higher prices right now are not Sonos customers, right? Let's be clear on this. So if there is an economic pullback, what is the Sonos? What is the Lululemon? What are these higher end consumers, uh, customers going to be doing? I think that's still an open question. They, you know, they're hurt by higher prices like everyone else and are much more exposed to the so-called wealth effect where they're watching the market go down and also feeling like they have less money. So we could start to see that chipped away. Is, is a Sonos more resistant than a lower income customer? Maybe. We'll have to see. But I would argue then that that cycle has already passed yes. for Sonos. All of the people who are going to buy that new consumer tech that are in that category for them in the, in the customers that are higher end uh, net worth individuals and want to get the Lululemons and have their Sonos connected in every single room and also want to make sure that they've got their Nike NFTs and whatnot. 
They've already it's purchased. Done. I have no more room for speakers. So I was going to say, Sazi's right out of I rooms. have 11 of these now. I guess I'm a high end consumer. He's maxed out. 11? I do, I do I have 11. Where do you have 11 I, rooms? All, I, will t- I can't. It's good. I, <laughs> right. I'm an Aries. That's just Coming how I roll. up yeah. next inflation Absolutely. concerns, of course, on the rise for investors, but not one prominent investor. Oh, there she is, Kathy Wood. We'll talk about it after the break. Good corner. Kathy Wood, for one, not worried about inflation affecting her investing thesis. In an interview with Goldman Sachs, Wood said, quote, we are on the other side of the inflation problem. Her hot take is where we find Sazi's hot take and reaction to her hot take. My hot take is this. Uh, let me just turn my head to the side because that's like, really, that's my vibe <laughs> off of this. And hat tip to Goldman Sachs. This is really at a long, extensive interview with Kathy Wood. I have a full written piece on this uh, on this one on the Outfinance Finance homepage now, but I'll hit the high points. Uh, Wood is not... She says overly concerned uh, about inflation and she views deflation. She thinks inflation is now past its peak and she sees deflationary forces uh, starting to take hold. I'm not sure where, but if she uh, is watching this and knows where to find them, please do let us know. And then last, she really fought back against a lot of the critics out there. I mean, Kathy Wood rose to fame 20, in 2020, 2021, with strong performance for her ARK Innovation ETF. And with that popularity comes a lot of critics on Twitter and in various media forums. She says, look, these criticisms are good because they suggest a lot of negative news is priced into her stocks. Now, she owns some of the buzziest tech names out there. The Teladoc stock has went right down the drain uh, year to date. Tesla's been under pressure, Zoom under pressure, Roku been under pressure. But Kathy Wood sees this uh, negativity as now being potentially priced into her portfolio. And you see right there on the screen uh, into some of her top holdings. My take uh, is very simple, perhaps uh, unsurprising, giving my tone around this. Really, Kathy, really. I, I look, I, I love talking to Kathy Wood. She's been on this many times. I think she's abs- I think she's brilliant. She, of course, knows what she's talking about. But 
Her portfolio has been obliterated this year, and in large part that is because of, I think, changes to uh, Fed policy, uh, but also more changes to policy that are coming down the line. And you have to at least, I would think, acknowledge that this has happened. You well, can't live in your own world. she's acknowledged it. She's definitely acknowledged it, but she also has a well, three you talked to, to her in April, right? She also has a three to five year time horizon. Mm -hmm. So when, yeah, it's anyway, we won't go, we don't need to go full deeply into it. So on a three to five year time horizon, then where does some of that innovation start to net out? Because you still need the capitalization for those companies to make it through this wave as well in order to have a pathway to profitability or just operations. Yeah. Well, here, uh, let's use Coinbase, because Coinbase is a name that she's been buying. This week they laid off or they announced they're laying off 18% of the workforce. What does that do for the culture inside of Coinbase? And then if that does impact the culture, what does that do to the longer term outlook for a Coinbase, their innovation cycle? Where are they in five years? Unclear, unclear. Lots is unclear right now. But coming up, we're going to speak with TD Securities Priya Mistra on her expectations for that impending Fed decision and the effect on markets. That's next. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brian Sazi alongside Julie Hyman and Brad Smith. We are a few hours away from the Fed's decision on interest rates. And you can really get a sense, I think, of some nervousness in the markets continuing. Though at least right now, you're seeing the Dow up close to 400 points. The S&P 500 and NASDAQ also in the green. Here are three things you need to know right now. Crypto crash. Billions of dollars have been wiped out of the crypto market in recent days. And that pain may persist with Bitcoin tanking uh, below $20,000. At one point, it has since rallied back to above $21,000. We'll dive into digital assets immediate future with one guest coming up. And is it, is it time to back up the truck on bank stocks? Despite higher treasury yields, bank stocks continue to suck wind on recession fears. One fund manager stops by to give us his hot take. And rollbacks, maybe. President Joe Biden could be nearing a key decision on former President Trump's China tariffs as one way to ease inflation. Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman has a hot take on this one for us coming up. 
But let's get over to Julie Hyman, who's at the Wi-Fi Interactive. Yes, indeed. Just want to point out some of the moves we're seeing, not just today, but that we've been seeing in the run-up to the Fed here. And even though we've got the Dow bouncing today, of course, uh, stocks bouncing today are in the wake of what we have seen, the downward movement over the past week. So here's the five-day chart of the Dow. And of course, we had the downward movement on Friday because of the CPI. And then again on Monday, we, and when we had the signal in the Wall Street Journal that we were going to see a 75 basis point increase. So again, we've been talking about what is already priced into the market. We don't entirely know because we don't know what uh, Jay Powell is going to say today. But nonetheless, we've already had some decreases, of course, coming into today's session. We've been watching the 10-year yield as well, which had been moving up sharply today, losing nine basis points at 3.39 percent, but still at elevated levels here as people try to price in what the Fed is going to do. And as the Fed acts today, uh, as we talked about earlier, the ECB had an emergency meeting today didn't really change a whole heck of a lot. Um, the, they have signaled that they're going to be raising rates, but are not yet doing so. And we have been seeing some weakness in the euro before a little bit of rebound today. I also wanted to point out what we're seeing in crude oil futures, even as we had the International Energy Agency saying that in 2023, demand is con- going to continue to outpace supply. We have a little bit of weakness in oil prices today, but still... a barrel here, guys. So we are still obviously seeing very elevated gasoline prices as a result in the United States. So that's just a little bit of a cross-asset check for you. Bitcoin holding above 21,000 for the moment, guys. All right. We're going to continue to keep a close eye on everything markets, especially going into today's FOMC meeting that is set to conclude. Taking a look at the major averages, we're holding on to those gains. And actually, this is significant because we are near some of our intraday highs as of right now. So continuing to preview today's FOMC meeting, let's welcome in Yahoo Finance's Miles Udlin. Miles? Hello. What we're looking for. <laughs> it's good to see you. <laughs> All right. So 75 basis points yeah. is, is what we're looking for. We've heard from some of our guest calls for a, a, a 400 basis points. Mm-hmm. Where do you believe that for the Fed that they can get their credibility right? Yeah, I mean, I was talking a lot about this with with Brian Chung, and I think he and I, um, it's not that we differ, but that I maybe come in a little bit hotter because I think the Fed is about to make a huge mistake today. And I think the reason is sort of how do you get out of this conundrum now? Like, what's the next move? Okay, so 75, then 75. But what are the, like, how are we going to forward guide to September? What about November? How are we to get the markets to believe that we, as the Fed, will slow down our pace of rate hikes when we decide to do that? And there is another possibility here that with this buzz around 75, they've actually made 50, like a, a more potent rate hike, if that makes sense. So it wasn't just a pro forma 50-50. Now 50 becomes a surprise. And we can see here uh, 95% pricing for 75. So I guess 50 is off the table. But to me, if I'm sitting in that meeting today and I'm a dove on the Fed or just I, I just want to keep with the forward guidance, maybe 50 matters a little bit more given sort of what the last 72 hours have looked like. Why not 100 basis points? And we put that question to Dennis DeButcher, uh, and he said, be careful what you wish for. What's your take on that? I think the 100 basis point talk, I mean, I think like after Friday's data, Mm -hmm. it became clear to me that there was going to be a real conversation now around where we needed to go. And that really coalesced over the weekend. And pretty much everyone's gotten in line with that. Like the 100 basis points, especially look at Bill Ackman out last night. Some of that to me rings of like, all my stocks are down. Can we kick save this? So I'm like looking because, for 3%. Well, because the second part of his thing is we need to do 100 now because we need to get to the terminal rate now so that we can cut later, which is like, I'm long a bunch of stuff that's not going to go up until rates start coming down. So please get to the top of the cycle as fast as possible so that my stocks. Can, and look, that's like most people on Wall Street who are managing money are getting destroyed right now. And they do want the cycle to turn. But Jay Powell just does not care. Like, I think he's looking at what's happening in real estate. Obviously, it's a main transmission mechanism. But they probably look at total crypto market cap going from $3 trillion to $1 trillion or under. And they're like, that's great. You know, that's like fake money, fake wealth, paper wealth that is being sucked out of the system. And that has real impacts on real spending in the economy. And I'm, I'm sort of taking a step back and taking like a super long view. This is something I was thinking about yesterday is that even if you look ahead to the recession, yes, there's going to be damage. There's going to be people who lose their jobs. There's going to be stuff that's cut. There's going to be economic turmoil. These things don't tend to last that long, if I can say that. And it doesn't feel like a coming recession would be as bad as, say, the great financial crisis, right? Like, at least... And I was thinking about covering, also, the financial crisis versus covering what we're going through now. Mm -hmm. 
And that was like every day was an explosion. Mm. Like every day there was an alarming headline. And it was like it was like triage every single day. This is sort of this slow run. We can all see it coming. And I also was looking at the S&P 500 returns a little bit inspired by the likes of you and Sam Rowe. And if you look at the long-term returns, yeah. of course, like bear markets also don't last that long. So I, I, I hear what you're saying. And I, I like the reason that I tend to push against that kind of worldview of like, we should just get the recession over with or get the bear market over with is that we can sit here now in June, 2022 and say, oh, well, we know this recession probably won't be as bad or we know it's caused for these reasons. But in downturns, Bad things happen that we don't know about. In the same way, yeah, in the same way that in you know up cycles. I mean, look, 13, 14, 15, um, 14, 15 to oil. Like, let's go 12, 13, 14. Looking at the market, why did stocks go up? Earnings started getting better. The economy started repairing itself. Corporate America started first, but that led to all these things we didn't think about. A crypto bubble then emerged, and a VC bubble emerges, and now the heat's coming off that stuff. So, up and down have their negative externalities as. Um, you know, folks would say, but to me, the externalities on the downside are always worse and are, they are to be avoided. Now, they probably can't be avoided, but um, I don't feel resigned. Like, I don't feel happy about this. No, I don't. I don't and, think and, you do and either. And I'm not but. saying that we should rush through. What I'm rather saying is that while Bill Ackman might be feeling a lot of pain in his portfolio, mm -hmm. if I'm not retiring until 10 years from now, like, I don't need to be hiding in a, you know, under my bed somewhere. Like, yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, I, I know what you're saying. I think a lot of this also, and I know we got to move on, but yeah. uh, a lot of this gets to like an idea that, that I've been thinking about a lot, which is that flat for everything, stocks, housing, crypto, commodities, like flat for the next five, seven, 10 years, that probably frustrates the most people. And so I'm kind of getting like, yeah. maybe we just go between 3,000 and 4,000 the S&P for a really long time. Hmm. Maybe. 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 Just, it's just Any an story idea. to plug while we have you? Anything on the homepage? Anything? No. No, I mean, we We're got... We're out of time here, son. I know, we got, you know, we'll get into that. Right. Just come to yahoofinance.com. All right, thank you so much, Miles. <laughs> Thanks, Let's continue this conversation now with Priya Mistra, who is TD Securities Managing Director and Global Head of Rate Strategy. Priya, thank you so much for being here. So we just had a discussion about the Fed, what's going to happen now for the next few years. I'm curious your take on rates then, the feed through to rates. Like, are we just going to see a range-bound tenure over the next year even as the Fed is raising rates because of the outlook for economic growth or lack thereof? I think we're likely to see a cap on the tenure, uh, particularly because real rates, long in real rates have risen. Whether we stay in a range or not, it really comes down to can the Fed achieve this softish landing, which I now think increasingly becomes a myth. If they're going to go 75, we're looking for them to hike 75 this meeting, 75 in July, then 50 basis points, taking the terminal rate to 4%, along with QT. That's a significant amount of tightening. You know, can the consumer handle it? Can interest sensitive sectors handle it? And so I actually think the tenure reaches a peak in the near term. And then I have a downward trajectory for the tenure. I mean, I think the front end can be more range bound because the market's already pricing in all these hikes. But the long end, as the market starts to get concerned about a hard landing, about rate cuts, late 23, the market's already pricing in rate cuts. I think actually the tenure might be the safest place in town, which sounds counterintuitive if the Fed is hiking a lot, but it starts to price in that growth slowdown and the eventual Fed eases. Priya, let's say the, the Fed comes out today, raises rates by 75 basis points, which appears now to be the consensus going into the meeting. What are the ripple effects of that move over the next few weeks? So I think the 75 is priced in. Whether you look at rates, I mean, I'm not an equity analyst, but I would think that it's generally priced in. The issue is, I think, forward guidance, as we have been used to now for 15 years from the Fed, and particularly in the last few months, I think what was important was in May, we got the guidance of 250s. I think that's over. Even if Chair Powell tries to give forward guidance, which I think he may not, because if they're trying to be data dependent, it's very hard to give a lot of guidance. But without any forward guidance, the market's going to stay extremely volatile. If we see inflation staying high, and a lot of the inflation, I have to argue, is outside of the Fed's control. Long term, sure, they can impact the economy and that impacts inflation. But food, energy, shelter, these are things that actually the Fed doesn't have a lot of control. What if inflation stays high longer? I think then the market gets nervous that is 75 the new 25? And is the Fed going to get to 5%, 6%? I mean, what's the level at which point um, you know, the Fed stops? 
That's what the market's going to be concerned about and the ripple effects on growth, on risk assets. So I think beyond the 75, which I think is baked in, it's really economic data and how the Fed responds to it. And do they try and manage the dual mandate or is inflation such a big problem that they're going to let the softish landing goal, I think, uh, go away for now. And, and for one of the Fed's favorite measures to track where the appetite of the consumer is and, and where the strength of the consumer is or lack thereof in, in the personal consumption expenditures as well. In this data, when do you believe that it will further start to show up and, and be even more of a kind of blaring alarm to the Fed within their own policy pathway right now? That's the, the key question, right? At what point is the consumer uh, struggle? I think we've already seen in the first quarter a reduction in goods demand, but that's good. I mean, no pun intended. Uh, goods demand was running much above trend. Um, a lot of that was because of COVID. So some of that decline was expected. I'm sure the Fed is happy with that. It's the service sector. The service demand start to slow. But again, I would say the Fed is trying to raise rates and tighten policy to slow demand. I think what they're trying to do is slow demand to the point where you reach trend and not go below trend. That's a slippery slope. You know, is there enough tightening in conditions? Does the job market shut start to show some signs of cracking and it starts to soften below? We think that's closer to year end, not just yet, but I think the slowing is baked in the cake. We're gonna get the slowing. We just don't know if it's slowing enough below trend. And I think that only happens closer to year end because there's still a lot of momentum in the consumer. And as you said, Priya, it's, uh, we're now getting the outlook for rates to be cut, right? And this is a little bit the ph phenomenon that we just heard Miles talking about, this sort of like, hurry up and let's get past this period of recession and of bear market, and let's get to the period where we can um, see, see loosening once again. Do you think that's the right way to think about it? How are you thinking about sort of this period, this cycle? Right. So if you've tracked the last few cycles, I think that's been a good philosophy. I struggle a little bit now with inflation because I think there's persistence to inflation. I mean, unless you think the war gets resolved or China gives up on zero COVID, what worries me is how does the Fed respond? And actually, I'll be watching for the SCP as well as the dot plot. And if Chair Powell can give some sense of this. If growth starts to slow down, I don't want to use the word stagflation, it's misused a lot, but what if growth slows to below trend? So 1% growth and inflation is still three. So now they're potentially missing on both sides of the mandate. What do they give more priority to? How do they try and balance their dual mandate that's potentially going to be in conflict? We actually think it is going to be in conflict next year. It would be easy for them to cut if inflation wasn't a problem, but Inflation may stay a problem for much longer. It tends to be a very persistent series, responds only with a big lag to monetary policy. So I don't know if they'll have that flexibility to start to ease or even stop hiking, even if growth slows down, because inflation is just uncomfortably high and expectations are starting to rise on inflation as well. Well, hopefully we get uh, some insights into all this later on when the Fed announces its decision. Priya Misra, T TD Securities Managing Director and Global Head of Rate Strategy. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Okay, before we head to break, let's check out a bullish call on rental car outfit Avis. The team at Jefferies reiterated, reiterated a buy rating on Avis with a $333 price target. Target assumes 97% upside from current levels. Says the folks at Jefferies, margins are structurally higher post-COVID with industry supply demand discipline driving pricing sustainably. The free cash flow profile provides balance sheet catalysts with opportunity for more stock buybacks. Coming up, we'll uh, talk about how Caterpillar is moving its headquarters and we'll look at some other top headlines on the other side of the break.
Caterpillar is officially moving from Chicago to Texas, the heavy machinery maker crowning its existing Irving, Texas office as the company's new headquarters. Caterpillar says the move is not related to economic or tax incentives. It does continue a string of major companies, including Tesla, Boeing, Oracle, that are all relocating their corporate headquarters, some driven by access to talent pools, connections, others by the favorable tax rates and incentives. Caterpillar's move will begin this year, and the company's relocation only affects actually about 230 employees. 17,000 will still work in Illinois. A charitable payout from Berkshire Hathaway, courtesy of Warren Buffett himself, the investing legend, giving away about $4 billion worth of shares to charities under a plan that started more than a decade ago. The biggest chunk of those shares, about $11 million, will go to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Other beneficiaries include charities run by his children, Buffett's that is. Buffett's plan will eventually see him donate all of his shares in Berkshire Hathaway to philanthropic organizations after his death. This was laid out in a 2019 letter to shareholders. And refresh in peace, Internet Explorer. Microsoft's often vilified web browser is now effectively discontinued after the tech giant says it has ceased support for it. The browser was first released in 1999 to compete with contemporaries like Netscape Navigator. Remember that? It was the centerpiece of antitrust disputes with the Justice Department in 1997. Microsoft has recommended existing users switch to its successor, the Edge browser. Sazi, you big, you big Edge. I think 1999, uh, Julia, was the last time I used Internet Explorer. All right, staying on tech, the market sell-off continues to batter that tech sector, and that is where we find tech editor Dan Halley, who's been covering the space and looking at all the sell-offs in this sector. Dan. That's right. Yeah, we're seeing a lot, uh, obviously, of movement in both uh, the big tech stocks as well as the smaller tech stocks. When you're talking about something uh, like an Apple, like an Amazon, uh, like a Microsoft, uh, those are all being battered. Obviously, uh, Amazon as well. And there's different reasons for why these companies uh, are taking individual hits uh, outside of just the broader sell-off. Now, uh, Apple has the issue, obviously, with COVID lockdowns in China. That impacts not only production, but also sales because people just can't get out and buy things uh, when they're locked down. Uh, Alphabet, they're going down because of the market, but also because they can't uh, sell as many ads or they're having more issues uh, selling ads. That's as a result of, well, they'll chalk it up to the China lockdowns as well somehow, but uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, as well as uh, rising interest rates uh, or expected rising interest rates and rising inflation. And then uh, we have Microsoft. They're dealing with similar issues. Obviously, so many businesses went out uh, and went towards the cloud as a result of the uh, lockdowns that we had seen. So there's not as many people that need to get uh, on the cloud at this point. And then Amazon, they just simply have too many employees now and too much space. Uh, they don't need as much after they saw that huge explosion of people needing to start uh, purchasing things online. So in addition to the general market conditions, all of these companies have their own individual problems going on as well. Then we have the smaller stocks, Zoom, DocuSign, Okta, huge pandemic darlings. Uh, obviously, those stocks uh, saw their shares explode during the pandemic, but they have since fallen back to earth as people realized that drinking uh, and talking to your friends on Zoom every night sucks. So uh, we've seen the shares start to fall back there. Uh, obviously, over the uh, year to date, uh, really big losses for them, uh, as well as tech in general. But uh, for those particular ones, they're getting hammered. Okay. And so what was interesting about this too, especially in the cloud landscape that you were talking about a moment ago, it was really strong for a company in Oracle mm -hmm. than what we were hearing just days ago. What's different then if we're looking at these companies and the cloud plays that they've brought on to their own operations and try to make sure that if you're a company like Google or Microsoft, that you do have that differentiating factor between those lines of businesses in gaming and cloud and advertising versus an Oracle that's saying, hey, the demand for us is pretty strong. Yeah, I mean, Microsoft is massive, right? They're the second largest cloud provider uh, in the world, right? It's Amazon, Microsoft, and then everybody else, mm -hmm. right? And we'll just sprinkle in a, a couple of Oracles and Googles and uh, what have you. So uh, I think obviously it's going to be a bigger problem for Microsoft just because uh, of the size uh, of the market that they uh, control mm -hmm. uh, at this point. Uh, you know, they're also dealing with, again, uh, so many people have gone with them uh, that that becomes the issue as interest rates uh, eventually, uh, you know, we probably get the announcement later. Uh, we're going to start to see more companies start to pull back. Uh, we've already seen uh, some of that. Uh, Microsoft announcing that they were going to be doing some hiring freezes, by the way, uh, in their teams and office teams, teams, capital T, 
team. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, we're seeing the same thing across the board with a lot of tech companies. Uh, Amazon doing uh, a little bit of hiring freeze. Apple, there's reports that some of the geniuses in their stores aren't being backfilled. Uh, nothing so far about the actual uh, campus, the, the, you know, kind of white collar side of things for Apple. But the retail side of things, you know, that's where we're hearing rumblings, but nothing official yet. Well, and I need my Apple Watch fix. I'm coming to you, Dan Halley. I'm hey, coming to you I'll very do it. soon. I'll do it. I know you will. Dan Halley, thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon. All right, let's get a quick check of these markets here on Fed Day, sponsored by FlexShares. You're seeing all three major indices in the green. I would argue the market action right now is suggesting maybe we only get a 50 basis point rate hike from the Fed later on today. But something, of course, we will continue to track all session long. All right, coming up, bank stocks continue to underperform despite many of the banks boasting strong fundamentals. We'll share some fresh analysis with you on the other side of the break. Welcome back, everyone. Investors await the Fed's decision this afternoon on rates as expectations for 75 basis points in a rate hike are on the table. Here to discuss how this could all play out for financials is Hennessy Large Small Cap Financial Funds Portfolio Manager. We've got David Ellison joining us here. David, what Good cap morning. do you fall in? You're looking for 75. You're hoping for 100. What's going on? Well, I'm hoping, I'm hoping we'll get 75. I'm wishing for 100 just to get it over with. They're going to go there anyway. Uh, you know, they're pretty far behind with mortgage rates at six and Fed funds at one. Um, so we'll see what happens. But I, I think, you know, the more they do, the better the market's going to react to it, in my opinion, because they need to show the market that they mean business on inflation. The big problem with the market is inflation. Everything else is pretty much OK. David, do you think the bank stocks have priced in a mild recession? Well, the bank stocks, uh, you know, I th you know, they're not as cheap as they've ever been. I've been doing this for a long time, which hopefully it doesn't show too much. But, uh, you know, valuations are at the low end of the range, but not 
uh, you know, not disaster ranges. Uh, I think their people are fearful of loan growth slowing as the economy slows as rates move up. They're worried about housing prices coming down and creating credit issues, uh, corporate debt becoming a problem and creating issues there. So, you know, I think that's going to be there until people feel more comfortable. In the meantime, there because rates have moved up, there are mark to market hits for some of these banks, and that's going to curtail buybacks and potential dividend increases. So we have to work through this. You know, the opportunity is ahead of us, uh, certainly not behind us. But in the meantime, the banks are are historically very safe from a capital perspective, from an earnings perspective. And we just need to sort of muscle through this rate increase and get to the other side. But again, you know, you have mortgage rates now at 6%. Um, you know, when I started in the business in 82, you know, the the sort of the joke was, you know, the banks were about three, six, three. And that was you'd borrow money at three, you'd lend it at six, and your tea time would be at three. <laughs> and, you know, we're kind of back to that. And, uh, you know, so we've got rates, especially mortgage rates at 6%. That is a good rate historically to lend into, both for risk and obviously return relative to the cost of funds. So, we are there from a pricing perspective. The question now is the market's going to be afraid about mortgage rates going to 8 or 12% and home prices crashing and credit kicking in. It's amazing how when you're in the banking sector, 2008 is always yesterday. People are just incredibly fearful of that 2008 cycle where they just got completely wiped out. And that is that's still in the minds of a lot of historical bank investors uh, in the business. Um, a couple thoughts based on that. A, I don't know how many bankers you'd find um, kicking off at 3 p.m. these days for a, a tea time. I don't know. And also, six percent mortgage rate in the 80s. You were sitting pretty, pretty. You know, you you were feeling good probably if you were as a home buyer getting that that kind of a rate. But so if we if we are still sort of um, scarred by the financial crisis and the effect that that had on the banks. Does that mean then uh, effectively what you're saying is that people are overlooking opportunities probably if they are still feeling that kind of fear from that period? Well, I, I think that's part of it, you know, as a, a long-term investor and, and, you know, obviously I've run two financial funds here at Hennessy for 10 years now and have done it, you know, did it at Fidelity for 12 years and so on and so forth. Um, you know, you, you make money when when credit goes from good to or bad to good. And so, you know, I would love to see a credit cycle. The stocks reflect that. And then we can really make money coming out of that. Um, and I think that's what, you know, I think, you know, the pandemic was a good example. We had a real quick credit fear the stocks got completely annihilated. And as we came out of that, uh, the stocks did quite well for two, two and a half years. And this year it's been awful because we're back into that sort of, well, credit's going to deteriorate and and earnings are going to go down. So, you know, to me, in a, in a big macro sense, the problem with the market is valuation. And now we have an earnings problem. And you see that starting with Peloton all the way through. And you got, you know, people like, uh, you know, Snap coming out, you know, reporting numbers and then three weeks later saying, oops, we were wrong. They're a lot worse. That's a recipe for lower stock prices. So we we've I think we've taken care of a lot of the valuation issues. Now we have to take care of the earnings issues. And I think you know, that's up to the companies and that takes another year or so to resolve. All right. Well, a little bit of a grim picture, but hopefully we'll get out of it. David Ellison, good to catch up with you and to get uh, your perspective. 636. I learned some, or 363. Three, I learned something three. new today. Yeah. Hennessy, large cap, <laughs> large small cap financial funds portfolio manager. Thank you so much. Large bank uh, portfolio manager. Coming up, crypto continuing its downfall. Bitcoin down. Wasn't it up at one point again? Now we're down again. 363. Three. 363. All right, we're going to talk to the CEO of Valkyrie Funds coming up next. That's his next target on Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Not far off.
the sell-off in cryptocurrencies continuing today. Bitcoin sinking close to 20,000 earlier in the session. It's recovered a little bit, but still down on the day, down more than 70% since its peak last November. The sell-off, of course, rippling through the Bitcoin futures-based crypto ETF universe, including Valkyrie's Bitcoin strategy ETF. It's down over 15, 50% this year alone. Joining us now to talk about the action, Valkyrie Fund CEO, Leah Wald. Leah, thank you for being here. Obviously, it's been quite a ride downward here uh, for the, the crypto universe. And, you know, even though, yes, these cycles have happened in crypto before, what is a pretty young asset class, it can't feel great when it's happening. So how do you sort of um, think about it as we are in this period? And how low do you think Bitcoin will go? Yeah, and thank you so much for having me. You're you're absolutely right. For those of us that have been in the industry, it is, you know, it it's historically true that we have weathered these types of storms. But again, we are firmly in a bear market now. Never feels good. You know, Bitcoin is down 54% year to date, Ethereum is down nearly 70% year to date, and more than 2 trillion in notional value has already been wiped off from digital asset valuation since last year's high. Naturally, this is following a lot of issues fundamentally, but the TA is just technical analysis is just not lying. And unfortunately, uh, it is not looking good. We're looking right now as well at this sort of speculation vacuum, if you will, within the broader crypto landscape and, and even into some of the other spaces where people are invested into. But what do you believe will come out on the other side as we kind of are watching this shake out? Sure, in prices, but also in projects. I think that that's a good question and actually will bring a smile to my face today. So thank you for that. <laughs> I, I do think that in bear markets, you have a good opportunity to build. Um, that's what I firmly believe. That's what excites me about just coming back from maternity leave this week. I'm excited because of that. I think that um, historically you're able to hunker down and you've seen that across the crypto ecosystem. In 2018, in the various bear markets, you've seen a lot of projects that weren't built on firm foundations get completely wiped out. And that's not a bad thing. You know, very often, sometimes cleansing the system can help for the foundations of the future to be built on, you know, much more firm grounds. If you look at also what's different now is that the venture funding has come from a variety of sources that we never thought was going to be true. I mean, our strategic funding round, our last round that we just closed, Bank of New York, Wedbush, other institutional players, Belvedere Trading all joined. And that is just exceedingly different than just venture dollars flowing in. And previous to me coming on, David Ellison, I think, uh, made a very salient point, which is that valuations are starting to drop. And uh, now we're looking at earnings. I think in the, in the crypto ecosystem, definitely valuations with numerous, numerous companies that potentially did not have the earnings or the foundations to back it have been above a billion dollar valuation mark. And I think that it's time that the companies come back to reality and that'll help for the long term. Leah, one target that we heard a lot about over the past two years during crypto crypto's rise is, the, is that one million dollar target by 2030. <laughs> this, this downturn we're seeing right now in crypto, does that pull that off the table? Does it push it out to 2040? Are you asking if I can retire early or now I have to work? That's longer? another way of looking at it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think that that's pretty lofty. Um, but I do think that, you know, an adage that we say in the Bitcoin world is one Bitcoin will always equal one Bitcoin. As obnoxiously cheeky as that may be, the truth is just this asset class trades very differently. It does trade in certain ways in regards to technical analysis like any other asset in history. However, it also is following very different dynamics from a fundamental perspective. So I think that you know we will have to see if we hit that 1 million mark or we continue going down for the next many, many years. Um, but in the end of the day, one Bitcoin is still equal to one Bitcoin, so trade accordingly and, and hedge appropriately. Um, by the way, congratulations. You mentioned you just got back from maternity leave. Gives you a little new perspective, doesn't it, on these things, I, I can say from experience. Um, Leah, so as you're talking about this, you know, trade it as it's one Bitcoin and hedge accordingly. In addition to running Valkyrie funds, you personally hold Bitcoin as well. Are you adding any Bitcoin? And at what price would it become attractive? 
That's a great question. I do hold Bitcoin. I hold it in my cold storage so that my hands can't touch it on a daily, <laughs> you know, I, sorry, large dog in the background. Um, I do think that we're looking for buy zones. It always depends, as everyone in finance knows, on your time horizon. If we're looking at a short time horizon, I'm very nervous about these markets. And I think that we're in for a lot of pain, unfortunately, for the next few months, for sure, uh, potentially longer. Of course, we are targeting Q4 with some sort of rebound. If you look at medium and long term, I am always bullish Bitcoin. So I do think there's always a good bottom and a good buy to be had, depending on your time horizon. Always good to get some time with you, Valkyrie Fund CEO Leah Wald. And welcome back to The Grind, too. Thank you. Coming up, we'll be speaking with our very own Rick Newman on Trump's China tariffs after a quick break. Don't go anywhere. President Joe Biden could be nearing a key decision on former President Trump's China tariffs. Yeah, we'll find in senior columnist Rick Newman has more on this. Rick, uh, good to see you as always. So what would this mean for the inflationary outlook if these tariffs are rolled back? Uh, back in March, some economists at the Peterson Institute did an analysis saying uh, they think this might actually uh, help reduce inflation by a measurable amount, maybe one percentage point. That would be if uh, Biden rolled back all of the uh, Trump tariffs, which uh, the White House indicates he's not likely to do. Um, and I think some people at the White House are feeling kind of like, well, what's the point? It, it, it's not going to do anything about gas prices, for example, which I think is a lot of people's biggest concern. But on the other hand, there's very little Biden can do, and there's not much he can tell voters that he has actually accomplished with regard to inflation. So that's why we're hearing that maybe he'll do this. Um, now, I would point out We've been hearing, we've been getting leaks from the Biden White House about a bunch of different things he might do. Um, we've been hearing that he might cancel student debt, for instance, for really months at this point. And it feels like what they're doing is releasing some trial balloons, trying to see, well, what is the reaction publicly? What are they, what might the political risk be? If he does uh, um, undo the Trump tariffs on Chinese imports, 
He is possibly opening himself to charges that he is soft on China, and they're trying to get a handle on every possible risk leading into the midterm elections in November. What have those tariffs achieved, though, Rick? Unclear. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it's it, there's been plenty of solid analysis that shows uh, they, they they just pushed the the cost of those products up. Um, Trump continually lied and said, no, when we put tariff on imports, tariffs on imports, we're not the ones paying it. Americans are not the ones paying it. It's the importers who are paying it, the Chinese uh, firms that are making this stuff. It's just patently untrue. I mean, the way a tariff works is uh, the price of the product coming into the United States goes up. So whoever is buying that product at the wholesale level here in the United States is paying more for it. And then the question becomes, can they pass that cost on to consumers or not? Probably when these tariffs went into effect back in 2018, 2019, um, the importers uh, found they could not pass a lot of that cost on to consumers because inflation was pretty low. We did not have the environment we have right now, but now there are other pressures on these uh, these uh, importers too, all the supply chain disruptions, and clearly they are passing higher costs on to consumers, which is why we now have inflation at 8.6%. Rick, uh, you know, anytime the president or any elected official is in my home state of Pennsylvania, I get a little bit, um, I get excited. And so President Biden, he had some words and continues to say that the economy is great. I believe we have a quick sot from that. The bottom line is this. I truly believe we've made extraordinary progress by laying a new foundation for our economy, which becomes clear once global inflation become, begins to recede. There's so much at stake. But the truth is, I've never been more optimistic about America than I am today. I really mean it. Okay, and so want to get your thoughts on this messaging from the president. That was at the Philadelphia Convention Center just yesterday, Rick. Pennsylvania is my home state too, Brad. Uh, but I think when uh, Biden says he's never felt more optimistic about America, that makes one of us. Uh, this is just not showing up in any consumer confidence surveys or in uh, Biden's approval rating or in any other of the other ways we measure people's attitudes. I mean, there's one consumer confidence index that shows um, people's uh, people's attitudes are worse than they were during the financial crash in 2008 and even worse than they were after 9-11 in 2001. So Biden is old enough to remember when Jimmy Carter gave the malaise speech, which made Carter just seem weak and ineffectual. So he's he, he's not going to make that mistake. He's not going to come out and say, I know everything sucks. Uh, we're we're in a bad we're in bad shape. He has to be the optimist in chief. Um, but I just don't think he's going to connect with people until gas prices go down and some of these other inflationary pressures improve. All right. Rick Newman, Yahoo Finance's own, of course, keeping tabs on everything Bidenomics. We appreciate it, Rick. Guys, guys, coming up, we'll do a final check of the markets here. We're holding on to some gains as of right now.
All right, we're just a few hours away from probably a 75 basis point rate rise announcement from the Federal Reserve. That seems to be all signs point to 75, but really the big question will be what happens after that? What does the guidance look like? Will we get more 75s? Will we get some 50s? So I'm enjoying the suspense today, you guys, and markets surprisingly are as well. Off their highs. Look, you can see uh, some of this nervousness into the big Fed day. Of course, we'll have our uh, very own Brian Chung is in D.C. covering this stuff live. But look, I mean, these markets have been eviscerated and you're going to likely hear from uh, a Fed chairman that really can care less. Yeah, just keeping tabs on some of the sectors as well in this broader. And I'm not saying yes in full agreement <laughs> of the Fed <laughs> chairman. The, saying, I know. I know uh, someone's saying I know, I get less, I get But <laughs> uh, in some of the sectors that we have seen moving higher here in uh, all of the major averages, as of right now, the S&P 500, uh, 11, you've only got three sectors in negative territory. But the three leaders right now, real estate, consumer discretionary and communication services at this point. In time. Oh, here so we go. If there, yeah, <laughs> Isn't Jay Powell is some kind of villain? I don't think he cares about this market downturn. It's not his job to care about the Well, they the cared downturn. when the markets were going up. How did they care when the markets were I going up? I think they've up? helped feed this. That's just my view. That's just my editor-at-large view. I'm, I'm mean, putting my anchor well, view on this. Well, it's my take. It's my you take. know, as we heard Miles say earlier, maybe they're happy that a lot of the money has come out of the market. Maybe they view well, it they're as They're making a lot of people poor, a lot of average folks. They're on not the, making on the, anyone poor uh, until they, you sell out of the market and until you need the money. Tell that to folks that are logging into their crypto platform or down 70%. If they still feel the, no the loss. They over that. feel the loss. They feel poor. They feel it. it doesn't they mean they it. are poorer. There's a difference. If they sell, There's they are. There's a difference. If they don't sell, they they're not. Okay. All right, Brian, our is going to be here next. Brian Chuck's in D.C. He's going to bring you the Fed coverage. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back tomorrow. <laughs>Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live on this Wednesday morning. I'm Akiko Fujita. Brian Chung is in D.C. for the Big Fed Day. We will hear from him in just a minute. But let's take a quick look at how the markets are right now. Green across the board as we count down to that 2 o'clock decision from the Fed. Uh, we are seeing the S&P 500 up 
About 1% here looking to snap the longest losing streak since January. The Dow up 228 points and the NASDAQ up about 1.5%. Let's take a look at the sectors right now. Uh, pretty much all in the green uh, except energy. And you see financial seeing some of the biggest gains there as well as consumer discretionaries. Uh, we are watching bond yields. We've seen a bit of a slight pullback in those yields ahead of the Fed's decision. The yield on the 10-year right now uh, at 3.4%, coming off of that 11-year high that we saw on Tuesday. We've seen the 30-year yield pull back a bit as well. Uh, sentiment weighed down slightly today by retail sales data that came out, pointing to a 0.3% decline in May. A lot of that weighed down by a sharp drop in vehicle sales. We're going to break down some of those numbers a little later in the show. But of course, we are kicking things off today with the central bank. All eyes on the Fed as investors brace for the Federal Reserve's decision on rates. The market now is largely expecting a hike of 75 basis points. That is the biggest jump since 1994. For more on what to expect, let's bring in Brian Chung. Standing by, as always, at the Fed. Brian, I can feel the tension as we count down to 2 o'clock. <laughs> Yeah, Kiko, 86 degrees and sunny here in Washington, D.C. Real feel about 90, although the heat is all in inflation, of course, after that uh, print that we got from the government on Friday last week showing 8.6 percent year-over-year price increases in the month of May. That's a big reason why the Fed very quickly made a pivot from their previously communicated strategy of a half a percentage point increase in this week's meeting to now all of a sudden messaging perhaps a 75 basis point or 0.75 percent increase. If you take a look at Fed funds futures markets, this is where investors can bet essentially on Fed policy. You can see about a 95 percent chance of that 75 basis point hike when that statement comes out at 2 p.m. And in fact, you're actually starting to see some pricing for perhaps a 100 basis point hike, which would be the surprise scenario. Only about 5 percent of traders seeing the probability of that happening. Of course, all of this is in response to the pair of bad reports that we got last Friday. I already mentioned inflation, but you have to remember the University of Michigan report showing consumer sentiment at the lowest levels that they've ever recorded in the history of the survey. Of course, the retail sales number that we got this morning shows how fast and how noisy all of this data is. But at least for right now, it seems like Fed policymakers want the optionality to be able to get more aggressive. A few things to watch for in the uh, meeting later on this afternoon. You have to remember we're all getting another set of economic projections from the Fed officials showing their projections for inflation. Also on economic growth, unemployment rate, in addition to where Fed rates could go over the next few years. And of course, the press conference is going to be a very interesting one with a number of topics, I'm sure, on the table. The press conference is at 2.30. The press statement is going to be at 2 p.m. We'll have the full coverage of that right here on Yahoo Finance, Kiko. And I know you've got all your questions lined up, Brian. Stay right there. Let's bring in our guests for the hour. We've got Stiefel Chief Economist, Lindsay Piegza, joining us this morning. Um, Lindsay, you know, the, the market expectation ha has really shifted over the last several days to a 75 point uh, basis, 75 basis point hike. A it sounds like you're still holding steady on that 50 basis points. What are you expecting? I think it's I, I think it's going to be difficult for the Fed to justify a larger increase uh, later this afternoon, given the rhetoric that they've previously shared with the market, suggesting that a 75 basis point increase is not something that they're considering at this point. And 50 basis point increases is what the market should expect for ongoing meetings. So I, I do think it's going to be very difficult. The Fed has essentially uh, predetermined policy at this point. Now, that's not to say that the Fed chairman can't open up or broaden the potential pathway for policy going forward during the press conference. He can certainly say that given the unexpected rise in headline inflation, a 75 basis point or larger increase may be appropriate or maybe something that the committee will be willing to consider. At the same time, we have to remember that the core level of inflation, really the, the primary metric that the Fed looks at, is beginning to show improvement. So I also think the chairman is going to remind market participants that inflation is showing some signs of abating, at least in some areas, or leveling off in other areas. And of course, this morning's number, this morning's disappointment of retail sales, reminds us that the economy and, and the consumer are still very much under pressure. And given that the vast majority of price pressures are stemming from the supply side, further more aggressive rate increases may not be the policy answer. So there's a lot that the Fed chairman is going to try to disseminate uh, in terms of the message to the market. 
Hey, Lindsay, Brian Chunk here. So, I mean, I guess on that point, what do you expect to see on the messaging from the Fed with regards to the uh, rate path for the remainder of this year? Because either way you cut or slice it, regardless of whether or not you expect 50 or 75 today, all signs seem to be pointing to something more aggressive than was plotted forward in their last economic projections in March. No, I think they're going to remain ambiguous. I think they're going to keep their options open. They're going to say that inflation remains too high and further Fed policy action is warranted. But I think they're going to be a little more careful in terms of quantifying the appropriate pathway or as they expect the appropriate pathway to evolve. So I, I don't think that the messaging is going to give us much indication or much clarity as to what to expect going forward, adding uh, on not necessarily undo, but but certainly additional volatility and uncertainty to the equity and fixed income markets going forward. Uh, Lindsay, let me push back on your earlier point because you know certainly makes you've made the case for a 50 basis point hike, and yet there is the argument on the other side that says it's better to move more aggressively so that ultimately when we start to see the slowdown, you can pull back just a bit. I mean, what's the counter argument to that? Well, the counter argument is if we move too aggressively or too fast, raising rates to a too high level, you undermine growth and force us into recession. Whereas if the Fed took a more balanced approach to raising rates, they may be able to still navigate some sort of softish landing. Again, raising rates only addresses the demand side of the equation, which is already beginning to falter. <clears throat> Excuse me, with the impact of the earlier 75 basis points, income still trending negative, uh, a loss of fiscal stimulus, savings being depleted, we're already seeing the consumer pull back from the marketplace. So the Fed is doing its job in terms of tapping down investment, tapping down consumption. But raising rates does nothing to uh, address the supply side issues, supply side constraints that we're seeing as a result of the aftermath of COVID-19 or international conflict. So by being more aggressive, sure, you have more ammunition in, in your tool belt to cut rates later when needed, but you're also ensuring a recessionary or worse stagflationary scenario. So, Lindsay, do you think that 75 basis points today raises the risk of a hard landing for the Fed? Absolutely. Absolutely. The economy is still very fragile. And so any time we're talking about an increasingly more aggressive Fed, that raises the risks of recession, or at least raises the risk of, of uh, negative growth. It doesn't have to necessarily be uh, a technical recession. But absolutely, if the Fed goes 75 basis points and signals further 75 basis point increases going forward, I think we have to move up our recession call from early 2023 to late 2022. And finally, Lindsay, um, how do you think Jay Powell today addresses the issue of inflation coming in from things that aren't necessarily in the Fed's control right now. Russia, Ukraine, obviously, still big question mark. And, and then there's what's playing out in China and whether, in fact, we could see more shutdowns. How much of that is coming through in the inflation print that we're seeing here? That's not necessarily in the Fed's control. Well, that's exactly what I mean when I say that's stemming from the supply side, which renders traditional policy metrics less effective in reining in inflation. Again, raising the cost of capital via rate increases can tap down investment, tap down consumption, but it doesn't address any issues in terms of restoring balance to the global marketplace or resolution, which is needed overseas. And so when these issues are raised, I would expect the chairman to acknowledge that these are factors that are certainly contributing to elevated inflation. But I do think he will stop short of specifically articulating that the Fed does not have control over these issues. OK, we will all be watching this afternoon. Lindsay, appreciate the time today. Stiefel Chief Economist Lindsay Piegza, along with our very own Brian Chung. Kind of weatherman, too, right? He gave us a weather forecast there. All right. The brutal sell-off continues for crypto with Bitcoin now on the brink of breaching the $20,000 level. The largest cryptocurrency now in the midst of its longest losing streak since 2014. Our very own Miles Udlin back in his familiar place with the chart of the day. I did not know this was the chart of the day. Here it is. Bitcoin <laughs> uh, year to date losses, pretty straightforward. We're down 55%. And you kind of ask yourself the question, um, if you're looking at the candlesticks here, would you buy this chart? And I think the answer for a lot of people would be no, it's looking pretty messy. Now, if we look at over the last two years, Bitcoin tells us a story that we see um, in many places. We see it in the Archiverse. We see it in Zoom, Palo Tomo. Things have gotten a little worse for them. But, you know, you had your little life before 
COVID, things went up, things came back down. It's like it never happened. Bitcoin suggesting um, similar action here as we look at the chart. So over the last couple of years, yes, it has doubled, but that is where uh, we drew the line on 2020. Remember, Bitcoin, I think, went down about 3,500 during the depths of the COVID sell-off. Over the last five years is where things get very, very, very interesting for Bitcoin right now. Uh, we'll see how my drawing is, but you can see this bottom line, the 20,000 line, and we draw it all the way across kind of where we stand today. We are within a couple thousand dollars, uh, about $1,500 or so of taking out the 2017 highs in Bitcoin. And that is a very, very important level for folks who want to get constructive about the current Bitcoin cycle. We can see, um, and I don't, we don't have to go too far into the depths here, but you know, Jared has taught me a lot over the years. <laughs> and if you just look at this Bitcoin chart, you can see the way that we floated higher at the end of 2020 has not left a lot of strong buyers in the market. And that's why we've really cut like butter through these support levels on the way down. Price has memory is a thing you'll hear a lot of um, technical traders say. And when Assets haven't spent a lot of time at a certain price level. Bitcoin has not spent a lot of time at 40,000, at 50,000, even at 30,000, but it has spent some considerable time above 20,000. That's a level that's going to have a lot of memory. All this stuff up here is kind of, Akiko, looking a little bit more um, like a, I wouldn't say a dream of sorts, but a, a frantic period, maybe. So, what does that tell you? I mean, I think. Everybody who is invest invested in Bitcoin is just asking, well, how much more downside is there? Mm -hmm. If you look at where the declines are, I mean, we have seen crypto companies coming out, announcing layoffs. I mean, talking about this prolonged crypto winter. Yeah, it's it's hard to see given the, the scale of this. But if when I look at this chart, I look at the eight to nine thousand eight to ten thousand level, let's call it. And it's really this high from 2019. Uh, where there's going to be kind of secondary support below the 20,000 level. The problem is that's like another 60% below where we are today. And I think the challenge that so many investors have learned, whether you're in cryptocurrency or otherwise, is that the price of your asset going down probably means the value of your asset has gotten worse, right? There's this logic of, we kind of hear it from the Kathy Woods of the world, oh, I owned a stock at 100, now it's at 30. It's an even better buy than it was at 100. It's like, well... It went from 100 to 30 because the market thought it was a 70% worse business. And even if it's a 30% worse business, it doesn't make any sense at 100. So I think we're kind of getting to, to that point in crypto. We're getting to it in a lot of individual stocks. It's a very challenging period. I mean, I keep coming back to that number that we saw in November, $68,000. That's kind of where the decline is. You can have a seat here, Miles. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know how we're doing this. They told me they'd cover me up, but you know, you were on. Um, you were so, on camera. so yeah. you know, we're talking about the fall from the the, the record that we saw, sixty-eight thousand dollars. There's a number of factors, right? If we're talking about the sell-off that we've mm -hmm. seen more recently, it is about risk off. We're, we're seeing it move in tandem with the riskiest equities. But at the same time, there's also structural questions, and that's not Bitcoin specifically. It's more crypto with what we've seen with Terra, what we've seen with Celsius now. And then, of course, the regulation hasn't even taken shape. Yeah, and then, you're, you know, you see it today with uh, 3AC, a crypto hedge fund. And really, it all comes down to what have all of these different outfits, whether you are a, an algorithmic stablecoin like a Terra or um, whether you are a broker, you know, a, a kind of a custodian like a Celsius or you're an investor, most crypto outfits, let's call them, mm -hmm. have used Bitcoin as essentially their store of like their dollar, as it were. And so I think what we've really seen in Bitcoin over the last couple of days is a liquid, it's been an orderly liquidation, right? It is people who owe Bitcoin to make, you know, whether it's their investors, their users whole in dollars, and they just have to dump it on the market. Now, Ethereum is an interesting one. It kind of fits that same bill as well. We've seen Ethereum come from 4,000 down to 1,100. Um, I remember 2017 was a big deal when Ethereum went to 300. So that's 75% below where we are today. Uh, and yeah, so that kind of gets to like that financial plumbing conversation maybe, right? It's sort of like the financial crisis version of crypto. But fortunately, you talk about regulations. Fortunately, I 
think that picture is a little better today than it was. Well, and, and, and some would argue, you know, it, it, like the FDXs of the world would argue that yeah. this is actually a good thing. A, a shakedown was necessary. <laughs> yeah, I, oh, God. Right? There we go. Yeah, everything's good in the crypto world. Well, right? well, not necessarily. And it's not good when people are losing yeah. money, but yeah. this provides a little more clarity for what that regulation should look like, or does it? Uh, I don't, I think it does. Like, I think Celsius is an interesting example where, um, where crypto regulation really fails is, right now and where it doesn't really exist is in protecting consumers who, you know, put dollars into a digital asset that is not a security. And that was housed inside of some custodians funds. And now that money is gone. So that is kind of an obvious area, um, you know, for regulatory action. But we know how regulators act in terms of speed, by design, of course. And I think the crypto markets, I don't think, I know the crypto markets move faster than that. And so where we wash out on the other side of this uh, is, it's going to look like, it's going to look very different. And I think we're starting to see the outlines of that with you know, your Coinbase's of the world, your crypto.coms. I mean, th these companies are really, really feeling the squeeze. Um, and I think that price has been a leading indicator on that. I think the fundamental level is probably going to get worse. All I can see is that crypto.com sign in former Staples to see 20 years from you now. Know, I was off, in the, I was off in the wilderness when it happened, <laughs> yeah. but I'm hopeful that you guys were like, oh, that's the top when they renamed Staples, yeah. right? Yeah, I think that might have been a sign. It's, it's, it's an indicator. Okay. All right, Miles, Thanks. sitting in for Brian here in the A Block. Thanks he so much. He won't like this. That. Don't tell him this happened. <laughs> Thanks so much for that. Coming up on the other side, the national average for gas prices passing $5 a gallon and climbing with no end in sight. President Biden now calling out big oil companies to do more. We'll explain after the break. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. Well, higher gas prices may be here to stay. This according to a new report from the International Energy Agency, the IEA warning that global oil supply will fall short of expected demand, citing an expected demand spike from China as that country reopens after COVID lockdowns, plus limited oil supply as sanctions on Russia continue 
to bite. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Inez Ferre, who's tracking the oil markets for us today. And Inez, of course, we also got that big news this morning with the president sending a letter to the largest oil companies saying essentially, pump more or I will invoke my emergency powers. Yeah, that's right. And talking about refining capacity, uh, look, this has been an ongoing battle between the oil industry and the Biden administration, who's to blame, uh, pointing fingers. Uh, we know that the gasoline prices at the pump, these high prices, a lot of this has to do with uh, refining capacity and uh, refining capacity that's been limited. And the oil industry has also criticized the Biden administration for not issuing new uh, drilling leases. I spoke to one energy expert that told me, look, refining capacities are huge investments. Nobody wants them in their backyard. And the industry has been warned that it is going into, that all economies are going into green economies. So this will be an obsolete uh, sort of investment five to 10 years from now. Uh, so a lot of issues uh, to get to dig into there. But of course, uh, for the president, uh, he also wants to uh, seem as well that he wants to appear as well to the American people that he is doing something about these prices. Yeah, in many ways, this is a, a PR battle going into uh, the midterm elections. Um, and as you know, you mentioned the, the capacity, but also the investment that's necessary here. And certainly if you look at the 10 year outlook where the market is headed, some would argue, well, there's no need for that investment because that demand, even though it's being really um, it's, it's outpacing the supply right now, it's not going to be there with cars switching over to EVs, with more investments in green energy. You said you've been speaking to some analysts on the street. What are they telling you about how much higher this could all go in terms of gas prices when we're already talking about more than $5 a gallon national average? Yeah, that's right. And you've got 16 states where the average in those states are above that $5, a national average. So I spoke to several analysts about where these prices will go, particularly this year, this summer, as people are filling up their tanks. Uh, one of them told me that he sees prices peaking at around $5.50 on a national average. He said, unfortunately, uh, it would take a recession to uh, kill demand. And that is what he said. What he sees is limiting the uh, price on gasoline is if you see that demand destruction. And we are starting to see signs of that demand destruction. I spoke to another expert. She says that she sees prices anywhere between $5 and $5.50 a gallon. You remember when JP Morgan's uh, analyst came out and said that they could see prices going to $6 a gallon by August. But um, the feeling is, is that by the time that you get to six dollars, there's just uh, too much demand destruction that there already uh, would be uh, some type of slowdown of recession. In fact, I also spoke to uh, Tom Klozeff. Uh, he t he said to me, uh, an energy analyst as well, he says that the national average could be slipping in the next uh, several days. You may actually see it go below five dollars a gallon mm -hmm. because of that demand destruction. In fact, today. Uh, according to AAA, the national average is at five dollars and one penny, whereas yesterday it was five dollars and two cents. So it did drop down by one penny. But again, these are national averages, and a lot of places uh, you see these gas prices above this. Yeah, well, at this point, no question, drivers will take any relief that comes their way. And as I appreciate you keeping a close watch on that, let's do a quick check here of the market sponsored by Flex Shares. Uh, we are seeing the Nasdaq leading the gains today in this session, although all three major indices are in the green. Of course, investors looking to D.C. and that decision expected to come down from the Federal Reserve at 2 o'clock. And we're going to continue to uh, track the market reaction there. Coming up on the other side, another disappointing miss on the economic front, this time in retail. We break down today's May retail sales report after the break.
U.S. retail sales unexpectedly fell 0.3 percent in May as inflation sets food and gas prices to record levels, weighing on consumer spending. The fall in May is a sharp reversal from the increase in April. Joining us to discuss is Corsite Research founder and CEO Deborah Weinswig. Um, Deborah, it's good to talk to you today. If you take out gas station sales, we're talking about a decline here of 0.7 percent in May, which certainly points to the fact that a lot of these higher prices are start starting to eat into, um, you know, the budget for consumers. And how do you look at this report today? Yeah, I think, right, the consumer is spending a lot more on essentials. And as a result, you know, we're seeing categories, I, I would say, even, you know, kind of greater than we would have expected, like furniture and home furnishings, which, you know, the the growth was modest. And then if you account for, you know, kind of what we're seeing on the inflationary front, I mean, was, you know, in real terms was quite negative. And we're seeing more of this movement right towards value orientation, where consumers are still spending. But I would say it's this, you know, kind of increase on the essential side. And, you know, I don't think that there's a, a near term end in sight either. Yeah, I mean, if you Listen to what we're hearing from some of the big name retailers. It is about shifting consumer habits, to your point, going more towards the essentials, but also smaller ticket items, which is a, a real shift from what we saw last year. What have you been seeing in your research in terms of the shift there and in, in how much I mean, what are things going to look like months down the line? You know, it's interesting since the pandemic started, we've run uh, weekly surveys. And so, you know, which really support kind of a lot of the changes we've seen. And you know, this past week we saw the highest percentage of it's actually the first time it's it's kind of crossed over 50% of buying fewer items. And so we're going to see kind of less items. 42% uh, of people said they're seeking out discounts and promos. And then another real change, this was interesting, was cutting back elsewhere in terms of services and whatnot. So everything that you would expect to be happening is, I just think it's it's more exaggerated than many of us would have expected at this point. Yeah, and the question is, how much worse is it going to get? We're, of course, awaiting that Fed decision this afternoon, expecting a higher rate here. That's going to eat into credit card debt, into car loans. I mean, how do you see that reflected in retail sales overall as we look ahead? You know, it's interesting because I think that on the, the payment side, right, it's been easier to kind of finance transactions, right, with a lot of these buy now, pay later uh, kind of aggregate and whatnot. And so I do worry, and we're actually hearing retailers for the first time bringing back layaway, right? So we're, hmm. we are already starting to see some of these changes come through on the payment side. And I think, you know, retailers are going to be aware that you have a consumer who's stretched, who needs kind of some of those, you know, smaller items that they can, you know, surprise and delight. If we think about the holiday season, which of course, right, this is a time that we retailers think about that. But I think that, you know, off of a very strong holiday 21, I, I will tell you, it is keeping me up awake, you know, up at night right now thinking about this holiday season. Yeah, I mean, uh, to that point, if you look at this month's or May's numbers, um, a lot of the declines there weighed down by a drop in vehicle sales, uh, you know, supply a big issue on that front, too. But what sector do you see getting hit the hardest? I mean, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, kind of home and home furnishings, but, you know, once again, department stores, which kind of account for beauty, jewelry, accessories, apparel, also quite negative when we looked at the, kind of the, the real numbers and, you know, what was actually posted, their sales were down 1.5%. And, it, you know, starting to see some of these, you know, fewer trips right to the mall, right, because of gas prices. And then right when they're there, they're, uh, the, the intentions are stronger in terms of where they're spending. And you know, sales and, and whatnot are only driving so much. You have a consumer who's going in much more budget-minded than we've seen in quite some time. And I think retailers are having to kind of also rethink a bit on the fly their marketing. But one of the biggest issues right now is they've got a lot of inventory that they ordered at times that were, you know, for different seasons that are all in the store right now as well. So we've we've got kind of as you know the supply chain challenge, we have the inflation challenge, and then we just have the the, the demand issue, and it's all kind of coming to a head at once. Yeah, and we heard that warning from Target last week, saying uh, prices, you know, price cuts are coming because they have to clear that inventory. Deborah, it's good to have you on today. Deborah Weinswig, Coresight Research founder and CEO. Coming up on the other side, big problems for big tech. More layoffs announced in the tech and crypto space. Who's getting hit the hardest? We'll discuss after the break.
Well, the recent slide in markets slamming the tech sector with layoffs and hiring freezes hitting major tech companies among the big losers. More recently announcing Coinbase announcing layoffs that would cut nearly 20 percent of its staff alongside real estate tech company Redfin and Compass. Joining us more to discuss is Yahoo Finance's Dan Halley. Dan, we should point out um, tech kind of leading the gains today in the session in terms of the sectors, but it has been a, a brutal decline, especially for these high growth companies. And we've seen that reflected in the layoffs. Yeah. And, you know, tech obviously kind of the always the, the one to benefit the most and hurt the most uh, when it comes to any kind of changes in the market. So, uh, you know, maybe we're seeing uh, the kind of rebound from the past few days. But, you know, we got to talk about these layoffs uh, and these hiring freezes at some of these companies. And you said, obviously, uh, we had Redfin, Compass, Coinbase, they're having layoffs as well. Uh, then we have just some other companies on here that you wouldn't necessarily uh, expect. Obviously, uh, we knew about Netflix for a while. Uh, they had announced after that just atrocious quarter that they had had. Uh, Tesla, Elon Musk saying that they wanted to lay off some of their salaried workers, but they are it's worth pointing out, hiring some of the, the hourly factory workers. But then you have Bird Global, Stitch Fix, Carvana, uh, Robin Hood, Peloton. You know, those are names that have been kind of under the gun for a little bit. Uh, Peloton especially, you know, uh, they really just kind of blew up at the early part uh, of the pandemic. And then everyone was like, $4,000 for a, a bike? Whoa, what? Uh, and I think most people were like, nah, I'll just get like a $20 bike and then strap my iPad to it and that'll be it. But, you know, it's not I've seen just... a lot of people do that. Actually. Hey, man, yeah. I get it. Right. Yep. I, you know, I don't even need to pay for uh, for Peloton. Let's get the Apple Fitness Plus thing. But, um, you know, as far as slowdowns, not just layoffs, it's it's slowdowns as well. And that's what we're seeing big tech kind of mm -hmm. contend with now. Intel slowdowns, NVIDIA uh, slowdowns, Microsoft specifically pointing out their teams uh, and office groups are having slowdowns. Uh, Lyft, Uber, Snap, Wayfair, uh, Meta. Uh, Twitter is kind of a function uh, of the Elon Musk takeover where they were like, we don't know what to do right now. Who knows who's going to own us? We'll just hold off. And they also, uh, there were reports that they were pulling back on uh, verbal agreements to bring people on. So, so, so there's company specific stories. Yes, we are yeah. seeing a broader decline when we talk about valuations of these companies. How much of this is, is just about the shareholder pressure that's coming in? I mean, we heard that from you know, a company like Uber that said it is about profitability now. So these are companies that really focused on high growth, growth at all costs, but it's not necessarily, if you look at a company like Netflix, it's not on the verge of a collapse. No. It, it's just a resetting of expectations, right? Right. It's it's that, and that's the perfect way to put it, is that it's each company's own individual problems are coming out uh, of the wash almost as we see this, this uh, market downturn. So, uh, you know, you obviously have Intel, NVIDIA. They're dealing with issues related to uh, chip availability. Uh, NVIDIA seeing some pullback potentially uh, into the cloud space. Microsoft, uh, they said that uh, it's pressure from uh, foreign exchange. Uh, you know, uh, we have uh, Twitter, obviously the Elon Musk stuff, Meta, they're still dealing with uh, the issues. I mean, they talk about Ukraine uh, being a problem uh, as far as uh, ads go into the future, as well as iOS privacy changes, right? So it's a lot of different things here. Redfin, them, uh, they were saying, the CEO saying that they just need to start making money. Uh, so it is that each of these companies are all hurting as a result of the way the market's going right now, despite, uh, you know, kind of rebounding a little bit. Uh, but they have their own underlying issues that now they're saying, OK, if we're under pressure, we're going to have to deal with these. This is how we're going to do it. We're either going to freeze hiring uh, or we're going to have layoffs. And, you know, I think it is worth pointing out that, you know, the, the stalwarts are seemingly just doing slowdowns so far. Uh, Google has, uh, Alphabet Google, hasn't even announced anything uh, as far as slowdowns or layoffs. Amazon basically saying, look, we just went hog wild hiring yeah. people to Especially get things out the door. Especially over the last the two years. Right. Uh, buying up uh, uh, real estate, 
Uh, you know, there's talk of them trying to sublet some of their warehouses or unload them. They have land that they haven't even built on yet that they're just holding on to for the future. So, you know, the stalwarts seem to be holding on, yeah. but a lot of smaller companies, even the chip stuff, that's that seems to be hurting. Yeah, it, important to differentiate. What we're hearing from Microsoft and Amazon is not the same as what we're seeing at a place like Coinbase. No, no, yeah. not at all. Okay. Uh, Dan, you've got the story up on the site, so you can go and read that too. Thanks so much for that. Well, those layoffs at tech adjacent real estate companies indicating another sector under pressure from the market sell-off. As Dan mentioned, Redfin and Compass both announcing layoffs yesterday, cutting 8% and 10% of their workforce, respectively. This is rising interest rates create a drop in demand for mortgages. Here with more, we've got Rhonda Lee yes. with me here at the desk. Um, it, it, I have to tell you, just looking at those rates ticking higher, you certainly get the sense that a lot of buyers who are on the market are saying, well, maybe this is the time to hit pause. Well, as the saying goes, you got to get in where you fit in. At the beginning of the year, rates were at 3.5, uh, 3.45. And they were saying that, you know, wouldn't see more than 4% by the end of the year. Well, here we are. <laughs> we're at 5.23. So the people who got lucky were the ones that did it last year. Unfortunately, with the rising rates, you know, first time home buyers are kind of the affordability thing is messing them up. But even with the pullback, it's, you know, just like the markets, it only lasts for a minute. Mm. So it's kind of correcting itself. The mortgage lenders have done layoffs months before. So it only makes sense that Redfin and Compass and other places are doing this. If you can recall, better.com. So it's kind of just the market is cooling off. Uh, and this is what's happening. So if you look at the mortgage demand compared to a year ago, it is about half of what we saw. But you mentioned something that the way to look at this is, is kind of hibernation, not necessarily yes. that this is really going to lead to a significant pullback. You know, what are we seeing in terms of applications? Are we starting to see that reflected in very specific markets? So mortgage applications, particularly refi, they're down which is to be expected. And the reason, 70, I think refis are down 70% from last year, major reason for most of the layoffs with the mortgage lenders. People are now looking at the rising mortgage rates and they're like, is it worth it for me to enter the market? So if I sell my house, most of the time sellers are your next home, your, your buyers. If the mortgage rates are too high for them, they're gonna stay, we talked about, it's called interest rate lock-in, they're staying put which is leading to the other problem, one of the reasons why everything's kind of funky, the housing inventory, those sellers are staying put. So we have the supply chain problem for the new home construction, and we're not having our existing homeowners move out and move up. So that whole, you know, mobile uh, moving up into the bigger and better home is harder. So that's the main reason why we have this bigger problem. Also, we got the inflation. Nobody saw that on the market. It, you know, it's it's impacting yeah. people. They got gas, they got fuel, and now they can't get in. Yeah, buyers and sellers both now crunching the numbers as we continue to see the rates tick up. Uh, Rhonda, appreciate you joining us on set today. Coming up on the other side, two downgrades in two days for Robinhood. And you see the stock there down more than 2%. How the current market volatility is affecting the already struggling stock. That's after the break.
Well, Robin Hood currently trading down about 2% there in the session after an early morning downgrade from Atlantic Equities. The trading platform was downgraded to underweight with a $5 price target. To talk more about the state of the company, we've got S&P Global Market Intelligence Senior Research Analyst Tom Mason. Uh, Tom, I'm looking at the stock right now, $7 a share for talking about a $5 price target, which is what this particular analyst called for. 30% downside. It feels like Robinhood's kind of getting hit from all sides. The volatility on the equity side, but also the declines we're seeing in crypto. Yeah, exactly. I think that uh, there was this notion that the crypto markets would be, you know, uh, low correlation with the regular equity markets. And uh, yeah, it's just been the exact opposite. Uh, like you were saying throughout the, the program, retail investors are just ditching growth stocks, uh, any kind of risky investments right now. Yeah, the question is on the equity side, um, how many of the retail traders are staying put? Obviously, Robinhood has seen huge surges on the back of the growth in retail trade. Uh, in terms of Atlantic equities, they say specifically falling, falling equity trading volumes and regulatory change threatens the equity revenue. It sounds like you're not necessarily seeing those declines yet. Yeah, um, I can see why analysts would be concerned, uh, myself included. Um, but yeah, based on Schwab and Interactive Brokers, uh, we really haven't seen a huge decline in trading volumes. I think what we're seeing on the retail side is like the broader market where people are reallocating. So they're just they're not necessarily leaving the market entirely. They're just going into uh, less risky investments. So you're saying that hasn't necessarily affected trading volumes. I mean, the question then is, well, why are we seeing so much downside to Robinhood? I'm looking through your notes here, and you say specifically that, that it is really about diversifying the revenue base. What changes does Robinhood need to make given the market conditions right now? Yeah, so there's been two themes, uh, two natural pivots that I see for them. Uh, one would be to actually acquire a bank, um, which you know they've tried to go through the process of forming one, um, so that, that they would get more deposit income. Um, yeah, the sweep, uh, sweep deposits. Um, so any kind of net interest revenue. Um, then also, I think if they went into asset management, um, I think that their mission is to not do that because they want to just democratize the markets and say, hey, you know, you can trade whatever you want. But I think the asset management would be a much more stable revenue base and, uh, yeah, potentially lucrative for them. How much value do you think something like that could unlock? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, for Schwab, it's typically 20 to 25 percent of the revenue base. So, yeah, I think that would... Um, yeah, be nice. And I think also Robinhood uh, needs to grow along with their customers. So I think Cash App is going to come in and take all the Gen Z investors away from them uh, based on what I've been seeing. So I think that uh, asset management would make total sense as millennials get older and start to think more about wealth planning. How do you look at the regulatory risk for Robinhood? We've obviously seen the SEC now weigh in on payment for order flow, which is a huge revenue maker for the company. Um, we're not talking about a complete ban yet, but how big of a hit is Robinhood likely to take? Yeah. So my estimate back when Robinhood was still trading around uh, $30 a share was their stock would be cut in half um, based on the reaction that we saw after brokers all eliminated commissions. So like Schwab, TD Ameritrade at the time, um, they all, their revenue, or sorry, their stock decreased about the same amount of, as the revenue that they lost from that. And since Robinhood makes up about half of its revenue from payment for order flow. It also has some crypto transaction rebates, some um, fees from options trading, but I think that would, yeah, it would cut the stock in half at least. Cut the stock in half. $7, half and $7. <laughs> We're talking about uh, slowly approaching penny territory there. Um, Tom, I appreciate your time today. S&P Global Market Intelligence Senior Research Analyst, Tom Mason. Coming up ahead, a swing and a miss for Disney. Now Disney Plus could lose millions of subscribers. We'll explain on the other side. We'll be right back.
Disney suffering a big setback in its ongoing pursuit to expand its sports offerings, losing out on streaming rights to Cricket's popular Indian Premier League. The media giant was outbid by the Viacom 18 joint venture, partially owned by rival Paramount Global. For more on this, let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer. And Josh, you know, my first thought was, how many people actually sit through a cricket game? Obviously, it's huge in India. What are the implications for Disney? Yeah, so really what the implications are for Disney is we're going to talk about Disney Plus subscribers, right? That's where this always goes. But first, I want to hit the numbers mm -hmm. over a $6 billion deal total. So when we look at those numbers specifically, you can see on the screen now, Disney did get the linear TV deal over $3 billion. They didn't get the digital rights. So Disney Plus Hotstar is what it's called in India. They didn't get those digital rights, which were also $3 billion. So what we're wondering here, did they win or did they lose? $3 billion is a lot of money to spend, right? It's a lot of money to spend, but Disney had highlighted in their last earnings call, mm -hmm. specifically Disney Plus Hotstar and specifically the Indian Premier League for driving Disney Plus Hotstar subscribers. Mm -hmm. So now my question is, you're highlighting it as a positive, right? People are watching this, it's bringing in subscribers. When it came time to pay for it, you pretty much said it was too much money. Yep. And now we're getting into that question with these streamers. Are we talking about subscribers or are we talking about spend? And I think that's going to be a big question when so, we come next quarter. So let's talk about subscribers. I mean, if, if that was seen as a big boost, right? how many subscribers do they lose? Or do they lose subscribers as a result? So they added 8 million subscribers last quarter globally. Over half of them were Indian subscribers to Disney Plus Hotstar. And they believe that a lot of that was because of the Indian Premier League. So it depends. Does someone fully unsubscribe, right? Were they just a fan of that league? If they were, then maybe it is 4 million subscribers. And that's going to be a number that we know Wall Street's going to want to circle when we talk about the earnings. It's interesting how increasingly the conversation around streaming has become about around sports. And we've obviously talked about you know, Amazon, um, ESPN, obviously a big player there. But Apple scoring another big win here. Yeah, so Apple yesterday announced a partnership with MLS for $2.5 billion at a minimum. That's a 10-year deal, so $250 million annually. And really what the big thing here is, we all love soccer, MLS is big. They're getting further into sports. Mm. And what's coming down the line? Probably NFL Sunday ticket. And when NFL Sunday ticket comes, that's over $2 billion. So I talked to Dan Ives over at Wedbush Securities. He said this is the appetizer. The big meal's coming. They think they're already in the winner's circle for NFL Sunday ticket. And he thinks their, their content spend is going to double over the next year to probably closer to $12, $15 billion with a focus on live sports. The difference being, we know Apple TV loves the premium content, right? Those really good movies, Kodo, winning picture of the year. With sports, you can go more quantity. And mm. he thinks that Apple's going to go the quantity route with sports and just grab as many meteorites as they can. It's still hard for me to wrap my head around Apple and the NFL, if that is really what's coming down the pipeline. You have to wonder how much longer uh, Netflix is going to stay on the sidelines. They, they've kind of talked about F1 as potentially one because of the show and how that has brought in so many new fans. You know, where, where does Netflix fall? So they've been rumored with F1, right, which makes sense. I think that would you'd have to think F1 would be first, and then where do you go from there? Because Netflix isn't known for live sports at all. They've resisted and it for so they, long. And they, in most recently as last quarter, they were asked directly about it and said, that's not really how we do sports. We're not looking to do sports in that fashion. And now we're, we're talking about billions of dollars to spend to get into it, right? Does Netflix really want to spend a billion dollars to stream 15 NFL games like Amazon did? Probably not. That's not the kind of cash that Netflix is going to shell out when we're talking about sports media rights, it's an expensive business. Yeah, they've talked about being sports adjacent with the shows. Right. I mean, F1 kind of makes sense, but you have to wonder if they're going to face increasing shareholder pressure when you've got the biggest competitors at a time when they're eating into the mm -hmm. user base for Netflix, going after some of the biggest sports brands, right? Well, there's a new golf league that needs a streamer, Akiko. <laughs> Tie the two big sports stories <laughs> together. Go. There you go. All right. That's a suggestion for Netflix. Josh, thanks so much for bringing us that story. All right. Let's take a final look at the markets. Of course, all eyes are on the Fed. We are counting down to that decision at two o'clock. Going into it, though, all three majors in the green right now. Uh, I think the Nasdaq was leading the gains on that front. Of course, we're going to have 
all of the coverage for you starting at two o'clock today. We're gonna break down the Fed's decision. And then of course that 2.30 p.m. press conference with Fed Chair Jay Powell. You certainly don't wanna miss it. Our very own Brian Chung on the ground there bringing us all of the very latest. That does it for me on this Wednesday. Much more to come on Yahoo Finance Live. Finally diving into the alcohol space, the beverage giant announced a new partnership with Brown Foreman to launch a ready-to-drink Jack and Coke cocktail. The product will debut in Mexico at the end of, end of this year, followed by select markets globally next year. Joining us now in a Yahoo Finance exclusive is Brown Foreman CEO Lawson Whiting. Lawson, great to see you again. Look, this product makes all sorts of sense. I mean, this is a drink many folks have been drinking for decades. What type of, how much in sales could this do within the first 12 months? Well, we're good, as, as you said, we're going to be launching in Mexico towards the end of this calendar year and then a whole lot more markets, um, you know, in, the, in 2023. We'll see. I mean, we haven't given any guidance on the absolute size of the product. It, it is a little bit difficult to know. There is a Jack and Cola product that's already quite sizable for us. It's a big business for us around the world. It's particularly big in places like Germany and Australia, but um, certainly putting the Coke label on the can is, is a game changer and uh, something that we're really excited about. Hey Lawson, it's Julie here. Explain something to me. Why does putting this in a can like we have, you guys obviously are not the only ones, right? We have seen this explosion in canned cocktails. Why does putting it in a can make such a difference than just yeah. pouring two different beverages in a glass? Well, I mean, it's about portability and convenience are a huge issue there. I mean, um, really, I mean, we've been in this business for 30 years with Jack and Cola. So, I mean, it's already, as I said, a big business around the world for us. Consumers love it. I mean, if you take a place like Australia, just as an example, the, the RTD business is much bigger than what we call glass or the bottle Jack Daniels business. So there is a consumer demand for these products. And when the when the pandemic hit, the business absolutely went you know on a rocket ship and really took off as consumers were consuming at home as opposed to in the bars and restaurants. And so yeah, there's a proven consumer demand for these RTD products. Obviously, there's a lot of people getting into the business right now but they're not getting in with two of the biggest trademarks um, in their respective categories in the world. So um, we, yeah, we're quite optimistic. Beyond Mexico, how available would the product be to be able to be scaled up to other parts of the world? Yeah, no, this is global. So this is a global agreement. Um, and it, you know, it's gonna take us a little bit of time to get ourselves organized and get, a, to get it into distribution. 
but um, I do think 2023 will be a big year. And yeah, this, um, you know, for us, I mean, Coke has such a magnificent distribution system. Obviously, they're as large as they are. Um, and so places like Africa, India, we see this really as an emerging market play where places where we're not as big. And so, um, and it's exciting in those markets where consumers often can't afford an entire bottle of Jack Daniels, um, they can afford a can of, of Jack and Coke. And so it's an entree into some of these markets for us and an, another reason why we feel pretty good. Lawson, I'm I'm definitely wearing the dumb question hat today because I got very upset with Brian Sazi yesterday for telling me that there would be a zero sugar version of this. I said, but surely there is sugar in whiskey. I was reading on your website, there isn't sugar in Jack Daniels, which I have to admit I was shocked about because it tastes like there's sugar in it. So <laughs> I know you probably don't get this question very often, but like t- talk us through this process and what is actually in whiskey for a second? Well, whiskey, it com- the, the sugar goes out in the distillation process. But, I mean, it is, it's a series of grains and water. Um, it's really not particularly complicated, more complicated than that. It's one of those things where we every drop is, is distilled down in, in Lynchburg, Tennessee, and we export it out to the world. Um, you know, but it's a, um, you know, obviously we make, we've been making Jack Daniels now for 60 or 70 years. Um, and it is one of, you know, it's one of the best whiskeys in the world. And it is what we believe is the largest um, whiskey in the world. So, um, you know, it's an excellent product that we're quite proud of. Lawson, you've been uh, at Brown Foreman for a good time. How do you envision your business performing if we do get a recession? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, the, the spirits business has been extremely resilient to a lot of different economic conditions over the years. And so, um, good times and bad, we have performed fairly well, a lot more resilient than a lot of other industries. So we'll see. I mean, the one issue is, is does the consumer start to trade down? Brown Foreman in the last decade, 15 years or so, has really reshaped its portfolio to be more premium. So we shed most of our wine businesses. We still own Sonoma Gautier, but we sold the rest of them out. We've sold our less than premium spirit businesses for the most part. And so we are, we are you know, our price points are quite high. Um, which in one way means our consumer is a, um, a little bit towards the higher income scale. And so hopefully there won't be as much trading down there, but it's true there in past recessions and back in 2001 and in 2009, you did see some trading down. Now this Jack and Coke in a can could be a benefactor from some trading down because it, while it's still a very, very premium price point, um, it's not as expensive as somebody trying to buy an entire bottle, say of Jack Daniels. And it should be noted, too, you're not just Jack Daniels. You're having a lot of success in the tequila business. But before I let you go, I want to talk about supply chain challenges. Now, where are you at in terms of glass shortages, can shortages, any of that ending yet? Yeah, well, the glass shortages has been the story for us in the last 12 months. Um, And when you really look at our business, it became a huge problem last summer. And we ended up knowing we had a finite amount of glass. We allocated it to Jack Daniels Tennessee Whiskey. The on-premise was opening around the world. We wanted to make sure as the biggest brand in that, in that, um, in around the world that we wanted it to be available. And so that caused us to have big shortages for brands like Gentleman Jack and Single Barrel and Woodford and Old Forester and Aradura and, and the others. And so we are now in the process of reloading and you would have seen that in Q4 for us. Um, we were able to get a whole lot more glass and a lot more into the distributor warehouses, and it's just now getting into the consumer hands. And so, um, you know, I, I, it bodes well for this fiscal year because we got a lot of inventory replenishment to do. The situation is not solved, but it is getting better. And we expect, and what we have told folks, that we by the end of Q2 for us, we expect to be back in a kind of a quote unquote more normal state.
Expectations, as we've been discussing, they're mounting for a 75 basis point rate hike amid rising inflation. And joining us now for more on this is Canaccord Genuity Chief Market Strategist Tony Dwyer. Tony, good to have you here with us this morning. First and foremost, I mean, the environment that we find ourselves in right now, where the markets are trying to the best of their ability price in what the Fed may do and whether or not the Fed may actually tip us into a recession. Your thoughts on that? Investors have no idea what the Fed's going to do, and I don't think the Fed has any idea what they're going to do. I mean, maybe maybe they'll change it throughout this day. But remember, after the last Fed meeting at the press conference, Fed Chair Powell said that they're not actively considering a 75 basis point move. But then literally the next day, all the Fed governors are out talking about a 75 basis point move. So unless they wanted to talk to the media instead of the chairman, that seemed a little strange to me. So ultimately, it really comes down to what the market expects. And at this point, pretty much a 75 basis point uh, hike is priced into it. And, it. and that really, ultimately, that sets the stage for you know the potential for a bottom, um, not the bottom, and there is a, differenti a differentiation we can talk about there. But it, you know, you've had three days in a row of 85% downside volume on the NYSC. The Fed meeting is tomorrow. Market re you know, readjusted yesterday to the idea of a 75 basis point hike. So ultimately, if that's what you get, that kind of is built into it. Hey, Tony, it's Julie. What's the Thank effect you. of a 75 basis point rate hike? And I'm not talking about on psychology here for a moment. I'm talking yeah. about sort of logistically, structurally, mechanically. What does that do to market activity? Well, let's talk about what it does to lending and credit. Mm -hmm. So a 75 basis point hike, which is a pretty good sized jump, um, changes all the short-term variable rate debt that's based on LIBOR or prime. So you're going to get a pretty good move. The, the, ultimately, Julie, as you know, the market, what's been different this cycle that's been so intriguing, intriguing um, is <laughs> that the Fed guided right away to where they thought the terminal rate would be. So you had a rate of change on the, on the entire yield curve, meaning two years, five years, 10 years, 30 years. You had an immediate move to the terminal rate. So that was the fastest rate of change that I've ever seen. Even if you look at mortgage rates, I ran a screen this morning, it's more than double any six month rate of change that I can find in its in the history of the data series on Bloomberg. So it's really one of those times where the, the fixed side went there right away. Now the variable rate side is gonna catch up. That affects all the short-term debt that moves with, again, as I said, LIBOR or prime. So we've got, We've gotten the fixed income, like the mortgage side of it, it's kind of in it, but that's not because that's an increased interest expense. Tony, I know you you track a lot of indicators. Is there anything you're seeing that we that would suggest we are nearing some form of short term bottom? Yeah, I would say that those three things that I just suggest or three things um, that when you get three, three, 85 percent. NYSC downside volume days, meaning for those that aren't familiar with that kind of statistic, it's when 85% of the volume traded on the New York Stock Exchange is to the downside. 98, I mean, it was 98% yesterday. Those are extreme numbers. And again, it doesn't suggest the next ticks the low, but it does suggest that you've washed it out. It's not like the first day, that was three days in a row. When we look back at the last time that happened, it was in 2015 after the initial whoosh, you had two days that just ripped right back, went back down again, had another rip back up, chopped around and then retested the low a, a couple of weeks later. So I think that is the kind of environment we're in. Our plan, guys, as you know, for this year, we expect a tumultuous year. And our game plan was to not sell into extreme whooshes. I would say that we're in an extreme whoosh. I would rather, if you're looking to cut back exposure because the money availability and the outlook isn't so great, Brian, I loved your five points. Um, I would rather do it on a ramp, you know, some kind of oversold bounce than into an extreme whoosh. Um, I did not love his six point. <laughs> Thanks, that, Tony. You're the best. Which is love that you in on. the end, we're all dead. I did not appreciate that no, point. I didn't, I didn't like that true, one. Well, the, true though it accurate. may be. Um, but well, to, Tony, so here's a great line that yeah. I used to, that I use all the time in debates when, when you know, people forget that I could be cautious too. I have been for the better part of the last year. But anyway, I used to do presentations and I would say that the sun is statistically going to blow up, but it's a bad trade, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's so Brian's Tony gets point. it. He gets it. Thank you, Tony. Thank you so, so much. So, okay. So on balance, though, when you hear all of the cautious um, stuff that, that Saz was talking about, I mean, 
How are you feeling, Tony, for lack of a better question? Like, how are you feeling? How are clients feeling? What does this period feel like as somebody who has been through this stuff before? It, it, it never feels good. So I've, I've changed my market opinion about 50 times in the last 10 minutes. So I never <laughs> go by feeling. I think what dif di hopefully differentiates me and our firm is we go by the data. And you look for the data. I've been doing this, as you said, Julie, for a while. It's since 1987. So I've seen May of 87. So I saw the best and then the worst. Um, but what I can say is that I don't remember a major market correction that didn't end with the Fed becoming more dovish or signaling nearing the end of a uh, higher interest rate regime. So we're in a situation where this whole thing, when you put aside all the feelings and all the silly stuff that we talk about, not silly stuff, but the different things we talk about in the academic study, it comes down to money availability. If, you, if you're gonna buy stuff, if you're gonna do stuff, or if you're gonna invest in stuff, you have to have money to do that. To your point or question earlier, Julie, the Fed is raising short-term interest rates. That is not helping variable rate debt. That has guided the long-term interest rates to a, a never-before-seen rate of change spike. That doesn't give you more money, and it doesn't help the housing market. So you, you're not going to get your money out of the housing markets by refinancing because your mortgage is so far below where it is today. You're not going to get your money out of your stock account unless you, you really kind of panic sell and, and, and credit lines based on your stock account are largely shut down because of the declines. And anything you're earning is being offset by inflation. So when you put all the studies aside, it comes down to money availability. Do you have money? And that's what differentiates the bottom versus a bottom. A bottom comes from an extreme oversold condition or an extreme whoosh technical term, as, as we said before. But the bottom, the real, uh, the, the real, even if it's higher, a higher price, you want to know that the Fed is not against you anymore. Coursera is out with its 2022 Global Skills Report, revealing a decline in U.S. proficiency in technology and data science skills, trailing countries in Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. For more on this shifting landscape in skills and learning is Coursera CEO Jeff Magin called it. Jeff, great to have you here with us today. So help us dive into the data here, because over the last year and change, people have been trying to upskill where they've either been displaced from the workforce or have just been looking for a new opportunity to step into. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of what the report really shows is not the skill of everybody in a country. We have over 100 million learners on Coursera all around the world. It's really the skill of people in that country taking courses on Coursera. So a lot of what it reflects 
is just, as you said, a huge migration of people online looking to learn new skills to get new jobs. And so some of the movement is actually due to new populations of people who are saying, you know what, I can do better than my current job. I can go learn skills and earn a credential, maybe get a hiring better, a better paying job uh, with more flexibility. So it's less about, Jeff, lack of proficiency in certain areas than it is sort of a, a reflection of the geographic and professional migrations that we have seen, right? So what on that front then was sort of most surprising to you or revealing to you about what this showed? Well, there was, you know, there was a, so overall as a country, U.S. ranks about the same as we ranked last year. Across about 100 countries, we ranked 29th on average in business technology and data science. One of the things I thought was pretty interesting is uh, Idaho jumped way up in, in their proficiency in mobile development. I think, I don't know for sure, but I think it's a lot of people moving from the Bay Area out to Boise uh, with this remote workforce. I mean, I think one of the major trends that we're seeing is the accessibility of job skilling is much higher than it's ever been before because you could do it online. The availability of content to credentials is higher. And increasingly, people can do jobs remotely, especially some of these attractive entry-level digital jobs. So we are see seeing people move. We're also seeing people embrace these new professional certificates, especially women. So we have seen a, a huge increase in the number of women taking not just courses, but entry-level professional certificates and also STEM-related courses. We're now at 50-50 overall uh, in the U.S. in terms of women learners on Coursera compared to men. To what extent can we annex the wage growth that we've seen and in, in, in correlation there to some of the upskilling that's also taken place on, on the employment situation and broader economic front? I, I think a lot of it. I mean, if you think about what happens, right, if you don't have enough supply, prices go you know, rel relative to the demand, prices go up. A lot of folks during the pandemic, I think, realized a couple things. Number one, I like flexibility. Number two, my job is pretty hard. I think there are better jobs out there. And number three, I can get myself skilled up for those jobs. Those jobs pay on average, when I say those jobs, we have about 21 entry-level professional certificates on Coursera right now. They don't require any college degree or any background uh, prior work experience. On average, they pay over $50,000 a year. And so I, I do think that part of the wage growth is competition for labor in, in every position in the US. But frankly, there is a mix where people are moving more into these higher paying entry-level digital jobs, they, they just pay better than, than a barista job or say a bank teller. Hey Jeff, I wanna move to the company for the final question because yeah. um, like so many, and like so many relatively recent entrants in the market in particular, your shares are down pretty sharply here today, I think around 40%. Um, this as you guys are still seeing pretty speedy growth here. So, I mean, what do the next six months look like for you as perhaps we might see a slowing job market, for example? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's interesting. In, in, in our, our revenue growth in 2019 was 30%, in 2020 was 59%, in 2021 we did 41%, all organic. And so our growth has been great. I mean, obviously the, mar the market has a lot of concerns right now about any high growing company, uh, pretty much seems like every company these days. Uh, we, you know, what might that mean for the future of Coursera? You know, our view is, and this is pretty obvious, the world is changing at such a rate. Jobs are going away because they're getting automated and jobs are being created, but people need new skills to get those jobs. We've also seen historically, education is counter cyclical. It is highly likely that people say, yeah, the, the job market is actually getting a little bit tougher out there. I need to skill up, maybe get a college degree, maybe get a professional certificate, some other credential to stay competitive in the labor force. Generally speaking, you know, tough economies often are good for education providers. Well, we'll check in and see how that uh, shakes out over the next uh, course of the year. Coursera CEO Jeff Magin called. Uh, good to catch up with you.
Let's get a little bit more commentary on this with Payne Capital Management President and Payne Points of Wealth podcast host, Ryan Payne. You've been uh, hanging out in the wings, just, I feel like, waiting just to jump in. Stopping the bit over here. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, you're you're in with us in studio. Give us your thoughts about what's been going on. I mean, this this is pretty substantial, the Fed making this very quick pivot two days before the meeting begins. It is, and I think what you said is optionality. And the Fed's been good at signaling ahead of time so the markets don't get spooked. And look, we've already seen a huge move in the Treasury market the last couple of days. So I think the market's already ahead of this, and that's what you want, right? You don't want the Fed to come out with a surprise decision about interest rates, and all of a sudden the markets go the wrong way. So I think a lot of that damage is already done. Uh, hence Monday, we saw you know, a cruel sell-off, and I, I estimated it. You know, the Dow is at like 30,000. You only take about 32 days for it to go zero at the pace of yesterday. Then we can own all the assets. Uh, every, you know, Don't do this to us, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> and then you own all the physical assets for nothing, right? You could own the planes for Apple, Microsoft. We can just d- divide it all up. But, you know, I don't think the market's going to zero, but I do think that a lot of this repricing uh, is happening very dramatically in real time. So what's likely to happen then? If we do, in fact, hear from the Fed yesterday, uh, tomorrow, coming back and saying they are going for that 75 basis point hike, what's the reaction? I mean, we've seen the sell-off over the last two days. S&P 500 now in bear market territory. Do we see a rally on the back of a little more clarity and some relief that the Fed's going to move more aggressively? Yeah, I think that's possible here, right? Because I think the dire situation is already being priced in, right? We've seen equities this year go down dramatically, especially anything that's tech-related. Uh, Bitcoin right now, oh, yes. which I, you know, I did call a bubble on your show many months ago, but I you do did. digress. And on my podcast, I talk about that as well. But bottom line is you're getting a lot of deleveraging right now in the system. You know, the markets are doing all the heavy lifting for the Fed. And in my mind is, look, you've got this economy that's red hot, right? I mean, look, you have unemployment's come down to a 50-year low. Uh, GDP growth over the last five quarters has been over 4%. It's like a runaway train. And what's the Fed trying to do? They're trying to put the brakes on, and they're doing that, right? You're starting to see it. Lumber prices have come down. Copper prices have come down. So my, my thoughts are, and going back to optionality, is maybe later this year, if things do slow down, maybe the Fed can be less hawkish. And in my mind, that's pretty bullish, right? Because at some point, you know, they surprise and they don't hike as much as they're hiking right now. That could be very, very good for them. Well, I guess, though, the question is, how does the train stop, though? Does it hit a wall or can it slow down and get that soft landing? What do you, what do you think is the outcome here? I actually think the Fed's doing a great job. I'm probably not in the majority on that opinion, but I think they are slowing things down. It's not coming to a halt, right? But we're already seeing that again in some of the commodity prices. And I do think that they may get that soft landing where things slow enough that they have the optionality later where they don't have to tighten too much and, you know, take the economy off its rails and, you know, probably good chance we'll re- avoid a recession here no matter what they tell you. I mean, I don't think a recession is a foregone conclusion like a lot of the headlines are telling you. Um, let's talk about strategy. You're a big value guy. We were talking yesterday about the, really the broad-based sell-off that we saw. Even the energy names were down. What do you do right now? Do you add to your portfolio? Are you looking, are you finding good buys out there? I mean, what's, what's the He's thing? He's not going into crypto, yeah. it sounds like. So. <laughs> yeah, not going to crypto. You're not going into crypto. You're not going into growth. You're not doing Tesla. Yeah. But what exactly, what's the thinking yeah. right now? I think you buy with impunity here. Look, I mean, as a long-term investor, you, you buy when there's blood in the streets. There's blood in the streets right now. And it's kind of like revenge of the nerds. Now, how horrible was it to go to a party in the last year and be like, ah, oh, I don't own crypto. Everyone's making all this money in crypto. I feel left out. Well, all the crypto bros uh, are losing their shirt. You're getting margin calls, and that's selling off all those names that your grandfather loves or your grandmother loves, right? I mean, all those old school value stocks, which have held up way better here. Uh, if you look at a portfolio of value stocks, it's down less than 10% this year. The only bo- bo- uh, bear market you're seeing right now is in growth, disruptive technology, and Bitcoin. But the reality of it is now you're getting on, if you take tech out of the S&P 500, you're trading at 14 times Ford earnings. That's so cheap. That's been as cheap as it's been in years. So I think you have a gift from the gods here as a long-term investor to buy. Well, but at the same time, though, if you're getting into value, I mean, it's not necessarily uh, good for your portfolio because, as you mentioned, you're just down single digits instead of maybe down deep double digits. I mean, you look at, for example, the banks. I mean, I saw a a note from Wells Fargo. Mortgage banking income could be down 50% from the first quarter. That's one of those value stocks, right? So, I mean, how much of a, how thick of a, of, of a skin do you have to have to get into that right now? I don't think you have that much. I think we've already priced in some sort of recession. If we have one, we don't have one. I think most of the damage is done here. You may get some more selling on the downside, but at this point, you know, how much you're going to get, I think you've probably seen the magnitude's already been done. The damage has been done at this point. You can buy anywhere in here as a long-term investor, unless you need a yield to, to lunch today. And uh, if you're not a trader and you're an investor, like, this is a gift from the gods. You got to take advantage of it to create long-term wealth. And you know, for our clients, 
This is when you buy, you need an inflation hedge. Stocks historically are one of the best inflation hedge you can possibly have. Dividend yields are going up this year. Earnings are going up this year. And we may still have positive GDP growth. I'm still in that camp. And these are all good things. So let's end with three names. Three names that you think investors should be looking at right now. We just talked about the banks. I think the banks probably have been, uh, you know, aggressively sold here. So like JP Morgan's a great place to buy right now. Loan activity should go up this year. You should get a steeper yield curve at some point. I still like energy. I think energy is a longer term play. Valuations are still very attractive there. Um, in addition to that, since we're on Yahoo today, I even like Verizon right now. Um, you know, I think it holds. No cool. longer the parent yeah, company. Yeah, we're not. <laughs> I take that back. Formerly, <laughs> formerly. Formerly, um, but they were great when they owned you. So, yeah, I think any of those old school value names right now are great to have in your portfolio. And again, you know, don't think twice here if you're a long-term investor. Ryan Payne, good to have you in studio. My pleasure. <laughs> Payne Capital Management President. Payne Points of Wealth Podcast. Markets are now overwhelmingly expecting a 75 basis point move or 0.75% from the Federal Reserve at the conclusion of their meeting tomorrow afternoon. That would be the most aggressive rate increase from a single meeting since 1994. Joining us to break it all down is Tom Simons, Jeffrey, uh, money market economist. It's great to have you on the program, Tom. I wanted to ask you, I mean, you were among the first on the street to actually call for the Fed to make a 75 basis point move after that inflation report last week. After that Wall Street Journal report yesterday, just kind of curious to hear your thoughts about how markets digested the conclusion that essentially this is what we're going to get tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, so I think the markets actually are pretty receptive to it. And at this point, uh, given the sort of gravity of the situation with inflation as it is now, even though it's a kind of a surprise uh, relative to what we've heard from the Fed in, in terms of what they said they were going to do, it looks like it's the right move. So I, I think that the, the markets are going to feel more confident about the Fed's credibility in terms of their ability to limit inflation. Uh, and overall, it's going to lead to a better positive outcome for the economy in the long run. Yeah, Tom, let's back up a bit to Friday. To Brian's point, you were the first out of the gate to call for a 75 basis point hike. Um, mm -hmm. You pegged that to the data that we got on Friday, um, CPI, as well as uh, what we got out of University of Michigan. Walk me through that. What fundamentally changed? Sure. So, you know, if it were just the CPI in isolation, I don't think that it would have necessarily been a good idea to sort of throw out all the forward guidance that we got from the Fed about a 50 basis point rate hike. Um, but really, it was the University of Michigan that put it over the top. Uh, that long term inflation expectation survey showed that uh, inflation expectations rose to 3.3% from 3.0. 
that may not sound like it's a huge move in the grand scheme of things, but that index generally doesn't move very much at all. And the Fed's whole inflation targeting framework for policy is based on stable inflation expectations at its foundation. So once that starts to, you know, sort of look a little bit weaker, a little shakier, it really is imperative on the Fed to, to get their hands around inflation as fast as possible and show a stronger resolve towards actually fighting against it. And I think that the best way they could possibly do it at this point is to go with a more aggressive rate hike versus what they said they were going to do only a few weeks ago. So, Tom, I've been refreshing the uh, Fed funds futures to see if 100 basis points pops up in the probability. But look, you have former yeah. New York Fed President Bill Dudley saying this morning there could be an argument for 100 basis points. You have ING saying there's an implied probability that could pop up of 100 basis points. You see that as an option tomorrow? Uh, I think that it's probably unlikely um, just because 100 is, is very aggressive and, uh, you know, you don't want to sort of have the Fed continually trying to one-up expectations on the market because that eventually leads to problems with communications down the road. Um, I think that there is a very, very strong argument for getting the Fed funds rate up to a neutral level as fast as possible. And the Fed has, you know, said this essentially by, by saying they want to get there expeditiously over the last uh, few months. Certainly, 100 basis points would, would help speed up that process, and I think that there is some validity to it. But uh, I also think that the market, ha you know, last Thursday was not pricing in a 75 basis point rate hike for this meeting. So it takes some time for these things to become ingrained in expectations, and I think it's probably better that they just follow through with 75 here tomorrow. Uh, Tom, when we talk about um, getting inflation under control, I mean, there, there are is a long list of things that the Fed cannot control, whether yes. it's Russia, Ukraine, whether it's supply chain issues, another potential lockdown in China related to COVID. To what extent or how effective can a 75 basis point hike be? I think that it's going to be most effective in its translation to inflation expectations rather than realized inflation in the short term. As you mentioned, there's a number of different bottlenecks that are affecting the economy, mostly on the goods side, but also on the services side as well. You know, generally it, it isn't so much like shipping delays and, and product shortages, it's labor market shortages that affect the service side. That isn't really going to be resolved by one 75 basis point hike or even a series of hikes here in the next uh, few months. Uh, however, uh, again, you know, the, it's really on the expectation side when we think about how the Fed is gonna be fighting inflation for the next several years, if they start to see inflation expectations run away from them, you know, that's a process that could take decades for them to get their hands back around. It really was, you know, basically Paul Volcker in the, in the 1980s with very aggressive rate hikes that established that Fed credibility to fight inflation. It held very, very strongly all through the 80s and 90s and then 2000s up until now. And it's only now that it's being called into question. So uh, in the future, it's going to be very, very important that that is maintained for sure. And lastly here, what would you ask Jay Powell in tomorrow's press conference? What do you want to know? You know, that's a, that's a great question. Um, why did you take a second term? <laughs> I suppose, uh, I, are you regretting it? No, I, I think, um, you know, I, I don't really have a whole lot of questions for him, to be honest. You know, I, I think that he has the resolve uh, to go against the market expectations that were in place only very recently. And I think he knows what his job is. And I think that he knows that it's absolutely imperative that they don't lose control of inflation expectations. So I would just ask him, do you agree with that, I suppose? Well, Tom, you have set Brian up for his question at the press conference. Yeah, about his second term, term definitely. Yeah, yeah. Why did you take a second term? Yeah, don't do term? that one. No, don't do that one. <laughs> Tom, it's good to have you on today. Tom Simons, Jeffrey's Money Market Economist. Appreciate the time.
We want to bring in Brian Belsky. He's VMO Capital Markets Chief Investment Strategist. Brian, it's great to have you back here. It's good to see you, of course, coming on a day when you, I know you're still bullish. You have a year-end S&P <laughs> price target of 4,800. Here we are today in bear market territory, just above 3,700. Help us make sense of the action that we've seen and why you're still bullish at this point. Well, Shana, great to see you. It's always wonderful to be on Yahoo. I have no idea why you're talking to me because I'm wrong. Uh, <laughs> but uh, listen, with much humility, uh, we've been wrong, but I don't think we're wrong on the overall trend, Shana. I think we're just probably wrong on the timing. We're not market timers, we're investors. And we have a long-term process that says we still think that U.S. equities uh, are the best asset in the world. I just think that there's been such a confluence of events with respect to what we're trying to deal with, with whether or not we're still trying to measure if inflation is an exogenous event or if it's going to linger. The market is acting like it's going to linger a little bit longer. And then we had the Fed indecision. And remember, uh, a couple of years ago, the Fed came in to save the day and no one was complaining. And now, obviously, we're complaining because the Fed has clearly kind of misjudged this in terms of how long inflation is going to linger. So I just think that at the end of the day, this really goes back to bonds. And we've had a 40-year bull market in bonds uh, that nobody seems to want to talk about in terms of the unwinding of the bond market. Uh, and nobody really wants to admit that, uh, that the effect of that actually could be positive on equity. So again, at the end of the day, uh, we think that inflation, there's a very good chance that inflation is going to roll off faster than everybody thinks. Everybody is already positioned for a long, drawn-on affair with inflation. The rate of change, according to the PPI, was already starting to change. We had a bad CPI print, obviously. But as was said in the beginning of this hit, you have consumer sentiment down. The markets had has officially entered bear market territory uh, from the rec from in terms of the academic books. The market was already trading like we were in a bear market. Now we got to kind of find a re-rate on what we're going to pay for earnings, what kind of assets we're going to be in. And we think, we know, I'm sorry, that the majority of investors that we talk to around the world are not positioned, Shana, I repeat, not positioned for upside, they're positioned for downside. So if we get any kind of surprise, we're going to have a squeeze upon squeeze. And I really think the market's going to surprise people to the upside the second half of the year. Brian, what are you seeing that tells you inflation will soon go down there. Some that feel we may go to 9%. And what would surprise the markets tomorrow? Well, I think it's already baked into the market, Dave, that we're going to see 75 basis points. You know, the Fed uh, kind of did a good job, I think, kind of whispering that to more than one outlet. So it's probably going to see 75 basis points. I think this all comes down to over the next few months that we start to see a potential surprise in either CPI or PPI, a sub 7% number, I think, would really surprise people. There is already evidence though, we saw again, the rate of change begin to slow on a month over month basis in PPI yesterday, number one. Number two, we have some barges coming into uh, the ports that at the ports now, we have people that can actually unload the barges, which is much different from a supply chain level. Obviously the big side of things uh, is gonna be um, the commodity of oil. Uh, at some point, we're going to have a break in the oil price. And so I think we're already convinced that we're going to be in this high inflation in environment forever. Uh, and I just don't think that's going to be the case. And since you are still bullish for now, what are some of the key indicators that you're keeping an eye on, which are helping you really gauge how to position your portfolio and when to rotate it? It's a great question, Rochelle. I would say that earnings are going to be the key. And we still feel very co confident that that earnings are going to be a lot stronger than most people think. The revision side of things have already hit current year revisions, but not really next year revisions. And numbers, uh, even for what we saw in the latest quarterly numbers, were better than expected again. And if you take a look at the operating performance of companies, meaning return on assets, return on equity, balance sheets, cash flow, it's still very, very strong. So I think we've kind of entered in really for for, for the better part of a decade that's under promise and over deliver where companies have been actually more conservative in their outlooks. So I think earnings are gonna be the key from an indicator perspective too. We need to see the employment situation uh, in terms of participation rate uh, increase. Uh, but I do think that, that the Fed is kind of, um, they're trying to, to, to lace this perfectly, like thread the needle. And I think it's gonna be increasingly difficult. So that's why tomorrow's messaging, because people care more about the messaging actually 
than the actual event. So we could be heading into a situation where you sell the rumor and potentially buy the news once we as the investor base feel better about what's going to happen going forward based on the Fed's comments following the news tomorrow. So, Brian, if we do see a pop tomorrow, if we do see the markets regain some of that momentum that we saw back in 2020 and in 2021, you said that investors aren't positioned for the upside. So that leads me to ask you, how should they then be positioned in order to capitalize on those gains? Well, we really think you should become less cyclical uh, and more kind of value and GARP oriented, meaning uh, growth at a reasonable price. You know, the market's done a wonderful job um, discriminating against those areas that were either too frothy, too expensive, or had no business trading where they were. So I think you want to go back in and look at those names that are offering growth at a reasonable price with more of a value bet. There are many of these names are in financials, healthcare, even some parts of technology. There are some of these stocks were mentioned prior to my speaking, uh, but also communication services. I think on, on the on the growth side, the Netflixes and Googles of the world, I think are a wonderful complement to the more yield side, meaning Verizon and AT&T. So you have a classic barbell within communication services. So you talked about you. This is just one of those moments, Brian, where people are they haven't been paying attention. Now, our audience, yes, but the mainstream audience is opening up the New York Times. It's above the fold. They're opening up the Drudge Report and it's the first thing glaring at them if they are set to retire in the next couple of years versus those that are in it for 10 or 20 or the long term. What's your advice to them at this moment? I would say speak to your relationship manager and talk about equity income, Dave. I think. Uh, Equity income growth, dividend growth <clears throat> has been one of our primary themes for 10 years, maybe 15 as a strategist. And dividend growth and value portfolios are actually outperforming the market this year. But I still think that there's a great opportunity to find an income stream of 3 to 4%. There's several equity dividends. We happen to run one uh, here at BMO that are throwing out 3 plus percent um, income. So I think that can take place of some of investors that are still, frankly, uh, still overweight bonds, Dave. And I think that's where the real risk is. And again, we talk about how crazy the, the stock market is, but the bond market, there needs to be some accountability uh, from the bond market because that's where all the momentum has been for the last 40 years. So this unwind is going to be, I think, actually be a plus for equities, but you have to be positioned accordingly. And I do want to ask you, obviously, the last three bear markets that we had, 2000, 2007, 2020, how should investors view this current phase we're in versus those phases? Well, the bear market of 2020 was your black swan, Rochelle. I mean, uh, in, in the 20, in the 2007, 2008 was the 3C bear, bear, uh, bear market where you had a consumer CapEx and a credit. Um, we had a credit recession, but <clears throat> really in 2000 was led by technology. We flooded the system with too much capacity. So three different types of bear markets. Obviously, you have a 34 day, 34 uh, percent bear market in, in 2020. Again, exogenous event of the black swan called the pandemic. So every bear market is different. You can't go back and look at through the academic books and, and try to play the same scorecard. I think many people are doing that. And I think it's a big mistake. And so I do think that's why you have to kind of imply, apply, employ, I'm sorry, more of a growth at a reasonable price value discipline, where you're looking at companies that have great management, great product, great service, discernible earnings at a reasonable price. Brian Belsky, always great to have you. Thanks so much for hopping on and joining us. BMO, Capital Markets Chief Investment Strategist.
Fed funds futures have shifted dramatically over a 24-hour period now in favor of a 75-point hike at Wednesday's Fed meeting. Let's discuss that possibility with Mona Mahajan, Edward Jones, senior investment strategist. Mona, let's start with that 75-point hike. Is that what you think we'll see tomorrow? Yeah, we think the Fed has in essentially endorsed a 75 basis point rate hike by communicating this through various outlets. Um, interesting, we have seen Jerome Powell in the past shift his narrative if he has seen, if, if the Fed team has seen uh, inflation data spike higher, and we certainly saw that concern on Friday. So I think given that data point that came through, um, they are adjusting their expectations now, 75 basis points uh, for June. Interestingly, the markets have now endorsed 75 basis points for July as well, and, and an additional 250 basis point rate hikes um, over the next two meetings as well. So certainly a meaningful shift in the last few days alone. And Mona, Rochelle here, I want to talk about Fed credibility. Obviously, you have the Fed potentially looking risk, like it's risking looking to panic with a 75 basis point hike, potentially spooking the markets. But then, of course, we saw what happened when they were too slow to react. And if potentially if they do stay the course with a 50 basis point hike, how complex is this picture for the Fed right now? Yeah, you know, the Fed is in a really tough spot. You know, keep in mind what we saw on Friday with inflation, uh, the part that really moved higher and, and well above expectations was that headline inflation. And what drove headline inflation, of course, was food and energy prices. Um, and when you think about global commodity prices and global commodity prices have been moving higher, um, one, they're much harder to handicap, you know, driven by things like the geopolitical crisis in Ukraine, um, the reopening demand coming from China, broader you know, oil energy supply demand dynamics, uh, things that are not only harder to handicap, but really harder for the Fed or central banks globally uh, to impact. A Fed rate hiking cycle can't necessarily bring down global commodity prices. Where we did see a little bit of optimism, a sliver of hope was in that core side of inflation, um, started to tick downwards from 6.2%, 6% this month. Uh, we think over time, this is where the Fed will have an impact. Keep in mind that their preferred measure is core PCE, partly because they, they know they can uh, impact that measure more than, than headline. Uh, but things like cooling housing market, uh, things like perhaps a cooling labor market, we're starting to hear more about layoffs, particularly in the tech sector, both of those trends will, we think, over time, um, bring core inflation down to a more moderating level. And that's really what the Fed wants to see. So we are hopeful that they, they will do 75 basis points tomorrow, um, but they continue to remain more deliberate uh, and, and really more kind of, um, you know, at, at increments that they are communicating uh, and not this sort of shock and awe campaign for markets. So that's, uh, you know, hopefully what they'll communicate tomorrow as well. Well, as investors prepare for this 75, possible 75 basis point hike, you can see the Dow lower once again today off another percentage point as well as the S&P, which entered bear market territory yesterday. Do you think that 75 basis point hike, is that largely baked into the market at this point or could we see more selling on that news tomorrow? Yeah, you know, I think uh, the markets have for now priced in a 75 basis point rate hike. And in fact, if the Fed pushes back on an additional 75 basis point rate hike, we could see actually markets breathe a bit of, of sigh of relief here. Uh, keep in mind, we're already down over 21% now on the S&P, over 31% on the NASDAQ. Um, so in, in that backdrop, you know, markets are really pricing in a mild recession already. And, and in our view, you know, if we do head towards, we, we already think we're a later cycle in this economy. Um, if we do head towards a downturn, we don't yet see the scope for it to be a severe prolonged downturn, similar to what we saw in, in 07 or even uh, 2001. And so uh, in our view, markets are already discounting a large part uh, of what may, um, you know, play out over the next, call it 12 to 16, 18 months. Um, however, you know, could there be downside from here? Yes, we have seen in the past recessions on average down 30 uh, percent. But an average recession, uh, the downside upside is certainly looking more interesting at these levels. And Mona, how likely do you think that recession is? Is it next year? And what about the language coming from Powell tomorrow? Brian Belsky just talked about he really wants to hear the, the narrative that he tells. And last time Powell talked about a soft-ish landing. He was very clear to couch that, uh, yeah. not, not saying it was an entirely a soft landing. 
Yeah, you know, look, markets are savvy. Um, historically, the Fed hasn't had a great track record of the 14 tightening cycles. 11 have ended uh, in what we'd call hard landing or somewhat recessionary environment. Um, and now the Fed is on this path that really is unprecedented. So 75 basis point rate hikes followed by 50 basis point rate hikes, um, really p potentially bringing the terminal rate close to three and a half to 4%. Um, so we are in an environment where the Fed is pushing the consumer uh, in, in a more downward path, and, and the path of consumption will be lower over time, and we are in a moderating growth environment. Now, is recession inevitable? We don't think so, at least this year. Uh, if we are to see a downturn, we do think it happens in 2023 timeframe. There's always a lag impact um, by you know Fed rate hikes or, or driven by Fed rate hikes. Uh, we think Jerome Powell's narrative tomorrow will be critical. We'll also be getting a new set of economic and inflation projections, which will be interesting as well. Um, keep in mind, as we said, core PCE could continue to moderate through year end. Uh, we don't think this market can mount a sustainable rally until we get signals that inflation is in fact moderating in what Jerome Powell has said in a clear and convincing manner. And I think uh, that's really what the Fed and the market needs to see before they can say in a more substantial way, we can you know, perhaps go back to 25 basis point rate hikes, which at that point, I think that's the Fed put that the market will look for. And in terms of the shape of the recovery, whether it's V-shaped or U-shaped, what are your projections there and how should people be positioning themselves with that in mind? Yeah, it's a great question because uh, markets and investors have been used to, in more recent history, this V-shaped recovery, where if you look at 2020, where we had a you know bear market, in 2018, we had a bear market, uh, both recovered within three months. Why was that? Well, it was because the Fed was able to step in. Um, employ that or deploy that Fed put, uh, really start lowering rates or communicating about lowering rates. Um, that will not likely happen this time. The Fed's foot is on the accelerator. They need to push forward to you know, engage in this inflation battle. Uh, but we think a U-shaped recovery, you know, longer uh, perhaps to recover some of these losses, is possible here uh, if we start to see inflation moderate, which is our base case by year end, particularly core inflation uh, moderating by year end, um, the Fed does have an opportunity then to communicate a more gradual path. And that really will be what drives markets uh, then to, to engage in this U-shaped rebound. And we think um, you know, from a 20% down, uh, currently you know, the, the downside upside, as we noted earlier, could be 10% down, but in a, a non-recessionary correction, you could get 20% rebounds off the bottoms as well. And so uh, certainly more interesting here, but it will take some time and it will certainly take um, an improvement in the data for that to happen. In this episode of Influencers, data scientist and Facebook whistleblower, Francis Haugen. I think unless Facebook changes, a lot of people are going to die. And, and the reality is a lot of people do get wiped out by the stock slide. You know, Facebook has a series of whistleblowers. Like, I am not the only whistleblower. There's like a new one every two weeks. When Facebook misleads people about the, the value of the company, and when you lie about material issues, you are lying about the value of the company. Hello everyone and welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer and welcome to our guest Francis Haugen, former product manager at Facebook Meta, who recently blew the whistle about company's practices by leaking thousands of internal documents. Francis, great to see you. Thank you for inviting me. So first of all, why did you do it and yeah. what is your life like now? <laughs> um, I came forward because I saw that the information that Facebook was withholding from the public was critical to the public public safety that people needed to know in order to make responsible choices and that Facebook was uh, consistently resolving trade-offs in a way that was in their own interests and not in the interest of public safety. They were putting profits over people. More so than say any other company hmm. like an oil company or a retailer? I, I think an oil company is a great company to contrast Facebook with, which is oil companies are radically more transparent because we can literally go and put sensors around an oil field. We can measure the pollution. They use satellites to see, are they capping the methane leaks? There are all these things where we can be accountable or that company knows it is accountable in some way. 
Facebook knows that no matter what activists bring forward, they can uh, just deny that it exists. And one of the things that happened over and over again after I came out was activists would reach out to me and say, I brought this up five years ago. You know, I've been giving them evidence of human trafficking on the platform for, for years, and they always tell me this is, this is just anecdotal. It's not a real trend. It's not actually a big problem. Um, but the documents showed they knew it was a big problem. Was that what the difference was because people have been complaining and pointing fingers yeah. at this company for a long time, but it was the actual physical proof exactly. of those documents, right? Exactly. That's what changed. We now have evidence that these things that have been raised for years, like people have been laying the groundwork, activists have been doing tons of work, and now we have the proof that Facebook knew and didn't resolve these problems. And what about this point of your life and how mm. that's changed? I was in Portugal yeah. Yeah. Um, at the Web Summit, and there were thousands of people yeah. there hanging on your every word. Um, uh, I have to say, like, uh, so my life in general has not changed that much. So uh, one of the few blessings of COVID is like, we didn't go out and socialize a lot before. And after I came out, we didn't go out and socialize again. Like uh, I, have, um, I have celiacs, so we eat most of our meals at home. Mm. Um, and so the day-to-day -day life has not really changed, but things like Web Summit, um, I really don't like being the center of attention. Like it, I, it gives me um, a, a huge amount of anxiety. And I remember going into Web Summit and thinking to myself, I am so grateful that I am not someone who like gets buzzed off of being the center of attention. Because I could totally imagine that experience being addictive. And instead, it was just terrifying. Because like, uh, there's like 12,000 people there. It's a lot of people. What about Washington, yeah. D.C., Francis? Mm -hmm. This is a big question. Sure. And you've got both sides of the aisle that yeah. are concerned mm -hmm. about big tech. Yep and Facebook in particular, no. and yet they disagree about what the problem is, hmm. never mind what the solution is. Yeah. One of the things I've been trying to do is kind of shift the conversation because Facebook knows that as long as we think the, the, the argument is about censorship, you know, is, is it too much censorship, is it not enough censorship, as long as we focus on that as the conflict, we will never resolve it. But what Facebook knows is that there's lots of solutions that don't involve content Right? They involve the dynamics of the algorithm. They involve product choices. Like, should you have a multi-picker that lets you spam out to 10 groups at the same time, the same piece of content? Facebook knows they have all these solutions that aren't about content. And as long as we're arguing about censorship, we're not going to hold them accountable on these other things. And so the main thing that I think there's a point of common ground is, um, you know, people on the left, on the right, believe that people have the right to make informed choices. Right, they, that, that you only really can consent or like uh, voluntarily choose to do something if you have enough information to make that choice. And so I've been pushing for what I call like nutrition labels. Hmm. So like, you know, the government doesn't tell us what to put in our mouths, but it does say, hey, if you claim this is in your food, it needs to be in your food. And you need to list how much trans fats is in it. And if you'll notice, the government never banned trans fats, but as soon as con consumers had that information, it disappeared from all of our products. We don't have a nutritional label for TikTok. We don't have a nutritional label for Facebook. But the public has a right to have real data, not Facebook art, uh, artistic data, but like real data on how these platforms work so they can make choices. We're calling it Facebook, but yeah. the company's renamed oh, yeah. itself Meta. Meta. So yeah. should we be calling it Meta or Facebook, yeah. Francis? Um, I am trying to train myself to say Meta because I know a big part about why they made this shift is they want to run away from the conflict. And the reality is that people are, are, are dying. Children are dying, right? Uh, there are gonna be women walking around this country with brittle bones in 60 years because Facebook made choices to not stop uh, its algorithms from driving women towards anorexia content, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, this is a crisis and Facebook thinks they can change its name and just focus on video games and that it'll all go away. And so I, 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 that's one of my goals in 2022, is to be able to say Meta and Facebook in the same sentence, because we can't let them run away from the damage that they're doing. How would you say that in the same sentence? Oh, uh, like you could say Meta's Facebook, or I could say Meta Facebook. But we need to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, one of the reasons they did it was they know their employees feel ashamed to admit they work at Facebook. And now they can say they work at Meta. I have a backpack from when I worked there and in tech, um, tech companies love giving you swag. You know, a t-shirt that says Google, a backpack that says, you know, Snapchat. My Facebook backpack had the Facebook logo on the inside. 
Hmm. I never received a single shirt, hoodie, whatever at Facebook that said Facebook. You mean they were concerned even at that point yeah. about their branding and the backlash that it might mm -hmm. produce if you were wearing it in yeah, public? Yeah, exactly. Wow. And I think that's a giant red flag, right? Like, like I, 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 part of my mission and like what motivates me every day is I know that people are suffering inside the company, right? Like, like not um, being willing to admit reality in the present is really hard. That cognitive dissonance is really hard. And I know that Mark Zuckerberg is suffering and that like every time you go into a restaurant and having people give you dirty looks, that has to be hard. And so we need to hold the company accountable and help it grow towards long-term success because the current um, impasse we're in hurts everyone. So what about Mark Zuckerberg, mm -hmm. Francis? Is mm -hmm. he a bad guy? Um, does he have evil intentions? How would you characterize him? So I never am willing to call Mark evil. It's funny, in, um, when I ap appeared um, in front of the UK Parliament, um, there was a, 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 a member of Parliament that was very insistent. They're like, but is this evil? Is this evil? And I, I think it's really important to remember that Facebook is full of very well-intentioned people. And I think it is a problem about incentives. And some of those incentives, um, uh, you know, Facebook has a fiduciary duty to act in the interests of shareholders. And I think it's a lot harder to prove long-term harms than short-term harms. And so Facebook has been stuck in this cycle where when they are faced with these, these conflicts where it's like, you know, you could be 0.1% less profitable or you have 10% less misinformation. Because there is no mandated transparency, mm -hmm. there's, there's, it's very hard to make the business case that you don't choose that 0.1% of profit. So mandating transparency gives another center of mass that gives space for people inside the company to do the right thing.
How close were you to Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg? Did you mm. have any direct contact with them? Nope, as they, as they like to say, I was a low-level employee that I never sat in a C-suite meeting. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a data scientist. You know, I, I worked on uh, civic misinformation and later counter espionage. Um, you, you, you don't become an algorithmic expert if you like being the center of attention. You know, it's an invisible thing behind the scenes. Um, but the reality is in Facebook's own documents, I saw the magnitude of the problem and just surveying operationally and organizationally how Facebook worked. Like I've, I have an MBA from Harvard, right? There's a lot of things where in Silicon Valley, we undervalue the role of leadership and we undervalue the role of organizational health. And I think I had an opportunity to assess like what was the feasibility of change in a way that was different than a lot of people because I had had that opportunity for that education. And I, I, I don't think there is, I don't think there's a path to change inside of Facebook without the help of the public. Right, and I mean, you wouldn't necessarily need to have access yeah. to those people to understand that there were problems there. Yeah. And in yeah. fact, my experience there is when you get close to that, there's an echo chamber. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. and and so I want to ask you. I've spent a bunch of time yeah. in Menlo Park, obviously not mm. as much as you have at that on the campus. What was that? What was it like? Oh. You know, the Facebook campus is so fascinating to me as like an architectural object. So um, most people aren't aware, but Facebook has the largest open floor plan office in the world. It is a quarter of a mile long. It sits 5,000 people. Uh, it, is, it is such an amazing, you know, medieval societies built cathedrals because they were societies that were oriented around God, right? Like you have these, these Gothic arches that lead your eye upwards like to the heavens, right? Um, Facebook's campus is a physical manifestation of their obsession with flatness. Like mm -hmm. the idea that we are all on the same level, that you know, um, their, their, their leadership style is we have metrics and people can do whatever they want to move those metrics. Like we embrace the freedom of like individual employees. But when you don't acknowledge that power differentials exist, you actually reinforce those power dynamics. And I, I think there are things around um, you know, you, a situation where flatness is obsessed over means there's actually not a lot of space for single leaders to come forward to say there is a problem or we need to make a short-term sacrifice for a long-term gain. I think it was Orwell who said yeah. everyone's equal except some are more, more equal, equal than, than others. others. Um, yeah. And then that's not even acknowledged. Yeah. That's a yeah. fascinating, fascinating yeah. point. I want to ask you about this question about yeah. whether Facebook... Actually, can I give you one more little sure, detail? Sure, please. This one. Yeah. To give you a sense of, of how absurd this space is. So Facebook is obsessed with 15 and 30 minute meetings. So like they're very efficient. Everyone's, the, they're obsessed with the word crisp. Like are your documents crisp? Is your explanation crisp? Um, the space is so large that I would regularly walk 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes to go to a 30 minute meeting. And so even that level of absurdity that, that is more important for the building to be flat than to be functional for us to go to our meetings, that I, it, it just kind of shows you the, the blindness of that religion. And you've worked at other yeah. big have, tech companies. Yeah. You've yeah. mentioned Google, for mm -hmm. instance. How is Facebook different from these other oh, companies and is it better yeah. or worse? Yeah. Um, so I, I feel like there was more of an acknowledgement of um, uh, of, of users as equal stakeholders at, at other companies I worked at. So like Google, Google, um, I don't know if people are aware of this, but Google is able to support, you know, thousands of languages, partially because mm. they built tools that allowed individual communities to move Google into their language. They said linguistic diversity matters mm. at that level. And, you know, even back in the mid 2000s, like I worked on internationalization on Google Books and like there was a real authentic commitment to how do we get into the, the most languages and adequately support them. Um, you know, imagine if Facebook took the same attitude on safety, right? If they came in and said, we live in a linguistically diverse world, let's make sure all of the dialects in Ethiopia are covered. You know, there's a hundred, there's a hundred million people in Ethiopia. They're having a civil war right now that is being amplified by Facebook. Um, they have a hundred dialects, six major language families. Imagine if Facebook, instead of being so closed, right? So, so Facebook has full control of the other platform. They're the only ones that can see inside. It's full closed. Imagine if they said, we're going to take a, a, a page from the Google playbook and, uh, and make tools that allow 
Ethiopians to actually make all the sa make sure that all the safety systems work in all their languages. It'd be a very different world. Um, and so there's little details like that where um, I, th I think there's an opportunity to open up Facebook and say, you are, you are the internet in most countries. You know, 80 or 90% of the content in most languages in the world is on Facebook. Um, imagine if they came in and said, we, we actually acknowledge that power that we have and we, inv we invite you to collaborate with us. We'd have a very different conversation right now. Do you think this company, Meta, Facebook, is in decline? I mean, part hmm. of the reason why the stock went down is because they had a decline in DAUs. Deli first time. They've first never, time. They've never had one. So what does that tell you about the future of this company? Yeah. Um, so I've, I've said repeatedly, I view the work that I'm doing as in the best interests of Facebook. Like, it might not feel that way today, but Facebook needs help to make long-term successful choices instead of optimizing so hard on the, on the short term. And like having an environment where people like being on the platform, where, where they feel safe, where they feel like they're getting high quality information, that is a path to long-term success. Until Facebook takes responsibility and is just honest with people, until they change their relationship with the public, I think they're gonna keep seeing users leave. Have you been in contact or have top executives at Facebook been in contact mm, with you or have no. any executives been in contact with you? Uh, uh, I, director level, but not above, not above that. Um, there's a lot of really good people inside of Facebook. And one of the things that I hope comes out of the work I'm doing is that they have more space to be able to act. Rather, you know, the company's already said that they are going to invest some more money. Um, I, I don't think it's enough. Like, did you know that they're doing $75 billion of buybacks? Isn't that crazy? Crazy. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, when they say they're going to invest $5 billion in safety in the next year, it's like, well, yeah, but you lit on fire $75 billion. I mean, like, right. could you have done $10 billion of safety? But, but my actions do open up space inside the company for those good people to be able to make progress. And so that's always my hope. And what about the future of the internet? Mm. Francis, big Ooh, question. I love um, that question. You know, it looks right now, for yeah. instance, simplistically, the United States, yeah. China, Europe. Yeah. Is that going to be the future going hmm. forward that there are at least three sort of geographies and distinct internets increasingly? Yeah. So I, I don't think, um, so I, I, th I think you're totally right that Europe is taking a different regu regulatory perspective. But in terms of networks, I believe if you look at it, I don't think Europe and, and the United States are going to um, isolate. So like when you say China, China does have a closed internet. And the thing that I'm scared about is Russia and China have made indications that they may kind of merge their closed internet. Like they're talking about building their own closed financial system. They're talking about having their own closed internet. And I think once you start separating the internet and separating the financial systems, that's where things start to get dangerous. Because you are, you, once you begin operating so independently, then you have opportunities for conflict. I think there's some really interesting conversations happening right now around the role of decentralization. So you might have heard of DeFi, you might have heard of Web3 or like crypto-based networks. And those are gonna open some really interesting conversations because this is software that doesn't run in the United States or run in Europe or run in Africa. It, it runs everywhere simultaneously. You know, it's applications that instead of running in a data center, they're all running in little kind of pockets everywhere on these decentralized networks. And so I think there's going to be um, unquestionably sometime in the next, you know, five years probably, a social network where no one is responsible for it. And is that so, good or bad? It's a really interesting conversation. It depends how it's designed. There's ways of designing these networks where you do safety not based on content, but you do it based on the dynamics of the network. And if they make those kinds of decisions where they're like, oh, interesting, you know, we're going to cut reshare chains at two. Right, so that means Alice writes something, Bob reshares it, Carol reshares it, and lands in Dan's newsfeed. Imagine if Dan had to copy and paste that content in order to share it. So he can't just hit a button, he has to copy and paste it. That change has the same impact as the whole third-party fact-checking program today.
So it sounds sort of like yeah. a social network kind of based on blockchain in a way. It could be, yeah. Right? I think there's going to be one at some point. I mean, I know you're yeah. a big, if, correct me if I'm wrong, crypto fan. Or... I, I, I do believe in, in, in the power of crypto. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Talk about, I mean, I don't want to go way down that rabbit yeah. hole. We don't have too much sure. time. But tell yeah. us why you're enamored of crypto oh, and blockchain. Uh, um, uh, so I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, um, uh, actually, I, I'm not, I, I always try not to give investment advice because people do no, ask me this to. question. Okay. Um, I do think there are interesting opportunities, though, around, um, you know, we're getting uh, new models of how to run finance systems, so like the DeFi networks. You know, the rules are transparent. We all see exactly how they operate. And I, I think there are interesting conversations around governance that a lot mm -hmm. of these crypto projects are experimenting with new ways of doing corporate governance, right? In terms of who gets to influence what decisions and how. And um, as someone who really values organizational design and organizational health, I'm intrigued to see where they go. Um, but beyond that, I, I don't think I have enough expertise to envision the future. I want to ask you about your background. You sure. said you went to Harvard. I knew you went to mm -hmm. Olin undergraduate, grew up in Iowa City. Mm -hmm. Is there anything about your background, upbringing, Mm -hmm. you think that informed you in terms of the decisions you made to oh, say blow the whistle? And yeah. Um, so I'm extremely grateful. So I attended um, uh, the Franklin W. Olin College of Engineering. It's in the western suburbs of Massachusetts. It's near Wellesley. And um, it's a very small college. You know, it's 75 students a year. But they believe that in order to be an impactful engineer and a responsible engineer, you have to have more context. And so Olin intentionally incorporates more humanities into their curriculum than um, most engineering programs. And they also incorporate um, design and entrepreneurship. And it's based on the idea that engineers that can go found successful companies um, are ones both that understand the dynamics of entrepreneurship, but they also understand people. Because really good leaders are people who understand what drives human beings. And so I think the fact that I had the opportunity to um, go to Olin uh, gave me more context. I think the fact that I did high school debate and I coached high school debate, mm -hmm. you know, like I've, I've had to sit there and, and um, you know, wrestle with 14 year olds on like, how should society be structured? Huh. So like, think of, think of your 14 year old being like, that's not fair. And imagine having to teach them how to unpack that and be like, how do we have a conversation about why is it not fair? Tell me more. Um, I think those things made me care more about democracy and like mm -hmm. what is the role of a technologist in a democracy. And so, I don't know, I, I think all those things influenced me. And final question, Francis, mm -hmm. what's next for you oh, and what do you see you. as your legacy if it's not too totally. early to ask that? <laughs> I love five months into my whistleblow. It's yeah. like, what's your legacy? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, um, I'm spent, my big focus in 2022 is around um, helping to plant a decentralized youth-led movement around social media. Decentralized, I'm sorry? A decentralized youth-led movement mm -hmm. around um, uh, transparency and accountability for technology. Um, and so we are starting a college tour this spring, and the goal is around giving tools to young people, um, like basically educating them and saying, like, here are levers that we believe exist to either put pressure on Facebook or ways that you can build networks of resiliency because young people are dying, right? And until we can get Facebook to do the responsible thing, young people can make a difference by caring for each other. And so um, that's my big focus that I'm working on right now. And uh, that is gonna live under a nonprofit that we're in the process of founding. And the nonprofit is gonna have two main focuses initially. One is planting that movement, which will eventually get spun off. And the second is something called open source integrity. So open source integrity is the idea that we, the public, need tools, assets that allow us to hold Facebook accountable. So that means our, our own data, right? Our own ways of analyzing these things, simulated social networks. Um, because right now, you can't get a master's degree in these safety systems, right? And we, as a, as a civilization, need 10,000 more of these people minted every year. And so I want to figure out the tooling where we can have that be true. Francis Haugen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is great. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.
uh, starting to take hold. I'm not sure where, but if she uh, is watching this and knows where to find him, please do let us know. And then last, she really fought back against a lot of the critics out there. I mean, Kathy Wood rose to fame 20, in 2020, 2021, with strong performance for her ARK Innovation ETF. And with that popularity comes a lot of critics on Twitter and in various media forums. She says, look, these criticisms are good because they suggest a lot of negative news is priced into her stocks. Now, she owns some of the buzziest tech names out there. The Teladoc stock has went right down the drain uh, year to date. Tesla's been under pressure, Zoom under pressure, Roku been under pressure. But Kathy Wood sees this uh, negativity as now being potentially priced into her portfolio. And you see right there on the screen uh, into some of her top holdings. My take uh, is very simple, perhaps uh, unsurprising, giving my tone around this. Really, Kathy, <laughs> really, I, I look, I, I love talking to Kathy Wood. She's been on this many times. I think she's abs- I think she's brilliant. She, of course, knows what she's talking about. But her portfolio has been obliterated this year. And in large part, that is because of, I think, changes to uh, Fed policy, uh, but also more changes for policy that are coming down the line. And you have to at least, I would think, acknowledge that this has happened. You well, can't live in your own world. she's acknowledged it. She's definitely acknowledged it, but she also has a well, three you talked to, to her in April, right? She also has a three to five year time horizon. So mm-hmm. when, yeah, it's anyway, we won't go, we don't need to go full deeply into it. So on a three to five year time horizon, then where does some of that innovation start to net out? Because you still need the capitalization for those companies to make it through this wave as well in order to have a pathway to profitability or just operations. Yep. Well, here, uh, let's use Coinbase, because a Coinbase is a name that she's been buying. This week they laid off, or they announced they're laying off 18% of the workforce. What does that do for the culture inside of Coinbase? And then if that does impact the culture, what does that do to the longer term outlook for a Coinbase, their innovation cycle? Where are they in five years? Unclear, unclear. Lots is unclear right now. But coming up, we're going to speak with TD Securities Priya Mistra on her expectations for that impending Fed decision and the effect on markets. That's next.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brian Saz, alongside Julie Hyman and Brad Smith. We are a few hours away from the Fed's decision on interest rates, and you can really get a sense, I think, of some nervousness in the markets continuing, though at least right now you're seeing the Dow up close to 400 points, the S&P 500 and NASDAQ also in the green. Here are three things you need to know right now. Crypto crash, billions of dollars have been wiped out of the crypto market in recent days, and that pain may persist with Bitcoin tanking uh, below $20,000. At one point, it has since rallied back to above $21,000. We'll dive into digital assets' immediate future with one guest coming up. And is it, is it time to back up the truck on bank stocks? Despite higher treasury yields, bank stocks continue to suck wind on recession fears. One fund manager stops by to give us his hot take. And rollbacks, maybe. President Joe Biden could be nearing a key decision on former President Trump's China tariffs is one way to ease inflation. Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman has a hot take on this one for us coming up. But let's get over to Julie Hyman, who's at the Wi-Fi Interactive. Yes, indeed. Just want to point out some of the moves we're seeing, not just today, but that we've been seeing in the run-up to the Fed here. And even though we've got the Dow bouncing today, of course, uh, stocks bouncing today are in the wake of what we have seen, the downward movement over the past week. So here's the five-day chart of the Dow. And of course, we had the downward movement on Friday because of the CPI. And then again on Monday, we, and when we had the signal in the Wall Street Journal that we were going to see a 75 basis point increase. So again, we've been talking about what is already priced into the market. We don't entirely know because we don't know what uh, Jay Powell is going to say today. But nonetheless, we've already had some decreases, of course, coming into today's session. We've been watching the 10-year yield as well, which had been moving up sharply today, losing nine basis points at 3.39 percent, but still at elevated levels here as people try to price in what the Fed is going to do. And as the Fed acts today, uh, as we talked about earlier, the ECB had an emergency meeting today didn't really change a whole heck of a lot. Um, the, they have signaled that they're going to be raising rates, but are not yet doing so. And we have been seeing some weakness in the euro before a little bit of rebound today. I also wanted to point out what we're seeing in crude oil futures, even as we had the International Energy Agency saying that in 2023, demand is con- going to continue to outpace supply. We have a little bit of weakness in oil prices today, but still $118 a barrel here, guys. So we are still obviously seeing very elevated gasoline prices as a result in the United States. So that's just a little bit of a cross-asset check for you. Bitcoin holding above 21000 for the moment, guys. All right. We're going to continue to keep a close eye on everything markets, especially going into today's FOMC meeting that is set to conclude. Taking a look at the major averages, we're holding on to those gains. And actually, this is significant because we are near some of our intraday highs as of right now. So continuing to preview today's FOMC meeting, let's welcome in Yahoo Finance's Miles Udlin. Miles? Hello. What we're looking for. It's good to see you. <laughs> All right. So 75 basis points yeah. is, is what we're looking for. We've heard from some of our guests calls for a, a 400 basis points. Mm-hmm. Where do you believe that for the Fed that they can get their credibility right? Yeah, I mean, I was talking a lot about this with, with Brian Chung, and I think he and I, um, it's not that we differ, but that I maybe come in a little bit hotter, because I think the Fed is about to make a huge mistake today. And I think the reason is sort of how do you get out of this conundrum now. Like, what's the next move? Okay, so 75, then 75. But what are the, like, how are we going to forward guide to September? What about November? How are we to get the markets to believe that we, as the Fed, will slow down our pace of rate hikes when we decide to do that? And there is another possibility here that with this buzz around 75, they've actually made 50 like a, a more potent rate hike, if that makes sense. So it wasn't just a pro forma 50-50. Now 50 becomes a surprise. And we can see here uh, 95% pricing for 75. So I guess 50 is off the table. But to me, if I'm sitting in that meeting today and I'm a dove on the Fed or just I, I just want to keep with the forward guidance, maybe 50 matters a little bit more given sort of what the last 72 hours have looked like. Why not 100 basis points? And we put that question to Dennis DeButcher. Uh, and he said, be careful what you wish for. What's your take on that? I think the 100 basis point talk, I mean, I think like after Friday's data, it became clear to me that there was going to be a real conversation now around where we needed to go. And that really coalesced over the weekend. And pretty much everyone's gotten in line with that. Like the 100 basis points, especially look at Bill Ackman out last night. Some of that to me rings of like 
all my stocks are down. Can we kick save this? So I'm like looking because, for 3%. Well, because the second part of his thing is we need to do 100 now because we need to get to the terminal rate now so that we can cut later, which is like, I'm long a bunch of stuff that's not going to go up until rates start coming down. So please get to the top of the cycle as fast as possible so that my stocks. Can, and look, that's like most people on Wall Street who are managing money are getting destroyed right now. And they do want the cycle to turn. But Jay Powell just does not care. Like, I think he's looking at what's happening in real estate. Obviously, it's a main transmission mechanism, but they probably look at total crypto market cap going from three trillion to one trillion or under, and they're like, that's great. You know, that's like fake money, fake wealth, paper wealth that is being sucked out of the system, and that has real impacts on real spending in the economy. And I'm, I'm sort of taking a step back and taking like a super long view. This is something I was thinking about yesterday is that even if you look ahead to the recession, Yes, there's going to be damage. There's going to be people who lose their jobs. There's going to be stuff that's cut. There's going to be economic turmoil. These things don't tend to last that long, if I can say that. And it doesn't feel like a coming recession would be as bad as, say, the great financial crisis, right? Like, at least... And I was thinking about covering, also, the financial crisis versus covering what we're going through now. Mm -hmm. And that was like... Every day was an explosion. Mm. Like every day, every day, there was an alarming headline, Stocks and it down was 60 like out of the it was blue. like triage yeah. every single day. This is sort of this slow run of we can all see it coming. And I also was looking at the S and P 500 returns, a little bit inspired by the likes of you and Sam Rowe. And if you look at the long term returns, yeah. of course, like bear markets also don't last that so long. So I, I, I hear <laughs> what you're saying, and I, I like the reason that I tend to push against that kind of worldview of like, we should just get the recession over with or get the bear market over with, is that we can sit here now in June 2022 and say, oh, well, we know this recession probably won't be as bad, or we know it's caused for these reasons. But in downturns, bad things happen that we don't know about. In the same yeah, way, true. in the same way that in, you know, up cycles, I mean, look, 13, 14, 15, well, 14, 15 to oil. Like, let's go 12, 13, 14, looking at the market. Why did stocks go up? earnings started getting better. The economy started repairing itself. Corporate America started first. But that led to all these things we didn't think about. A crypto bubble then emerged and a VC bubble emerges. And now the heat's coming off that stuff. So up and down have their negative externalities, as um, you know, folks would say. But to me, the externalities on the downside are always worse. And are, they are to be avoided. Now, they probably can't be avoided. But um, I don't feel resigned. Like, I don't feel happy about this. No, I don't. I don't and, think you do and, either. And I'm not but. saying that we should rush through. What I'm rather saying is that while Bill Ackman might be feeling a lot of pain in his portfolio, mm -hmm. if I'm not retiring until 10 years from now, like, I don't need to be hiding in a, you know, under my bed somewhere. Like, yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I know what you're saying. I think a lot of this also, and I know we got to move on, but yeah. uh, a lot of this gets to like an idea that, that I've been thinking about a lot, which is that flat for everything, stocks, housing, crypto, commodities, like flat for the next five, seven, 10 years, that probably frustrates the most people. And so I'm kind of getting like, yeah. maybe we just go between 3,000 and 4,000 in the S&P for a really long time. Maybe. 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 Just, it's just Any an story idea. to plug while we have you? Anything on the homepage? Anything? No? No, I mean, we We're got- We're out of time here, yeah, Sal. I know, we got, you know, we'll get into that. All right. Just come to yahoofinance.com. All right, thank you so much, Miles. <laughs> Thanks, Let's continue this conversation now with Priya Mistra, who is TD Securities Managing Director and Global Head of Rate Strategy. Priya, thank you so much for being here. So we just had a discussion about the Fed, what's going to happen now for the next few years. I'm curious your take on rates then, the feed through to rates. Like, are we just going to see a range-bound tenure over the next year, even as the Fed is raising rates because of the outlook for economic growth or lack thereof? I think we're likely to see a cap on the tenure, uh, particularly because real rates, long in real rates have risen. Whether we stay in a range or not is really comes down to can the Fed achieve this softish landing, which I now think increasingly becomes a myth. If they're going to go 75, we're looking for them to hike 75 this meeting, 75 in July, then 50 basis points, taking the terminal rate to 4% along with QT. That's a significant amount of tightening. You know, can the consumer handle it? Can interest sensitive sectors handle it? And so I actually think the tenure reaches a peak in the near term. And then I have a downward trajectory for the tenure. I mean, I think the front end can be more range bound because the market's already pricing in all these hikes. But the long end, as the market starts to get concerned about a hard landing, about rate cuts late 23, the market's already pricing in rate cuts. I think actually the tenure might be the safest place in town, which sounds counterintuitive if the Fed is hiking a lot, but it starts to price in that growth slowdown and the eventual Fed eases. 
Priya, let's say the, the Fed comes out today, raises rates by 75 basis points, which appears now to be the consensus going into the meeting. What are the ripple effects of that move over the next few weeks? So I think the 75 is priced in. Whether you look at rates, I mean, I'm not an equity analyst, but I would think that it's generally priced in. The issue is, I think, forward guidance, as we have been used to now for 15 years from the Fed, and particularly in the last few months, I think what was important was in May, we got the guidance of 250s. I think that's over. Even if Chair Powell tries to give forward guidance, which I think he may not, because if they're trying to be data dependent, it's very hard to give a lot of guidance. But without any forward guidance, the market's going to stay extremely volatile. If we see inflation staying high, and a lot of the inflation, I have to argue, is outside of the Fed's control. Long term, sure, they can impact the economy and that impacts inflation. But food, energy, shelter, these are things that actually the Fed doesn't have a lot of control. What if inflation stays high longer? I think then the market gets nervous that is 75 the new 25? And is the Fed going to get to 5%, 6%? I mean, what's the level at which point um, you know, the Fed stops? That's what the market's going to be concerned about and the ripple effects on growth, on risk assets. So I think beyond the 75, which I think is baked in, it's really economic data and how the Fed responds to it. And do they try and manage the dual mandate or is inflation such a big problem that they're going to let the softish landing goal, I think, uh, go away for now? And, and for one of the Fed's favorite measures to track where the appetite of the consumer is and, and where the strength of the consumer is or lack thereof in, in the personal consumption expenditures as well. In this data, when do you believe that it will further start to show up and, and be even more of a kind of blaring alarm to the Fed within their own policy pathway right now? That's the, the key question, right? At what point is the consumer uh, struggle? I think we've already seen in the first quarter a reduction in goods demand. But that's good. I mean, no pun intended. Uh, goods demand was running much above trend. Um, a lot of that was because of COVID. So some of that decline was expected. I'm sure the Fed is happy with that. It's the service sector. The service demand start to slow. But again, I would say the Fed is trying to raise rates and tighten policy to slow demand. I think what they're trying to do is slow demand to the point where you reach trend and not go below trend. That's a slippery slope. You know, is there enough tightening in conditions? Does the job market shut start to show some signs of cracking and it starts to soften below? We think that's closer to year end, not just yet. But I think the slowing is baked in the cake. We're going to get the slowing. We just don't know if it's slowing enough below trend. And I think that only happens closer to year end because there's still a lot of momentum in the consumer. And as you said, Priya, it's, uh, we're now getting the outlook for rates to be cut, right? And this is a little bit the phon phenomenon that we just heard Miles talking about, this sort of like, hurry up and let's get past this period of recession and of bear market, and let's get to the period where we can um, see, see loosening once again. Do you think that's the right way to think about it? How are you thinking about sort of this period, this cycle? Right. So if you've tracked the last few cycles, I think that's been a good philosophy. I struggle a little bit now with inflation because I think there's persistence to inflation. I mean, unless you think the war gets resolved or China gives up on zero COVID, what worries me is how does the Fed respond? And actually, I'll be watching for the SCP as well as the dot plot. And if Chair Powell can give some sense of this. If growth starts to slow down, I don't want to use the word stagflation, it's misused a lot, but what if growth slows to below trend, so 1% growth, and inflation is still 3 So now they're potentially missing on both sides of the mandate. What do they give more priority to? How do they try and balance their dual mandate that's potentially going to be in conflict? We actually think it is going to be in conflict next year. It would be easy for them to cut if inflation wasn't a problem, but Inflation may stay a problem for much longer. It tends to be a very persistent series, responds only with a big lag to monetary policy. So I don't know if they'll have that flexibility to start to ease or even stop hiking, even if growth slows down, because inflation is just uncomfortably high and expectations are starting to rise on inflation as well. Well, hopefully we get uh, some insights into all this later on when the Fed announces its decision. Priya Misra, T TD Securities Managing Director and Global Head of Rate Strategy. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Okay, before we head to break, let's check out a bullish call on rental car outfit Avis. The team at Jefferies reiterated, reiterated a buy rating on Avis with a $333 price target. Target assumes 97% upside from current levels. Says the folks at Jefferies, margins are structurally higher post-COVID with industry supply demand discipline driving 
pricing sustainably. The free cash flow profile provides balance sheet catalysts with opportunity for more stock buybacks. Coming up, we'll uh, talk about how Caterpillar is moving its headquarters and we'll look at some other top headlines on the other side of the break. Caterpillar is officially moving from Chicago to Texas, the heavy machinery maker crowning its existing Irving, Texas office as the company's new headquarters. Caterpillar says the move is not related to economic or tax incentives. It does continue a string of major companies, including Tesla, Boeing, Oracle, that are all relocating their corporate headquarters, some driven by access to talent pools, connections, others by the favorable tax rates and incentives. Caterpillar's move will begin this year, and the company's relocation only affects, actually, about 230 employees. 17,000 will still work in Illinois. A charitable payout from Berkshire Hathaway, courtesy of Warren Buffett himself, the investing legend, giving away about $4 billion worth of shares to charities under a plan that started more than a decade ago. The biggest chunk of those shares, about $11 million, will go to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Other beneficiaries include charities run by his children, Buffett's that is. Buffett's plan will eventually see him donate all of his shares in Berkshire Hathaway to philanthropic organizations after his death. This was laid out in a 2019 letter to shareholders. And refresh in peace, Internet Explorer. Microsoft's often vilified web browser is now effectively discontinued after the tech giant says it has ceased support for it. The browser was first released in 1999 to compete with contemporaries like Netscape Navigator. Remember that? And it was the centerpiece of antitrust disputes with the Justice Department in 1997. Microsoft has recommended existing users switch to its successor, the Edge browser. Sazi, you big, you big Edge. I think 1999, uh, Julia, was the last time I used Internet Explorer. All right, staying on tech, the market sell-off continues to batter that tech sector, and that is where we find tech editor Dan Halley, who's been covering the space and looking at all the sell-offs in this sector. Dan. That's right. Yeah, we're seeing a lot, uh, obviously, of movement in both uh, the big tech stocks as well as the smaller tech stocks. When you're talking about something 
uh, like an Apple, like an Amazon, uh, like a Microsoft. Uh, those are all being battered, obviously uh, Amazon as well. And there's different reasons for why these companies uh, are taking individual hits uh, outside of just the broader sell-off. Now, uh, Apple has the issue, obviously, with COVID lockdowns in China. That impacts not only production, but also sales, because people just can't get out and buy things uh, when they're locked down. Uh, Alphabet, they're going down because of the market, but also because they can't uh, sell as many ads or they're having more issues uh, selling ads. That's as a result of, well, they'll chalk it up to the China lockdowns as well somehow, but uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, as well as uh, rising interest rates uh, or expected rising interest rates and rising inflation. And then uh, we have Microsoft. They're dealing with similar issues. Obviously, so many businesses went out uh, and went towards the cloud as a result of the uh, lockdowns that we had seen. So there's not as many people that need to get uh, on the cloud at this point. And then Amazon, they just simply have too many employees now and too much space. Uh, they don't need as much after they saw that huge explosion of people needing to start uh, purchasing things online. So in addition to the general market conditions, all of these companies have their own individual problems going on as well. Then we have the smaller stocks, Zoom, DocuSign, Okta, huge pandemic darlings. Uh, obviously, those stocks uh, saw their shares explode during the pandemic, but they have since fallen back to earth as people realized that drinking uh, and talking to your friends on Zoom every night sucks. So uh, we've seen the shares start to fall back there. Uh, obviously, over the uh, year to date, uh, really big losses for them, uh, as well as tech in general. But uh, for those particular ones, they're getting hammered. Okay. And so what was interesting about this too, especially in the cloud landscape that you were talking about a moment ago, it was really strong for a company in Oracle than mm -hmm. what we were hearing just days ago. What's different then if we're looking at these companies and the cloud plays that they've brought on to their own operations and try to make sure that if you're a company like Google or Microsoft, that you do have that differentiating factor between those lines of businesses in gaming and cloud and advertising versus an Oracle that's saying, hey, the demand for us is pretty strong. Yeah, I mean, Microsoft is massive, right? They're the second largest cloud provider uh, in the world, right? It's Amazon, Microsoft, and then everybody else, mm -hmm. right? And we'll just sprinkle in a, a couple of Oracles and Googles and uh, what have you. So uh, I think obviously it's going to be a bigger problem for Microsoft just because uh, of the size uh, of the market that they uh, control mm -hmm. uh, at this point. Uh, you know, they're also dealing with, again, uh, so many people have gone with them uh, that that becomes the issue is interest rates uh, eventually, uh, you know, we probably get the announcement later. Uh, we're going to start to see more companies start to pull back. Uh, we've already seen uh, some of that. Uh, Microsoft announcing that they were going to be doing some hiring freezes, by the way, uh, in their teams and office teams, teams, capital T, team. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're seeing the same thing across the board with a lot of tech companies. Uh, Amazon doing a, a little bit of hiring freeze. Apple, there's reports that some of the geniuses in their stores aren't being backfilled. Uh, nothing so far about the actual uh, campus, the, the, you know, kind of white collar side of things for Apple. But the retail side of things, you know, that's where we're here. Wednesday, June 15th, I'm Shauna Smith, along with Rochelle Okufo and Dave Briggs. Now we are just moments away from the Fed's decision on interest rates. Wall Street widely expecting a 75 basis point hike. Let's take a look at where markets stand ahead of this decision. You can see a very different picture than what we've been looking at for the past several days. The S&P moving to the upside today, up just about 1%. The bounce today coming after its worst five-day route that we have seen for the major average since the start of the pandemic. You see for five days, still off just around 8%. Taking a look at the sector action today ahead of the announcement, consumer discretionary communication services leading the way. The outperformance that we were just looking at in the NASDAQ reflected in the tech sector. You can see the XLK up just around 1.5%. Only three sectors in the red ahead of this announcement, materials, and energy, the worst performers so far today. Rochelle? And I'm going to shift gears and take a look at bonds, something that's usually very closely watched at this time. We saw that the yields came off their peaks in early trading, signaling that the, the Fed's 75 basis point hike is already baked in. Though the 10-year, which is used as a proxy for mortgage rates, hit an 11-year high yesterday. We're currently seeing the 10-year there down about just 0.07%, there at 3.41%. We're looking at taking a look at that inverted yield curve as we see that the five-year is, is giving it about 3.51% there. So keeping an eye on that to see what happens. Okay, take a look now at commodities. 
Rochelle, oil prices under pressure, while gold prices edge higher, expected uh, to retreat with the retreat of the dollar, likely to drop once we hear this decision. Not pictured here, natural gas prices are spiking and across the pond up 40% thus far this week. We'll see what the Fed decision impacts on the commodities market. Again, all three of the major averages holding on to gains ahead of this announcement. Sector-wise, consumer discretionary, real estate communications leading the way. Brian Chung has the Fed decision for us. Brian. Well, Sean, it is official. The Federal Reserve has raised interest rates by three quarters of a percent. That's 0.75% or 75 basis points. The Federal Reserve noting in its statement, which was released just now, quote, overall economic activity appears to have picked up after edging down in the first quarter. They continue to describe job gains as robust in recent months and said the unemployment rate has remained low. Beyond that, not much change in the Fed statement itself. It's interesting to see that the Fed continue to describe inflation the same way it had described it in May, saying that it remains elevated, reflecting supply, demand, and balances related to the pandemic, higher energy prices, and broader price pressures. But all that you need to know is in the Fed's economic projections, which they release on a quarterly basis, the Federal Reserve noting that the reason for why it needed to hike more aggressively in this meeting is because of a higher than expected inflation path for this year. The Fed had in March projected PCE headline inflation at 4.3 percent. They said it's going to clock in at 5.2 percent by the end of 2022. That's a big reason why the Fed needed to go bigger today. They also downgraded their expectations for growth in the United States this year, projecting 1.7 percent GDP growth compared to 2.8 percent, a notable downgrade on that front. For that reason, the Fed expecting to raise rates further. They expect to get the uh, Fed funds rate to somewhere around 3.4 percent by the end of this year, guys. That would imply another roughly 175 basis points throughout the next four meetings remaining this year. The Federal Reserve going big and going more aggressive with that announcement today. We'll see what the Fed chairman has to say at his press conference at about 2.30, guys. Indeed, quite the turnaround from taking 75 basis points off the table to now that it seems like the Fed is off and running. But we do know that this wasn't a unanimous decision. What do we know about the dissent? Actually, Rochelle, it was not a unanimous decision. Interesting to note that there was one policymaker who dissented against this decision. That is Kansas City Fed President Esther George, who interestingly preferred to do a half percentage point rate hike instead of a 75 basis point hike. This might be a surprise to Fed watchers who historically have seen Esther George as someone who's a little bit more of a hawk. Perhaps they expected that there was going to be a dissent. Maybe it'd be 100 basis points. But again, she preferred a half percentage point increase in this meeting. We'll have to see if she has any commentary to add on that front. But outside of that, uh, all the other members of the voting uh, members of part of this committee did agree to that uh, three quarter percent percentage point increase. Okay, Brian Chung, look forward to hearing from you after we hear from Jerome Powell in just a bit. For more on the Fed's decision, let's bring in Jeanette Garrity, Robertson Stevens Wealth Management Chief Economist, and Zach Griffiths, Wells Fargo Senior Macro Strategist. Nice to have you both on, Jeanette. We'll let you hit lead off here in your reaction to 75 basis points. Are you surprised? Uh, no, I think at this point, uh, the 75 is not a surprise. I'm glad you didn't ask me that a week and a half ago. <laughs> so everything changed so much. Um, Little bit surprised at that that the uh, qualitative commentary did not change uh, in certain ways, and a little bit about the economic projections. But I'll I'll let Zach talk about something too. Well, Zach, first, just give us your reaction to what we heard from the Fed, largely expected. But what does this mean for the economic backdrop, market reaction here going forward? I'd say the market reaction so far has been somewhat muted, as I think seventy five basis points was widely expected after that news report earlier this week seemed to indicate that's where the Fed's preference was. And it makes sense when you think about just how hot inflation came in. They said they're going to be data dependent and they have an inflation situation that's not improving. It's only getting worse. So for them to change their view and their action to 75 basis points from 50 basis points is a big move in a short time, but it makes sense to us given the current economic backdrop. And Jeanette, some people were worried that by, by do, reacting this way that the Fed might appear to look panicked rather than sort of trying to stay ahead with the news that we see with, with inflation coming out, disappointing CPI data. What do you think this does for the Fed's credibility by going for this 75 basis point hike? Uh, well, I think, I think what they're attempting is to, um, I don't want to say reestablish credibility. I, I would put it this way. Uh, historically, the Fed likes to be in, in charge of where the credit markets are going and, and be sort of ahead. They haven't been ahead 
They know that that's a problem. So they think this is an attempt to uh, reestablish uh, their lead on where rates are going to head. And, and this, this probably will be effective in doing that. Um, uh, I, I haven't heard any commentary and don't want to look away to see what the dot plot is doing to see how that may have shifted. I suspect that that is showing um, an intention to do a greater level of aggressiveness. And I think the credit markets will pick up on that. Zach, what do you expect to hear from Jerome Powell regarding whether we can get out of this without avoiding recession? At the last meeting, remember, he was very careful to couch it as a softish landing that he was projecting. Yeah, the, the soft landing is certainly the holy grail for a central bank policymaker, but very difficult to achieve. And so what we'll really be focused on is whether or not he thinks 75 basis points is the new standard pace for one more hike, two more hikes, three more hikes. And so that impression of whether or not they've level shifted just higher how much they think they're going to have to go incrementally at each meeting is going to be big as far as how the market reacts. But clearly we see they expect to take the policy rate higher, and that's consistent with an economic backdrop that has inflation running at such a hot level and really not improving at this stage. So we're really going to be focused on what is the pace of these increases. We can see they've taken the dot plot up considerably. I'd say they've taken it up a bit less than we've expected. So the message has been balanced so far. It'll be interesting to see how Chairman Powell leans with his press conference. Jeanette, where do you peg the probability of a recession at this point? <laughs> Um, I call it 50-50. I know there are people that are calling it more. Um, I, I look at, I don't, I don't know in, in, if this is a correct construct in the first place, meaning if you avoid a recession because economic growth is uh, 0.5 versus negative one, uh, it's all going to feel kind of the same. I think the question is what is going to happen to various sectors? We're already seeing the housing market uh, respond very, very quickly to uh, what's happening with rates. Uh, the, it's an eye opener to see the, the national more 30 year mortgage rate get above six uh, in a very short period of time. That will have an impact. Retail sales today kind of shows that consumers are beginning to respond. Um, I want to call everybody's attention to something that Chairman Powell looks at. He has said that he looks a lot at the Atlanta Fed GDP now figure, which is a real time measure of economic activity. They came out this morning as soon as retail sales number came out and they said GDP growth in the second quarter is zero. So it is gonna get real interest. And Zach, to that point then, if, if that's what the Atlanta Fed is predicting for the second quarter of 2022, how should people be positioning themselves when they couple that with now what we've seen from the Fed with this, with this rate hike? <sighs> I think it comes down to a flatter curve and it's already very flat now. We think it'll continue to flatten because the Fed really isn't in a position to respond to slower growth if inflation doesn't come back down. And it's a similar situation when you think about people ask the question all the time, how much pain in the equity markets can the Fed tolerate? At this point, it almost needs pain in the equity markets to accomplish its goal of bringing down inflation. So when I think about a weakening economic growth picture while the near-term outlook for the policy rate is it needs to go higher, that's a flatter curve. And we think the curve can be inverted by as much as 25 basis points by year end. Jeanette, do you expect to hear a new norm when it comes to inflation? We heard a lot about, again, that projected 2% that the, light, the Fed wants to see. But do you expect just a new norm in where we are, closer to three, maybe north, um, I, th I think what we'll hopefully hear is some reality about what the Fed can do with this inflation rate. Uh, I don't know if I want to call this quite the new norm, but, but there's a lot going on here because of the Ukrainian war, for example. And, and you look in, in Europe right now, natural gas prices have spiked because Gazprom has a pipeline issue and so on and so forth. And the Fed can't do anything about this. So whether that establishes a new near-term norm for where inflation can be, uh, I, I guess we can call it that. But I think these are very unusual circumstances. Indeed they are. Jeanette and Zach, thanks so much. Stick around with us. Get your reaction to what the uh, Fed chair has to say in just a bit.
Taking a look here at the market, stock, stocks giving up some of their earlier gains on the heels of this Fed decision. Julie Hyman has a closer look at this for us, Julie. Hi, guys. Well, as, as we always see with these situations, right, it takes a little time for the decision to percolate through the markets, then it's going to take a little time for the commentary to percolate through the markets. And we've already had some percolation in the days running up to this, ever since the Wall Street Journal story earlier in the week that 75 basis points was likelier than not. So some of that already getting priced in. What's new here is the then 175 basis points of additional tightening by the year's end, as Brian Chung was pointing out to, that, uh, out to us. So as we see now, the Dow has turned slightly into the negative, you can expect more gyrations, right? This is not where things stop uh, uh, to, to any extent. The S&P 500 is still positive, but as you can see, took a sharp leg lower after the decision came out. And the Nasdaq, similar situation here, although it is much more strongly in the green, up about nine-tenths of 1%. We got to talk about bonds as well, and a little bit of a delay on the bond yield. So let's take a look at prices. And prices here moving around a little bit, but prices still higher, so that means we still have yields a little bit lower even as the Fed is raising rates. Again, that's because of the pricing in process that we have been seeing already in the days preceding this one. We can look at the dollar as another proxy for what's going on here. And here too, we are seeing a little bit of weakness here in the dollar. And that's as we have traders try to weigh rising rates on the one hand, slowing growth on the other. The dollar has been experiencing, of course, a lot of strength this year, but it looks like slower growth is definitely a concern here if the Fed is not only raising rates by 75 basis points now to try to combat inflation, but is planning on continuing to be aggressive with those rate increases in what is already a slowing growth environment. What does that mean for econ economics? You just heard a 50-50 chance of a recession. Certainly there are others who put those numbers at far higher. And then I do want to check on Bitcoin as well, which we've been watching so closely and which has been seeing a lot of weakness. It is showing even more weakness here. So much for your inflation head, so much for your Bitcoin not being correlated with other risk assets. I don't know, but it's down 9% right now and back below 21,000. And finally, let's get a check on the sectors as well. In the S&P 500, we've got energy as the worst performing group today. We do have energy prices, oil prices pulling back. So that's part of what's going on there. A real estate uh, communication services, consumer discretionary doing the best in today's session. Again, Guys, the story is not over. <laughs> We're going to watch and see all of the movements that now ensue over the, the next, uh, until the end of the session, yeah. and as we hear from the chair. The next couple of hours, and of yeah. course, uh, tomorrow following the opening bell. Julie Hyman, thanks so much for having on here for us. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the Fed's decision today. And for that, we want to bring in former president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, Dennis Lockhart. Dennis, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. So let's just start with the Fed's decision today because you've been in that room before. You've been forced to make those types of tough decisions. What's your reaction to the 75 basis point hike? Well, I think it shows very strong commitment to tame inflation. Uh, earlier this week, if you'd asked me, I would have expected 50 basis points, not 75. I, you know, the Fed tends to operate in a steady, deliberate manner, and they had signaled 50 basis points so strongly that I opted for 50. Clearly, the 75 basis point move uh, shows that they think the situation requires aggressive action and a faster timeline. And uh, uh, I think the, we should all be comfortable with 50. They are prepared to take with 75. They're prepared to take the risk that this surprises markets. And as you pointed out the, a few minutes ago, the, the initial reaction is not dramatic. So I think this uh, is a, probably a very good move on their part. Yeah, appears to have been baked in here to the markets. What do you think really shifted the Fed's thinking? Was it that CPI of 8.6% or was that combined with the consumer sentiment at an all-time low? Certainly the news last week probably weighed heavily on their thinking. The, the, you know, that you had both the consumer sentiment number, which is related to the risk that expectations become unanchored, um, as well as the CPI numbers last week. And, uh, you know, I think they looked at all of that and they said, you know, we just have to be aggressive because the situation is not improving. It's plateaued. It's not accelerating, but it's the inflation rate is not coming down.
Where does the policy go from here? Obviously, you have this 75 basis point hike, but you also have, of course, the tightening of the balance sheets. If you if you could look through your crystal ball, how do you see the Fed proceeding from this point? And what would you do if you were in their shoes? Well, I would, in, I would interpret the 75 basis point move today as continuing to put the balance sheet policy in the background and to keep it on autopilot. They, you know, they did have the option of announcing some kind of a change in the pace of, of, uh, of uh, running down the balance sheet. They didn't do that. And I think that's because they really don't want to uh, change, particularly so early, that policy. So the interest rate, the rate, uh, the policy rate is the main event. It will continue to be. I think it raises the question, do we see 75 in July or even possibly in September? Uh, that remains to be seen. I think the press conference today will give us a better indication of what the thinking of the committee is. And Dennis, what do you think is critical for the Fed, for Jay Powell to convey during that press conference? Because we heard from a number of guests leading up to this decision that the Fed's messaging at this point can be thought of as even more critical. I think he will repeat the, the whatever it takes uh, mantra that he's uh, been, been using and probably, you know, almost pound his fist rhetorically behind that point that the Fed will step up to this challenge. Even as an earlier speaker pointed out, there are multiple causes of this inflation. Some of the root causes are not easily addressable with monetary policy, but uh, I don't think there's any question the Fed is going to step up and um, do everything it can to bring that inflation rate uh, down near 2%. And Dennis, these are unusual times in which friends who usually only ask me about Yankees and Red Sox standings are watching Fed meetings, are worried about hearing this number, first biggest rate hike since 1994, saying, I thought this economy was healthy, that number scares them. What do you say to those people that feel like we are on the edge of a recession or maybe already in it? Uh, well, it's a dramatic time, obviously, yeah. and, and cent central bankers prefer to, <laughs> to, uh, to be boring and in the background, and it's, it's just the opposite. Um, the, the economy is not indicating at the moment that we're on the edge of a recession. I do think we have to define what we're talking about, whether we're talking about a technical recession of two quarters, half a year of, of negative growth, contraction, or we're just talking about a slowdown. I think the committee still believes that with appropriate policy and some good luck, they can uh, still bring us down to a softish landing and not hurt uh, unemployment too badly. But the, the front and center task is to deal with inflation. And I think that they signal today that they're up to that task. And obviously, you mentioned the, the key factors that the, the Fed looks at there when you talk about unemployment, then, of course, inflation. But do you think at a certain point they will start keeping an eye on what they're seeing with the equity markets, even though that's not their priority? They tend to look at the equity markets, uh, even under circumstances we've seen in the last few weeks, as a financial stability question, uh, not necessarily a, a Powell put or a Fed put kind of decision, but more one of whether what's happening in the markets is actually going to undermine the dual mandate objectives of, of price stability and uh, maximum employment. So that's the lens through which they'll look at market performance. And if it is really beginning to undermine what they want to see uh, develop in the real economy, the, the main street economy, then they may act. But otherwise, they will simply watch what's going on in the markets. Dennis, you mentioned before the tools in order to fix this, and it doesn't only lie within the Fed. There's a, certainly a number of factors contributing to inflation, some of that having to do with the supply chain issues that we've seen recently, obviously record high gas prices. What else do you think or what else needs to be done in order to bring back inflation? Well, I, you know, I use the term luck. I think a bit of luck in terms of supply chain issues is, is uh, going to be very important because the supply chain 
uh, restoration or, or improvement seems to have been a much slower process than anyone would have predicted. So uh, that's not easily treated by public policy. It's thousands and thousands of supply chains affecting lots and lots of products. So they need some luck on that front that, that, that uh, those efforts in the private sector are, are, are occurring. At the same time, I think the public policy can do something about the cost of gasoline and the cost of energy. Uh, the administration appears to be doing several things that try to address that. I'll tell you, my concern is that the Fed is taking on most of the responsibility, almost all of the re responsibility for inflation when their tools are designed just to deal with the demand side, not the supply side. And the temptation to use those tools very, very aggressively could put us in a more recessionary environment than might otherwise have naturally happened. I think that's a legitimate concern. Dennis, is there something you'd like to see from the administration or from Congress that could bring down prices? You know, I, I think the key price issues for most households in America are gasoline prices and food prices. I am sure there are some regulatory and other decisions, including foreign policy decisions, that can be made that, that might have some effect in the relative new near term on those two categories of purchases. And the, uh, they should be looking at every one of their options. I don't have any mm. specific okay. recommendation, but uh, you know, clearly they have, they have to look at everything they could do and then decide what they're prepared to do. And with just a few months to the midterms, we know they're keeping a close watch on that. We do thank you for joining us today. Dennis Markhart there, former president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. Thank you. Well, we're going to get you a quick market check to see how markets are reacting to that announcement by Fed Chair Powell of 75 basis points. We see the Dow there up slightly, about half a percent there, 127 points. The S&P 500 there up about 31 points. Just all, well, you know, almost about 1%. And as we see the tech heavy NASDAQ up by the most, 1.74%. They're up 188 points. All right, well, now let's take a look at what the Fed's rate hike is going to mean for mortgages and the housing market. Some, some factors that we've been taking a close look at. We're going to bring in RJ Gallo here, Federated Hermes Senior Portfolio Manager. Thank you for joining us today, RJ. So I first want to get your reaction here. Obviously, we, we have this now on the table. We're still waiting to sort of get the, the details with the press conference from Fed Chair Powell. What should people expect, though, once they hear this headline number out at the moment? Well, I think the important thing is behind us is this debate of 50 versus 75. I think that was a pretty seminal moment when the Federal Reserve used the mainstream business media to essentially plant that they had altered their forward guidance just days ahead of a meeting. So now we know it's 75, we can uh, move on from that. I, I think what's most important is how Chairman Powell supports the summary of economic projections, uh, the dots, so to speak. Uh, that's a powerful tool for the Fed. They can now communicate a projected policy path. It's not a promised path, but a projected one. Uh, it is hawkish. It has the Fed taking the uh, Fed funds rate to 375 in terms of the median dot for year end 2023. Um, some suggest that these numbers might be a little stale because we believe the FOMC members submitted them before the June 10th print of the elevated CPI reading. Uh, nevertheless, it's there's a lot you can read from this in the sense that the Fed is committed to fighting inflation. They are not pulling back their talons. They're as hawkish as they can be. Uh, I think the fact now is that Chair Powell is going to have to back that up by remaining consistent on the podium. I think we're at a point now where inflation is viewed as the problem. Uh, the Fed holds the solution and they have to stick to their guns. If they somehow deviate in a dovish direction, it's not clear that the markets would react warmly to that at all, because that would merely allow inflation to fester and would only be solved with more tightening in the future anyway. So, RJ, what does that mean for Fed policy going forward? <clears throat> Excuse me, we've got the 75 basis point hike today. Expectation here to get to 3.8 percent, I believe, by the end of 2023. What does that look like? Well, the, the good news is, from a bond investor standpoint, we have we have sustained double-digit losses in just about every major bond sector in the marketplace. 
you know, down 10, 11, 12 percent across major treasury, corporate, municipal bond indices, even worse for corporates, like 16 percent down. Why is that? Well, it's because the Fed signaled that multi-decade highs in inflation will only be dealt with by much more hawkish policy. They have to tighten and to do so drastically. The bond market has reacted. Earlier guests have commented on how mortgage rates have reacted. That's because expectations for tightening were so clearly fueled by the Fed's commentary and actions that much of the tightening that you're seeing today, this 75 basis points, and what will come to that 3.75 or 3.8 at the end of 2023, that's reflected in the bond market's current valuations. If going forward, the economy slows down, which clearly it is, doesn't go into a recession, however, and if inflation starts to behave much better than we saw on the most recent CPI print, then the Fed can follow this script. It's not a promise, but it's a script. And they can get close to 4% in the Fed funds rate. The bond market is pretty much priced for something like that. This could be the beginning of a calmer investment environment where bondholders, bond investors don't need, need to be so afraid of taking duration risk. Of course, it's all contingent upon how inflation behaves going forward. I sense some skepticism in your voice. Do you think this will work at bringing down inflation? There are those that think we're headed to 9%. And quickly on, on mortgage demand, now roughly half of what it was a year ago. What's the impact on the housing market? Well, the skepticism you hear in my voice is uh, born <laughs> of the fact that I'm a bond manager and we've lost <laughs> double digits uh, for the first times of my, in my career. Uh, you know, you'd have to go back to 1982, I think, to have bond markets be quite as adversarial as they are right now. Back then, inflation was sky high, and we had a hawkish Fed under Chairman Volcker. Uh, you know, we're reliving a little bit of history here. So my skepticism is born of that experience. Um, I think inflation will start to decelerate. Uh, it's proven very thorny for anybody, whether it's an army of economists uh, on Constitution Avenue at the Federal Reserve's headquarters or whether it's uh, portfolio managers in Pittsburgh like me. It's very thorny to forecast the exact turn in inflation. But with the economy slowing, with retail sales slowing, with many economic data points indicating uh, that, that the economy is decelerating, that only, it's only a matter of time where the inflation does start to cooperate. Now, do we get all the way to 4% on the Fed funds rate? We'll see. There's a long history of the Fed tightening until something breaks. Now, what is that something? How important is that something? Uh, if it becomes a systemic risk event, that could slow the Fed's actions. But as we stand now, we have a healthy financial system, too much inflation, and a hawkish Federal Reserve, and the markets are priced for that hawkishness. The housing market will slow the same way just about every asset out there has reacted to the Fed's shift in policy. Bitcoin, bonds, stocks, you name it. They're all going somewhat down in price because the Fed had to go from a near zero interest rate policy with an expanding balance sheet to a rapidly alternative world where rates are rising and the balance sheet is shrinking. So yeah, housing will suffer. The good news, housing is not propped up by massive speculative finance like it was back in 2006, 7, and 8. So I don't expect a housing slowdown to become a housing crash and a systemic issue, at least not at this point. There's plenty of room there and uh, low inventory as well. RJ Gallo, good stuff. Really appreciate that. We are just a couple of minutes away from the Fed chair ahead of his press conference. Let's bring back Jeanette Garrity, Roberts and Stevens Wealth Management, Chief Economist, and Zach Griffiths, Wells Fargo Senior Macro Strategist. And uh, I want to get your reaction, Zach, to what you just heard from R.J. Gallo. Will something break? Will we get to 4% by the spring? That's really the million-dollar question. And we think that the Fed can continue to raise rates pretty aggressively before something breaks. You have a consumer that still has plenty of excess savings. There's a ton of cash in the financial system as evidenced by the Fed's overnight reverse repo facility hitting new record highs every day. You're seeing SOFR rates come down. So I think there are some factors in not only the economy, but financial markets that will allow the Fed to tighten more than perhaps in other episodes when we didn't have so much fiscal and monetary stimulus leading into a tightening cycle like we had over the past couple of years. And so we do think that rates can go higher, the curve can flatten more before we have something break and the Fed really needs to shift its policy tact. Jeanette, we know messaging is critical here from Fed Chair Jay Powell. What are you hoping or what are you? what will you be listening for? Well, I, I, I want to hear the discussion about the real economy because as, as we've seen in the last half hour, we tend to focus just on 
financial markets, equity markets, bond markets, whatever. I got to tell you, the question about housing is a really interesting one for me. I, I think it's the right question to ask because the single largest asset that most U.S. households have is their home. They're, they, they, everybody loves to play the Carter game of how much is my house worth now, given the house across the street just went for 25 percent more. They're not going to be able to play that game. Uh, it's it's going to get tough to do the purchases, especially if the unemployment rate starts to rise. And there's been several Fed, Fed presidents who have gone out and said, well, you know, we think we could live with a four and a quarter percent unemployment rate. I think they could. But the question is, does it stop there? So housing is a big, very influential sector. Um, I don't think he's going to talk about it, but I think this is going to be the subject at hand in the fall when consumer savings are significantly depleted. And then the question is, now what? Jeanette, apologies for jumping over you here, but Jay Powell's press conference is getting underway. Let's I listen begin in. begin with one overarching message. We at the Fed understand the hardship that high inflation is causing. We're strongly committed to bringing inflation back down, and we're moving expeditiously to do so. We have both the tools we need and the resolve that it will take to restore price stability on behalf of American families and businesses. The economy and the country have been through a lot over the past two and a half years and have proved resilient. It is essential that we bring inflation down if we are to have a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. From the standpoint of our congressional mandate to promote maximum employment and price stability, the current picture is plain to see. The labor market is extremely tight and inflation is much too high. Against this backdrop, today the Federal Open Market Committee raised its policy interest rate by three quarters of a percentage point and anticipates that ongoing increases in that rate will be appropriate. In addition, we are continuing the process of significantly reducing the size of our balance sheet. I'll have more to say about today's monetary policy actions after briefly reviewing economic developments. Overall, economic activity edged down <clears throat> in the first quarter as unusually sharp swings in inventories and net exports more than offset continued strong underlying demand. Recent indicators suggest that real GDP growth has picked up this quarter with consumption spending remaining strong. In contrast, <clears throat> growth in <clears throat> business fixed in in investment appears to be slowing, and activity in the housing sector looks to be softening, in part reflecting higher mortgage rates. The tightening in financial conditions that we've seen in recent months should continue to temper growth and help bring demand into better balance with supply. As shown in our summary of economic projections, FOMC participants have marked down their projections for economic activity with the median projection for real GDP growth running below 2 percent through 2024. The labor market has remained <clears throat> extremely tight with the unemployment rate near a 50-year low, job vacancies at historical highs, and wage growth elevated. Over the past three months, employment rose by an average of 408,000 jobs per month down from the average pace seen earlier in the year, but still robust. Improvements in labor market conditions have been widespread, including for workers at the lower end of the wage distribution, as well as for African Americans and Hispanics. Labor demand is very strong, while labor supply remains subdued, with the labor force participation rate little changed since January. FOMC participants expect supply and demand conditions in the labor market to come into better balance, easing the upward pressures on wages and prices. The median projection in the SEP for the unemployment rate rises somewhat over the next few years, moving from 3.7 percent at the end of this year to 4.1 percent in 2024, levels that are noticeably above the March projections. Inflation remains <clears throat> well above our longer run goal of 2 percent. Over the 12 months ending in April, total PCE prices rose 6.3 percent, excluding the volatile food and energy categories. Core prices rose 4.9 percent. In May, the 12-month change in the consumer price index came in above expectations at 8.6 percent, and the change in the core CPI was 6 percent. Aggregate demand is strong, 
supply constraints have been larger and long lasting than anticipated, and price pressures have spread to a broad range of goods and services. The surge in prices of crude oil and other commodities that resulted from Russia's invasion of Ukraine is boosting prices for gasoline and food and is creating additional upward pressure on inflation. And COVID-related COVID lockdowns in China are likely to exacerbate supply chain disruptions. FOMC participants have revised up their projections for inflation this year, particularly for total PCE inflation, given developments in food and energy prices. The median projection is 5.2% this year and falls to 2.6% next year and 2.2% in 2024. Participants continue to see risks to inflation as weighted to the upside. The Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and, price and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship, especially on those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials, like food, housing, and transportation. We are highly attentive to the risks high inflation poses to both, so both sides of our mandate, and we're strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2% objective. Against the backdrop of the rapidly evolving economic environment, our policy has been adapting, and it will continue to do so. At today's meeting, the committee raised the target range for the federal funds rate by three quarters of a percentage point, resulting in a one and a half percentage point increase in the target range so far this year. The committee reiterated that it anticipates that ongoing increases in the target range will be appropriate. And we are continuing the process of significantly reducing the size of our balance sheet, which plays an important role in firming the stance of monetary policy. Coming out of our last meeting in May, there was a broad sense on the committee that a, a half percentage point increase in the target range should be considered at this meeting if economic and financial conditions evolved in line with expectations. We also stated that we were highly attentive to inflation risks and that we would be nimble in responding to incoming data and the evolving outlook. Since then, inflation has again surprised to the upside. Some indicators of inflation expectations have risen and projections for inflation this year have been revised up notably. In response to these developments, the committee decided that a larger increase in the target range was warranted at today's meeting. <clears throat> this continues our approach of expeditiously moving our policy rate up to more normal levels, and it will help ensure that longer-term inflation expectations remain well anchored at 2 percent. As shown in the SCP, <clears throat> the median projection for the appropriate level of the federal funds rate is 3.4 percent at the end of this year, a, po a percentage point and a half higher than projected in March, and 0.9 percentage point above the median estimate of its longer run value. The median projection rises further to 3.8 percent at the end of next year and declines to 3.4 percent in 2024, still above the median longer run value. Of course, these projections do not represent a committee plan or decision, and no one knows with any certainty where the economy will be a year or more from now. Over coming months, <clears throat> we will be looking for compelling evidence that inflation is moving down, consistent with inflation returning to 2 percent. We anticipate that ongoing rate increases will be appropriate. The pace of those changes will continue to depend on the incoming data and the evolving outlook for the economy. Clearly, today's 75 basis point increase is an unusually large one, and I do not expect moves of this size to be common. From the perspective of today, either a 50 basis point or a 75 basis point increase seems most likely at our next meeting. We will, however, make our decisions meeting by meeting and will continue to, to communicate our thinking as clearly as we can. Our overarching focus is using our tools to bring inflation back down to our 2 percent goal and to keep longer term inflation expectations well anchored. Making appropriate monetary policy in this uncertain environment requires a recognition that the economy often evolves in unexpected ways. Inflation has obviously uh, surprised to the upside over the past year, and further surprises could be in store. We therefore will need to be nimble in responding to incoming data and the evolving outlook. And we will strive to avoid adding uncertainty to what is already an extraordinarily challenging and uncertain time. We are highly attentive to inflation risk, risks and determined to take the measures necessary to restore price stability. 
The American economy is very strong and well positioned to handle tighter monetary policy. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Howard Schneider with Reuters. Um, uh, two related questions, uh, Chair Powell. Did you feel you uh, boxed yourself in with the language you used at the last press conference on uh, 50 basis point hikes in June and July? And would you please give us uh, as detailed a sense as you can of what role you played uh, in reshaping market expectations so quickly on Monday? So um, as you know, we, we uh, always aim to provide as much clarity as we can about our policy intentions subject to the in inherent uncertainty in the economic outlook, because we think monetary policy is more effective when market participants understand how policy will, will evolve, when they understand our, our objective function, our reaction function. Um, and in the current highly unusual circumstances with inflation well above our goal, we think it's helpful, helpful to provide, provide even more clarity than usual, um, again, subject to uncertainty in the outlook. So, um, and I think over the course of over the course of this year, financial uh, markets have responded, uh, and and have generally shown that they understand the path we're we're, uh, we're laying out. It, of course, it remains data dependent, um, and so that's what we generally think about guidance, and that's why we offer it. And of course, when we offered that when I offered that guidance uh, at the last meeting. I did say that it was subject to the economy performing about in line with expectations. I also said that uh, if the economy performed, if data came in worse than expected, then we would consider moving even more aggressively. So uh, we, got the, we got the CPI data and also some data on inflation expectations uh, late last week. And we thought for a while, and we thought, well, this is the appropriate thing to do. So then the question is, what do you do? And do you wait six weeks to do it at the next meeting? And I think the answer is that's not where we are with this. So we decided we needed to go ahead. And so we did. And uh, that's, really the, that's really how we made the decision. Thank you. Thanks for taking our questions. Gina Smilek with the New York Times. You. I guess I wonder if you could describe for us a little bit how you're deciding how aggressive you need to be. So obviously, 75 today. What did 75 achieve that 50 wouldn't have? And why not just go for a full percentage point at some point? Sure. So if you take a step back, what we're looking for is compelling evidence that inflationary pressures are abating and that inflation is moving back down. And we'd like to see that in, uh, in the form of a series of declining uh, monthly inflation readings. That's what we're looking for. And by this point, uh, we had actually been expecting to see clear signs of at least inflation flattening out and ideally beginning to decline. We've said that we'd be data dependent, focused on incoming data, highly attended to inflation risks, the things that I mentioned um, uh, to Howard moments ago. So contrary to expectations, inflation again surprised to the upside. Indicators, some indicators of inflation expectations have risen, uh, and projections of this year have moved up notably. So. We thought that strong action was warranted at this meeting, and today we delivered that in the form of a 75 basis point rate hike, as I mentioned. So what was the, the point of it really is this. Um, we've been moving rates up uh, expeditiously to more normal levels. And over the course of the seven months since we, since we pivoted and began moving in this direction, we've seen uh, financial conditions tighten, and appropriately so. Um, but the federal funds rate, even after this move, is at 1.6 percent. So uh, again, the committee uh, is moving rates up expeditiously to more normal levels. And we came to the view that um, we'd like to do a little more front end loading on that. So I think that the, the SEP gives you the levels that people think are appropriate at, a, at given points in time. This was really about the speed with which you would get there. So as I mentioned, we. we 75 basis points today, I said the next meeting could, could well be about a decision between 50 and 75. That would put us at the end of the July meeting, you know, 
in, in that range, of, in that more normal range, and that's a desirable place to be because you begin to have more optionality there about the speed with which you would proceed going forward. Just, just talking about the SCP for a second, what, what it really says is that committee participants widely would like to see policy at a modestly restricted, restrictive level at the end of this year. And that's six months from now. And you know, so much data and so much can happen. So remember how highly uncertain this is. But so that is generally a range of three to three and a half percent. That's where people are. And that's, that's what they want to see, knowing what they know now and understanding that we need to be, we need to show resolve, but also be flexible to incoming data as we see it. If things are better, we don't need to do that much. So, and if they're not, then we, you know, we either do that much or possibly even more. Uh, but in any case, it will be very data dependent. Then you're looking at next year, and what you're seeing is people see more, a bit more tightening in, in, in a range of maybe 3.5 to 4%. And that's generally what people see as the appropriate path for getting inflation under control and starting back down and then getting back down to 2%. So 75 basis points seem like the right, the right thing to do at this meeting, and, um, and uh, that's what we did. Steve. Steve Leisman, CNBC. Thank you for taking my question, Mr. <clears throat> Chairman. Um, you have not used the phrase in a long time, monetary policy is in a good place, which is a phrase that you used to use often. Um, now that the committee is projecting 4% on a, or 3.8% next year in terms of the funds rate, uh, which is similar to where the market is now, uh, the, the futures market of 4% funds rate next year. Do you think that's a level that is going to be sufficiently high enough to deal with and bring down the inflation problem? And just as a follow-up, could you break that apart for me? How much of that is restrictive and how much of that is a normal positive rate that ought to be embedded or not, in your opinion, in the funds rate? Thank you. Sure, so the, the question really is, how high does the rate really need to go? And this is, you know, the estimates on the committee are, are in that range of three and a half to four percent. And how do you think about that? Well, you can think about the the longer run neutral rate. You can compare it to that, and we think that's in the mid twos. Um, you can look, frankly, at broader financial conditions. You can look at, you know, asset prices. You can look at the effect you're having on the economy, rates, asset prices, credit spreads. All of those things go into that. You can, you can also look at the yield curve and ask all along the yield curve, where is, wh where is the policy rate? So for much of the yield curve now, real rates are positive. That's not true at the short end. At, at the short end of the yield curve in, in the early years, you don't have real, neg you have negative rates still. So that, I, that, but to, that really is one data point. It's one part of financial conditions. So I, th I think you, you, I, I have to look at it this way. We move the policy rate, that affects financial conditions, and that affects the economy. You know, we have, of course, ways, rigorous ways to think about it, but ultimately it comes down to, do we think financial conditions are in a place where they're having the desired effect on the economy? And that desired effect is, we'd like to see, you know, demand moderating. Demand is very hot still in the economy. We'd like to see the labor market getting ba better in balance between supply and demand. And that can happen both from supply and demand. Right now, there's d demand is substantially higher than, than available supply, though. So we feel that there's a role for us in moderating demand. Those are the things we can affect with our, uh, with our policy tools. There are many things we can't affect. Uh, and, and those would be you know, the, things, uh, the, the commodity price issues that we're having around the world due to the war in uh, Ukraine and, um, and the fallout from that, and also just the, all of the supply side things that are still you know, pushing upward on inflation. So that's, that's really how, how I think I would think about it. But, but does 3.8%, 4% get it done? Does it get the job done and break in the back of inflation? I, I think it, it, it's certainly a, 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 in the range of plausible numbers. I think we'll know when we get there, really. I mean, I, I, honestly, though, that, that would be, you would have positive real rates, I think, and inflation coming down by then. I think you'd have positive real rates across the curve. Um, I think that the, you know, the neutral rate is pretty low these days, so uh, I, I would think it would, but you know what? We're going to, we're going to find that out empirically. We're not, we're not going to be completely model-driven about this. We're going we're to be looking at, at, at this, keeping our eyes open and reacting to incoming data, both on financial conditions and on what's happening in the economy. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> 
Thanks. Nick Timoros of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Chair Powell, you've said that you like your policy to work through expectations, and now obviously this decision was something quite different from how you and almost all of your colleagues had set those expectations during the intermeeting period. And I know you just said that what changed was really the inflation data, the inflation expectations data. But I'm wondering on the inflation expectations data, was there something you saw that was unsettling enough to risk eroding the credibility of your verbal guidance by doing something so different from what you had socialized before? So if you look at a, we look at a broad range of inflation expectations. Um, so you've got the public, you've got surveys of the public and of experts, and, and you've also got market-based. And I think if you look across that broad range of data, what you see is that uh, expectations are still in the place, very much in the place, where short-term inflation is going to be high, but comes down sharply over the next couple of years. That's, that's really where inflation expectations are. And also, as you get away from this episode, they get back down close to 2%. And so this is really very important to us that that remain the case. And I think if you look for most measures, most of the time, that's what you see. To even, if we even see a couple of indicators that, that bring that into question, we, we take that very seriously. We do not take this for granted. We take it very seriously. So the preliminary Michigan reading, it's a preliminary reading. It might be revised. Nonetheless, it was quite eye-catching, and, and we noticed that. We also noticed that, that the uh, index of common inflation expectations at the board has moved up after being pretty flat for a long time. So we're watching that, and we're thinking, this is something we need to take seriously. And that is one of the factors, as I, I mentioned, one of the factors in our deciding to move ahead with 75 basis points today was what we saw in, in inflation expectations. We're, we're absolutely determined to keep them anchored at 2%. Uh, that was one of the reasons. The other was just the, the CPI rating. So if you saw a movement like that again, another tick up in inflation expectations, uh, would that put a 75 or even 100 basis point increase in play uh, at your next meeting? You know, we're going to, I'll just say, we're going to react to the incoming data and uh, appropriately, I think. So I, I, I wouldn't want to put a number on what that might be. The main thing is to get, to get rates up, and, and then pretty soon we'll be in an area where, where, where we're, I think, as you get closer to the end of the year, you're in, you're in an, a range where you've got restrictive policy, which is appropriate, 40-year 40, 40 highs in inflation. We, we think that policy is going to need to be restrictive. And we don't know how restrictive. So um, I think that's how we'll take it. Thanks, Neil. Uh, hi, Chair Powell. Neil Irwin from Axios. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, the uh, the late-breaking kind of decision to go to 75 basis points, uh, do you worry that that will make policy guidance a less effective tool in the future? Uh, and should we think of that as a kind of symmetrical reaction function if we start to get uh, soft readings on inflation or if, uh, if the labor market starts to roll over? To take your second question first, yes. I mean, I, I think we're, we're again, we're, we're going, we're resolved to take this on, but we're going to be flexible in the implementation of it. Sorry, and your, your question was guidance. So, again, the, the overall exercise is that we try to be, provide as much clarity about our policy intentions as we can, because we think that makes monetary policy work better. There's, it's always a trade-off, because you have to live with that guidance. and. Um, so you do it, and it helps a lot of the time. I frankly think this year has been a demonstration of how well it can work. We, you know, with the with us having really just done a very little in the way of raising uh, interest rates, financial conditions have tightened quite significantly through through the expectations channel as we've made it clear what our plans are. So I, I think that's been a very healthy uh, uh, thing to be happening. So. And, and I would hope that our that our it's it's always going to be any any uh, guidance that we give is always going to be subject to things working out about as we expect. And in this particular situation, you know we're we're looking for something specific, and that is progress on inflation. We want to see progress. We want to see inflation can't go down until it flattens out, and that's what we're looking to see. And and if we don't see that, then. That's the kind of thing that will cause, even if we, can, we don't see progress for a longer period, that could cause us to react. But we will, we will soon enough, we will be seeing some progress at some point, and, and, and we'll react appropriately to that, too. But I, I, would, I would like to think, though, that our guidance is still credible, but it's always going to be conditional on, on what happens. This is an unusual situation to get 
uh, you know, uh, uh, some data late in, in uh, during blackout, pretty close, very close to our meeting, very unusual to one that would actually change the outcome. So um, I, I, I've only seen in my 10 years plus here at the Fed, I've only seen something like that, even close to that one or two times. So I don't think it's something that'll come up a great deal. Colby. Thank you so much for taking our questions. Colby Smith with the Financial Times. On the clear and convincing threshold uh, for the inflation trajectory, what is the level of realized inflation uh, that meets that criteria? And how is the committee thinking about the potential trade-off of much higher unemployment than even, forecast, than even what's forecasted in the SEP if inflation is not moderating you know, at this acceptable pace? So the second part I didn't get. Um, if, uh, you know, what's the potential trade-off with higher uh, unemployment than even what's forecasted in the SEP if inflation is not moderating at an acceptable pace? Right. So w what we want to see is, is you know, a series of declining monthly readings for inflation and we like to see inflation headed down so um but you know and right right now our policy rate is well below neutral right so the, the, soon enough we'll, we'll have our policy rate let's assume the world works about, out about like the scp says the policy rate will be up where we think it should be and then the question would be do you slow down? Does it make you, you know, that you'll be making these judgments about is it appropriate now to slow down from 50 to 25, let's say, or speed up? You know, that, so that's the kind of thinking we'll, we'll be doing. And we'll be, we'll, again, we're looking, ultimately, we're not going to declare victory until we see uh, a series of these, you know, really see convincing evidence, compelling evidence that inflation is coming down. And th that's what I mean by, that's what it would take for us to say, Okay, we think uh, we think this is this job is done um, because we saw, and frankly, we saw last year, inflation came down over the course of the summer and then turned right around and went back up. So I think we're going to be careful about uh, about declaring victory. But our again, the implementation of our policy is going to be going to be flexible and sensitive to incoming data. Are you more concerned now that uh, to bring down inflation, it's going to require more than just some pain at this point? So again, I, th I think that um, I do think that uh, their objective, and this is what's reflected in the SCP, but our objective really is to bring inflation down to two percent while the labor market remains strong. I think that um, what's becoming more clear is that that many factors that we don't control are going to play a very significant role in, in deciding whether that's possible or not. And there I'm thinking, of course, of commodity prices, the, the war in Ukraine, uh, supply chain, things like that, where we really can't, we really can't the monetary policy stan you know, stance doesn't affect those things. So, but having said that, there, there is a, you know, there is a path, the, the, there is a path for us to get there. Um, it's not getting easier. Uh, it's, it's getting more challenging because of these external forces. And that, that path is to, to move demand down, and you have a lot of surplus demand. In, uh, take, for example, in the, uh, in the labor market. Uh, so it, you have two va job vacancies, essentially, for every person seek, actively seeking a job, and that has led to a real imbalance in wage negotiating. You, you could get to a place where where that ratio was was a more at a more normal level, and you wouldn't ex you would expect to see those wage pressures move back down to a level where people are still getting healthy wage increases, real wage increases, but at a level that's consistent with two percent inflation. So that's that's a possibility, and you could say the same thing about some of the product markets where there's just excess capacity, and you know where the really where the the strong demand has gone into sorry there, where there's where there's their capacity constrained right so you have effectively what we think of as a vertical supply curve or close to it, so demand comes in and it's very strong and it it shows up in higher prices not not higher quantities not more cars because they can't make the cars because they don't have the semiconductors, so in principle that could work in reverse when demand comes down, you could see. And it's not guaranteed, but you could see prices coming down more than the typical economic relationships that you see in the textbooks would suggest because of the 
unusual situation we're in on the supply side. So there's a pathway there. It is it is not going to be easy, uh, and you know that there there again it's our objective, but. Um, uh, as I mentioned, it's going to depend to some extent on factors we don't control. Rachel. Hi, Chair Powell. Thank you for taking our questions. Rachel Siegel from the Washington Post. So the new projections show the unemployment rate ticking up through 2024. Is a higher unemployment rate necessary in order to combat inflation? And what is lost if the unemployment rate has to go up and people lose their jobs in order to control inflation? Thank you. So. You're right. In, in the in the SEP, we have unemployment going up to four point. The median is is uh, is four point one percent. There are, of course, a range of of, uh, of actual forecasts, and I, I would characterize that if you if you were to get inflation down to, you know, on its way down to two percent, and the unemployment went up to rate went up to four point one percent. That's still a you know historically low level. You know, we hadn't seen we hadn't seen rates unemployment rates below four percent until a couple of years ago. For we'd seen it for like one year in the last fifty. So the idea that you know three I mean, three point six percent is historically low in, in the last century. So a four point one percent unemployment rate with with inflation well on its way to two percent. I think that would be I, I would I think that would be a successful outcome. So. We're not looking to, to have a higher unemployment rate, but I would say that we, I would certainly look at that as a successful outcome. Does that include people losing their jobs or? I, you know, we're not, again, we're not, we don't seek to put people out of work, of course. We, we never think too many people are working and fewer people need to have jobs. But we also think that you, you really cannot have the kind of labor market we want without price stability. And we have to we have to go back and establish price stability so we can have that kind of labor market. And that's a labor market where, um, you know, where workers are getting wage increases. Maybe the, maybe the workers at the lower end of the spectrum are getting the biggest wage increases as they were before the pandemic. Um, where participation is high, where there's lots of job opportunities, where it's just a really I mean the, the labor market we had before the pandemic was that's what we want to get back to. And you see you see, you know disparities between various groups at historic lows. We'd love to get back to that place. But to get there, it's, it's not going to happen with, you know, with the levels of inflation we have. So we have to, we have to restore that. And um, it, it really is in service in the medium and longer term of the kind of labor market we want and hope to achieve. Hi, Chair Powell, Matthew Bosa with Bloomberg. Um, so as you just mentioned, the committee is now projecting a half percentage point rise in the unemployment rate in the SEPs um, over the next couple of years. Um, and it removed a line from its policy statement about thinking that the labor market can remain strong uh, while it tightens policy. Um, you just mentioned that that is still your objective, though. So I'm wondering if you could explain why that line was removed from the statement and also whether um, this means the FOMC is trying to induce a recession now to bring inflation down. Not trying to reduce induce a recession now. Let's be clear about that. We're trying to achieve uh, two percent inflation consistent with a strong labor market. That's that's what we're trying to do. So let me talk about that sentence. Um, it, clearly, it's our goal to bring about two percent inflation while keeping the labor market strong, right? And and that's that's kind of what the SEP says. That the SEP has inflation getting down to two two a little above two percent in 2024 with with unemployment at 4.1 percent. So and this is a strong labor market. This is a good labor market. Um, and as I mentioned, there are pathways to do it. But those pathways have become much more challenging due to factors that are not under our control. Th again, thinking here of the fallout from the war in Ukraine, which has brought a spike in you know, prices of energy, food, fertilizer, industrial chemicals, and also just the supply chains more broadly, which have been larger than, or and longer lasting than anticipated. So the sentence that we deleted said that we believe that appropriate monetary policy effectively alone can bring about the result of 2 percent inflation with a strong labor market. And so much of it is really not down to monetary policy. It just didn't, it just, the, the, the sentence isn't, it, it kind of says on its face that monetary policy alone can do this. 
And that's, that's not, that just didn't seem appropriate, so we took the sentence out. And, and given the new projections for the unemployment rate, could you talk a little bit about what accounts for you know, such reduced conf uh, confidence against, say, a month ago or three months ago that um, inflation will largely normalize on its own as these supply side issues uh, get worked out? Thanks. Well, uh, yeah, I, th I think you've seen, again, we've been expecting progress, and we didn't get that. We got, we got sort of the opposite. So I also think the situation really since the, you know, the consequences of the Ukraine war become more and more uh, clear, what you're seeing is the situation getting, getting more difficult. And you look around the world, I mean, lots of countries are, lots of countries are looking at inflation of 10%. And it's largely due to commodities prices, but uh, all over the world, you are seeing um, these effects, and so the, and we're seeing them here. Gas prices, you know, all-time highs and things like that. That's not be, that's not something we can do something about. So um, that that's that is really. Um, and by the way, headline inflation headline inflation is important for expectations. People, are, the public's expectations. Why would they be distinguishing between? core inflation and headline inflation. Core inflation is something we think about because it, it is a better predictor of future inflation. But headline inflation is what people experience. They don't know what core is. Why, why would they? They have no reason to. So that's expectations are very much at risk due to high headline inflation. So it's become, the, the environment has become more difficult, clearly, in the last four or five months. And hence the need for the policy actions that we took today, hence our resolution to uh, you know, to get uh, rates up and, and ultimately get them to where we think they need to be um, in coming months. Thanks, Chair Powell. Edward Lawrence with Fox Business. Um, I want to ask you, you talked about CPI going to 8.6%. The retail sales surprised the market by falling, and then revisions to the previous months were down. Are you hearing from contacts about consumers slowing spending or changing their habits? So we're of course watching very, very carefully for that, and you know, looking at the retail sale, the the big store numbers, and all that kind of thing. And so, I, but I think the fair summary of what we see is you see continuing shifts in consumption, you see some some things getting sales going down, but overall, spending is very strong. The consumer is in really good shape financially; they're spending. There's no sign of a broader slowdown that I can see in the economy. People are talking about it a lot. C consumer confidence is very low. That's probably related to gas prices um, and, and also just stock prices to some extent for other people. But um, that's, that's what we're seeing. We're not seeing a broad slowdown. We, 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 we see job growth slowing, but it's still at quite robust levels. We see the economy slowing a bit, but still growth levels, healthy growth levels. So then as you are raising rates in this economy, how closely are you watching consumer spending, or is there uh, something, another indicator that you're watching more closely? It would be hard to watch anything much more closely than we watch consumer spending, but we watch everything. You know, we watch business fixed investment, which actually has softened a bit. Um, and, and you know we watch. We, we we're responsible for watching everything. But you know, uh, uh, consumption is sixty some percent of the economy, two thirds of the economy. So naturally, we spend a lot of time on that. And again, there's a lot going on. There are a lot of flows back and forth. But ultimately, uh, it 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 does appear that the U.S. economy is is in a strong position and well positioned to to deal with uh, higher interest rates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Michael McKee from Bloomberg Radio and Television. Uh, are you targeting headline inflation now or core inflation? In other words, uh, how far would you ch chase oil prices if they keep going up, if that's going to be the component that drives expectations? Uh, would you risk recession for a headline rate if the core rate is holding steady or starting to go down? So the, we're responsible for inflation in the law. And inflation means headline inflation. So that's our ultimate goal. We, of course, like all central banks do, look very, very carefully at core inflation because it is, it's a much better predictor. And it's, much, it's, it's uh, a much better predictor of where inflation is going. And it's also more relevant to our tools. As I mentioned, the parts that don't go into core are mostly outside the scope of our tools. So we look at that. But you know, it, it's, it, it, the current situation is particularly difficult because of what I mentioned about expectations. We, 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 we can't affect 
really. I mean, the energy prices are set by global commodity prices. And most of, w of food, not all of it, but most food prices are, are pretty heavily influenced by global commodity prices, too, also other things. So we can't really have much of an effect. But we have to be mindful of, of the potential effect on inflation expectations from headlines. So it, it's a very difficult situation to be in. Um, and we, again, we can't do much about, about the, the, the difference between the, the elements that make up headline that are not in core. Could I just, uh, as a follow-up, get a clarification on the SEP? When the uh, members uh, gave their forecasts, uh, when were they inserted into the record? Uh, were they revised after the CPI or uh, Michigan numbers came out? In other words, does, does the SEP as we have it now reflect the same factors that led you to go to a 75 basis point move? The SEP is is of one piece. It, it, you know, it it, re, it reflects the all of the economic readings. It also reflects the 75 basis point increase. This is important. So, people had that in hand when they when their SEPs were submitted. So it's it in other words, it's not in addition to what's in the SEP. The SEP everyone's SEP reflects their thinking about this rate increase and the, and what's going forward. Victoria. Hi, Victoria Guida from Politico. Um, I wanted to ask about how you're measuring progress, especially since you've now um, started front-loading rate hikes more. Um, you know, you've talked about how you want to see inflation coming down over a series of reports, and I guess I'm curious whether you think inflation data itself is um, a really good indicator, or whether you know you might be concerned that it's a lagging indicator, or that it might send confusing signals, given that. As you've talked about, there are sort of supply and demand aspects. And um, I, I guess my question is, you know, do you think that inflation will tell you, inflation data will tell you when you've gone to where you need to go, or do you just feel like maybe it's better to overshoot than to undershoot? So I, no, I think the, the role that we can play, maybe a way to get at it is to say that the role that we can play is around demand, right? So, and we'll be able to see the areas that we can affect are those that are associated with excess demand. And we'll be able to see our effect on, for example, job openings in real time. So, we, and that would tell us what's, that would tell us about wages. Wages are not principally responsible for the inflation that we're seeing, but it, it, going forward, they would be very important, particularly in the service sector. So, um, sorry, I, I'm not sure I'm getting to your question. My, my question is, is inflation data itself the best indicator for when you're getting to where you need to go, or might it lead you to go too far? There's always a risk of going too far or going that far enough. And uh, it's, it's going to be a very difficult judgment to make, or maybe not. Maybe, maybe it'll be really clear. But we're, we're, and we're quite mindful of the, of the dangers. And, but I, I will say, the, the, the worst mistake we could make would be to fail, which it's not an option. You know, we have to restore price stability. We really do. Because everything, it's the bedrock of the economy. If you don't have price stability, the economy is really not going to work the way it's supposed to. It won't work for people. Their wages will be being eaten up. So we want to get the job done. This, is, this inflation happened relatively recently. We don't think that it's affecting expectations in, in any kind of fundamental way. We don't think that we're seeing a wage price spiral. We think that that the, that the public uh, generally sees us as as very likely to be successful in getting inflation down to two percent, and that's critical. It's absolutely key to the whole thing that that we we sustain that confidence. So that's how we're thinking about it. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Brian Chung with Yahoo Finance. Um, I just want to expand, I guess, on what you just said now about the general public feeling like uh, you know you can get this done. When you talk about consumer sentiment being down, household inflation expectations being up, recession just broadly being dinner table talk, does the general feel among American households and also businesses uh, square with your explanation of the economy, given that the description of inflation in the statement didn't change between May and June? Thanks. So. Cl clearly, um, people don't like inflation a lot, and many people are experiencing it really for the first time, because we have we haven't had anything like this kind of inflation in 40 years, and it's it's really something people don't like, and they're experiencing that, and that's showing up in their 
in surveys and in all kinds of ways. Uh, and we understand that, and we understand the hardship that people are experiencing from high inflation, and we're determined to do what we can to get inflation back down. So that, that's really what we're saying. Uh, we're not, I'm not, uh, uh, clearly it's, it's an incredibly unpopular thing, and, and it's very painful for people. So, uh, I, but I, I guess what I'm saying is the question, the really critical question from the perspective of doing our job is making sure that the public does have confidence that we have the tools and we'll use them and they do work to bring inflation back down over time. It, it will take some time, we think, to get inflation back down, but we will do that. Chris. Ah, thank you. Uh, Chris Rugaber at Associated Press. You have talked about inflation a few times uh, and mentioned oil prices, uh, China lockdowns. Um, but aside from rises in commodity prices such, such as gas prices, we're also, we're also seeing stickier measures of inflation increasing, such as the Cleveland Fed's median and trimmed mean CPIs. I mean, how persistent do you see those underlying measures of inflation, uh, and how do you expect to, uh, where do you see those going in the near future? Yeah. So as I mentioned, I think in my opening statement, the um, inflation has started, it started off in quite narrow, very directly uh, pandemic-related uh, areas and it spread now broadly across the economy and into the services sector as well. It was really in the goods sector at the beginning. And in, part in particular, you're seeing um, in travel now, if you've flown on a plane lately, uh, planes are very full and plane tickets are very expensive. Some of that will be passed through of energy prices, but it's so you're experiencing services inflation. Um, shelter inflation is, is high. So, um, so the, so the question, and, and you, you see the, the Cleveland measure going up, other, and many other measures are going up. So, so it's a time when we're not seeing progress, and we want to see progress, and that's really another part of why we did what we did today and why, why, why the SEP looks like it does, is that we, we see it as, uh, as appropriate to get the policy rate up to restrictive levels, which would be, in the thinking of the committee, somewhere in the range of 3 to 3.5% 3 by year end, and, and, then, and then after that, you see what the rest of the SCP says. So I, ho I hope that's responsive to your question. Nancy. <clears throat> Hi, Chair Powell, Nancy Marshall Genser with Marketplace. Do you still think a softish landing is possible? And how would you define that at this point, considering the revised projections for unemployment, GDP, inflation? So I think, that, I think what's in the SCP would certainly qualify, would certainly meet that test. Uh, you know, if you see, you're looking at getting that back down to a, almost a 2 percent inflation by 2024, and the unemployment rate is still as low as 4.1 percent. That would be, I would call that as qual as meeting that test. Um, do I still think that we can do that? I, I do. I think there's. I think there, there's. I, I don't want to be the handicapper here. I just that that is our objective, um, and I, I do think it's possible. I, like I said, though, I think that events of the last few months have raised the degree of difficulty, created great challenges. And again, the, the answer to the question, can we still do it, it, it there's, a, there's a much bigger chance now that it'll depend on factors that we don't control, which is you know, fluctuations and spikes in commodity prices could, could, could wind up taking that option out of our hands. So we just don't know. Uh, but we're, you know, we're focused on, very, very focused on getting inflation back down to 2% which we think is essential uh, for the benefit of the public and also to, to put us on a path back to a sustainably strong labor market like the one we had before the pandemic. Greg. Thank you. Greg Robb from Market Watch. Chair Powell, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more. You know, economists are worried that you're kind of hitting the economy with a sledgehammer and that, that now there's even more risk of a recession than when than a 50-50 path of rates. So could you talk a little bit more about that and what evidence would get you to stop rate hikes and maybe even reverse them? Sure. So it, as I mentioned, financial conditions have tightened um, over the last seven months, and that's a good thing, we think. But the federal funds rate, even after this increases is at 1.6 percent. 
So it's hard to see how that that is too high of a rate. And if even if we did another, you know, we're so we're going to get here by the end of the summer somewhere in the twos probably. Still, that's a, that's still a low rate. So that's not a rate that is calculated to bring a recession on. And we'll by then we'll have seen a whole lot more data. Um, as I mentioned a couple times, the committee's views are around a, a, a mo modestly restrictive stance, which would be in the three to three and a half percent range by the end of this year. But that's that's you know conditioned on that being the appropriate thing to do. If we see data going in a different direction, it'll be reflected in our in our policy, as you see today. You know, we'll be watching if <clears throat> uh, if, if things go in a direction we don't expect, then we're going to adapt. And, and I would say this is a highly uncertain environment, extraordinarily uncertain environment. So uh, again, we'll be, we'll be determined and resolved, but flexible. Okay, Evan. Evan Reiser, Market News International. Thank you, Chair Powell. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if the Fed has initiated a review of the conduct of monetary policy over the last two years or so. Um, given the inflation, and will that be shared with the public? And then secondly, given the, the illiquidity and extraordinary volatility in financial markets, are you concerned that QT will make that worse? Sorry, what was your question on QT? Um, just given the Ill illiquidity and extraordinary volatility in financial markets, whether QT will make things worse. Ah. So, um, of course, we've been looking you know, very carefully and hard at why inflation picked up so much more than expected last year and why it proved so persistent. We, uh, it's hard to overstate the extent of uh, interest we have in that question, morning, noon, and night. So, um, but you have to put, you have to understand the context for, really the context is this, for, you know, decades before the, the pandemic and the reopening, you had a world where inflation was dominated by <clears throat> disinflationary forces such as declining population or, or aging demographics, let's call it that, globalization enabled by technology, other factors, low productivity. So, and, you know, that's, that's how all the models work it, it is, you know, decades and decades of data. They, they look at that. It's a very flat Phillips curve work and, and the supply shocks tend to be transient, right? So. We have now experienced an extraordinary series of shocks, if you think about it. The pandemic, the response, the reopening, inflation, followed by the war in Ukraine, followed by uh, shutdowns in China. The war in Ukraine potentially having effects for years here. So we're aware that a, a different set of forces are driving the economy. We have been, obviously, for quite a while, that this is a different, these forces are different. Inflation is behaving differently. And in our thinking, it really is a question of very strong demand. But you, you, could, you couldn't get this kind of inflation without a change on the supply side, which is there for anybody to see, which is these, these blockages and shortages and people dropping out of the labor force and, and things like that. So that's, that's how we're looking at it. Um, and you know, we've done a lot of work internally on uh, and thinking about, about what all that means. You don't, the thing is, you don't know whether those forces are, how, to the, what extent are they going to be sustained? In other words, will we go back to a world where that looks a little more like the old world, or are we going, really going to be in a world where major supply shocks go on and on? The history is you, you see these waves of supply shocks, as you did in, in the 70s, and then they go away. And, and you know, sort of there's a new normal and things settle down. But honestly, we don't know. Uh, what, what that's going to be. In the meantime, we have to find price stability in this new world and maximum employment in this new world where clearly inflationary forces are, you, you're seeing them everywhere. Again, if you look, look around the world at where inflation levels are, it's absolutely extraordinary. It's not just here. In fact, we're sort of in the middle of the pack, although I think we have, a, we have of course, a different kind of inflation than other people have. And, uh, uh, partly because our economy is stronger and, and more highly recovered. So that, that's what we're doing. We're, 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 we've done a lot of introspection and work on that. And um, sorry, on, on QT, um, you know, we've communicated really clearly to the markets about what, what we're going to do there. Markets seem to be okay with it. Um, we're, we're, we're phasing in. Um, Treasury issuance is down quite a lot, quite a lot from where it's been. 
So I have no reason to think markets are forward looking and they see this coming. I have no reason to think it, it uh, will lead to illiquidity and problems. It seems to be kind of understood and accepted at this point. Thanks. For the last question, we'll go to Mark. Mr. Chairman, Mark Hamrick with Bankrate. I um, wonder what your assessment is about the outlook for the housing market given the uh, years-long increase in home prices and now the sharp rise in mortgage rates. And all that, of course, given the uh, heightened sensitivity around the housing market given the fact that it was a trigger for the great financial crisis over a decade ago. Thank you. Sure. So rates were, were very low. Um, a good place to start is that rates were very, very low for quite a while because of the pandemic and the and you know the need to do everything we could to support the economy when unemployment was 14 percent and the true unemployment rate was was well higher than that. So, and that you know that was a uh, rates are low and now now they're coming back up to more normal or above levels. So. Um, in the meantime, while rates were low and while demand was really high, obviously demand for housing changed from wanting to live in urban areas to some extent to living in, in single family homes in the suburbs famously. And so the demand was just suddenly much higher. And uh, low, so we saw prices moving up very, very uh, strongly for the last couple of years. So that changes now, and rates have moved up. We're well aware that rate, mortgage rates have moved up a lot, and you're, you're, you know, you're seeing a changing housing market. We're watching it to see what will happen. How much will it really affect residential investment? Not really sure. Uh, what will, how much will it affect housing prices? You know, not really sure. It's, uh, I mean, obviously we're watching that quite carefully. You would think over time, I mean, so there's a, there's a tremendous amount of supply in the housing market of unfinished homes. And as those come online, whereas the, the, the supply of finished homes, inventory of finished homes that are for sale is incredibly low, historically low. So that it's still a very tight market. So prices may keep going up for a while, even in a world where rates are, are up. So it's a complicated situation. We watch it very carefully. Um, you know, I, I would say if you're if you're a home buyer, somebody or a young person looking to buy a home, you, you need a bit of a reset. You, we we need to get back to a place where where supply and demand are are back uh, together, and where inflation is down low again, and mortgages or mortgage rates are low again. So this this will be a process whereby we ideally we 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 do our work in a way that where the housing market settles in a new place and housing availability and, and credit availability are at appropriate levels. So thank you very much. <clears throat> that was Fed Chair Jay Powell just wrapping up his news conference after the Fed raised rates 75 basis points. It's the largest hike since 1994. Now, Powell did say that a 50 to 75 basis point move at the next meeting in July was certainly on the table, but also saying that don't necessarily expect 75 basis points to be the new norm. Let's take a look at where markets stand here with just about a half hour to go in the trading day. And you're looking at gains across the board. The Dow up nearly 500 points. S&P up just over 2%. The Nasdaq, the outperformer, as we see a lot of those larger cap tech names getting a boost today with the Nasdaq up just about 3%. We want to bring in Andrew Levin. He's a former Federal Reserve Board a Special Advisor and Economics Professor at Dartmouth. Also, Elise Ozenbaugh, J.P. Morgan Global Market Strategist. Andrew, first to you, because Powell signaling that the Fed could stay a very aggressive 75 basis point hike today, 50 to 75 on the table for July. Does that type of policy, that aggressive a policy, make sense to you? I, I think that the Fed is making the same mistake now that they've made persistently over the last year, more than a year. Um, let me be concrete. The Fed just released a fresh set of projections for inflation. What it expects inflation to be this year? Okay, now we're already halfway through the year. They are projecting that headline PCE inflation is going to be about 5% for the year as a whole. Now think about this for a moment. The inflation rate for the first half of the year is at around seven, okay, for core PCE. In order for them to get that forecast of five, that means that for the second half of the year, inflation would have to be at three, which seems very unrealistic. 
Now, with core inflation, their projection for the year as a whole is 4.3%. But core inflation, PCE inflation, is running at 5 for the first half of the year. So that means they would have to drop very rapidly to 3% over the next six months. I think the Fed is being still too rosy, too optimistic, and probably the actual rate hikes they're going to have to do over the next six months to a year is going to be much more significant than what seems like it could work if they're if the current forecast actually materialized. Okay, but that, that seems to me quite unlikely. Okay, at least we want to back up just a bit and get your reaction to first the hike, 75 points, first time since 1994. And now your reaction to Andrew as well on the tail end there that the Fed is being too rosy, too optimistic. So I mean, they should be. Oh. Sorry, please. I, I was going to say that if you would have asked me a week ago, we would have thought that 75 basis points would be a big surprise. But of course, coming off of the Friday inflation uh, print and the way that the market moved really quickly to price in that probability, not a surprise. Um, I personally think and JP Morgan thinks that the Fed's not necessarily being too rosy. A lot of economic data from even today kind of got lost in the Fed shuffle, but we are already starting to see signs that economic activity is slowing down to a degree that should con continue to cool inflation. I think Powell did a really good job of managing the market's expectations and letting the market know that there's got to be some optionality at play here. Uh, to think that the Fed might tilt dovish in the months ahead, I, I think would perhaps be, um, you know, that, that would signal that someone's being misled about their expectations. Um, but, you know, putting 75 basis points on the table for July and then again seeing what happens in September, um, I think remains kind of the right mindset. And Andrew, we did see that the markets jumped as Chair Powell laid out, really the thinking behind the rate hike, as well as so we heard these terms nimbly moving nimbly and being ex moving expeditiously. We heard those words peppered throughout his press conference. What will he have to do then between now and the end of the year or in the future sessions to really try and meet these goals that he's looking at for inflation? Well, I think it's helpful that the, the, the Fed emphasized on the same day they're strongly committed to bringing inflation back to the 2% goal. But in my view, they have a long way to go, a long way to go. Inflation doesn't move uh, normally that quickly going downward. Um, and they've emphasized the China, they've emphasized uh, the commodity prices, uh, the, the, the labor market, nominal wage growth now is running at 6 or 7%. That's not consistent with a 2% inflation rate. Um, and, and the housing prices and the rents are still going up. So I think there's a risk, actually, that inflation is going to be higher at the end of this year than it is right now. At least one thing that Powell also did say is just in terms of when the Fed wants to meet its objective of bringing inflation rate down to 2 percent, he wants to do that while the labor market remains strong. Do you think that's possible? We do think it's possible. One of the things that he pointed out in the context of that comment was that there continues to be this surplus of demand for labor and the supply has not yet caught up. Um, so I, I think it is realistic to think or assume that we could see that slight uptick in unemployment over the next couple of years, but not necessarily a dramatic spike that would have you know, been reflective of what we saw in 2020 or in 2008 coming out of the global financial crisis. And Andrew, to your notion about uh, rosy and optimistic, it was a surprise to hear Powell say, and I'm going to quote, there's no sign of a broader slowdown that I can see in the economy. Instead, what would you like to have heard from Powell there? Well, I think the, the realistic scenario that I can see, and I agree with Elise, I think that this morning's retail sales report was important. What I think we're heading for now is what economists used to call stagflation. That means a very weak, kind of close to zero economic growth um, uh, um, combined with continued elevated levels of inflation. That's the, the likely scenario here. Um, and it's not a very rosy one. Consumers are not going to be any happier six months or a year from now than they are today because uh, their real incomes won't be rising. So then, Elise, in terms of your clients, they wh whether or not they were expecting this 75 basis point hike, where do people position themselves now, knowing that we're still in this rate rising environment, that we could see more aggressive action coming out in future sessions? I think people need to revisit their goals and assess whether they're going to be able to stay on track towards meeting those goals while taking less risk. 
when you can get 5% from investment grade uh, corporate bonds or municipal bonds on a tax equivalent basis, that looks really compelling, especially when you consider the confluence of risks and the amount of uncertainty that's likely to continue to weigh on the equity market. It doesn't mean that investors have to blow out of stocks, but we are encouraging folks to focus on upgrading the quality of those positions, leaning into sectors like healthcare, which historically have proven to be very durable, regardless of whether we were in an economic boom, bust, or somewhere in between, and also considering using some of this volatility to our advantage uh, by putting on structured notes that allow investors to participate in the stock market with some downside protection. Elise, what do you think has been priced into the market at this point? A 75 basis point hike in July. Has that been priced in yet? Yes, I think so. Because what the Fed just came out with in terms of those forward-looking projections in the dot plot, we pretty much saw that adjustment in markets over the course of Monday and a little bit yesterday. Uh, so at this point, you know, I, I think these hawkish expectations are pretty well embedded. And of course, as Powell said, we're, we're going to have to kind of take a data dependent approach to this. Um, we in particular do think that interest rates are, are likely, you know, it's hard to say that they're peaking right now. We are probably going to con uh, continue to see some rate volatility, but over the longer term, a one or two year time horizon, we do think that interest rates are going to be uh, biased to the downside. And so we're comfortable adding duration, but you can also look at opportunities on the shorter end of the curve if you are really concerned about that interest rate risk, um, and certainly at the very least use that as a means of liquidity management. And Andrew, as we look at, obviously we're focusing on what the Fed can do in terms of lowering interest rates, I'm sorry, raising interest rates, and also trying to tighten their quanti with their quantitative easing. Um, but what about things that are outside of the Fed's control? What are some of the indicators that you're keeping an eye on there? Oh, that's a great question. I think that, uh, unfortunately, it looks more and more likely that the situation in Ukraine is going to drag on um, uh, for a long time to come. It's it's a horrific situation, but that's going to have um, big global consequences, as Chair Powell emphasized today. Um, the situation in China doesn't look like it's getting better. And so what we were hoping for with supply chain disruptions would be starting to ease this year. Um, if anything, they might get worse because uh, that situation in China is very, very difficult. Certainly lots to watch for. A big thank you to our panel, Andrew Levin, their former Federal Reserve Board Special Advisor and Dartmouth College Economics Professor, and Elise Ossenbaum, JP Morgan Global Market Strategist. Thank you both. All right, well, let's break down the highlight of Brian Chung, who is back with us. So, Brian, what stood out most to you? Yeah, Rochelle, well, it was a very eventful press conference. It's been an eventful day, really. Uh, but when you talk about just kind of the big takeaways from the press conference, obviously he expanded on the idea of why the Fed needed to move by 75 basis points or 0.75% today, obviously referring to the Consumer Price Index report that came in hotter than expected last Friday. The Fed chairman uh, reminding uh, essentially markets that, quote, our policy is adaptive and it will continue to do so. You saw the revival of the phrase data dependency. This is despite the fact that the guidance from the Fed Fed chairman, as you were just discussing with your previous guest, is for something either 50 or uh, 75 basis points in their next meeting, which, by the way, will be happening at the end of July as scheduled. Now, that's offering some guidance and takes essentially that 100 basis point hike that maybe some markets are speculating off the table, at least for July. And that kind of makes sense. That was the natural question, given that the progression of rate hikes so far in 2022 was uh, 25 basis points earlier in the year, 50 basis points in May, and then 75 basis points uh, in June, of course, if you continue to draw a line there, how much higher do you have to go? The Fed chairman essentially setting a cap, at least for right now, of 75 basis points. Now, a lot can happen between now and then, but the Fed chairman likely emphasizing that they want to have the flexibility for policy in the future. Now, on inflation, the Fed chairman saying that this is something that's not going to be very quick and it's not going to be easy. He uh, offered a very simple line by saying that inflation needs to flatten out before it can decline haven't necessarily seen signs that it has flattened, at least on the consumer price index. So that's one reason why the Fed needs to give a little bit more optionality going forward. Now, one last thing I want to mention is that the average American is feeling this. They're talking about the concerns about a recession. And my question to the Fed chairman in the press conference was essentially, does the Fed's outlook on the economy line up with the concern that Americans have at the dinner table? Take a listen to his response to that question. Clearly, um People don't like inflation a lot, and many people are experiencing it really for the first time, because we, have, we haven't had anything like this kind of inflation in 40 years, and it's 
it's really something people don't like and they're experiencing that and that's showing up in their in surveys and in all kinds of ways uh, and we understand that and we understand the hardship that people are experiencing from high inflation and we're determined to do what we can to get inflation back down so that that's really what we're saying uh, we're not I'm not uh, clearly it's it's an incredibly unpopular thing and and it's very painful for people so uh, I, but I, I guess what I'm saying is the question really critical question from the perspective of doing our job is making sure that the public does have confidence that we have the tools and will use them and they do work to bring inflation back down over time it, it will take some time we think to get inflation back down but we will do that the fed chairman saying it straight no one likes inflation with regards to concerns about a recession he added in the press conference quote not trying to induce a recession now let's be clear about that guys the next 12 to 18 months will be the bearer of whether or not that does actually happen guys and brian the word transitory is long gone the word nimble is back and he kept on bringing that one back and adding others like flexibility and having the ability to adapt. Why do you think that shift in tone from taking 75 off the table in the prior meeting to now clearly saying everything is, and, and it, maybe it was just me, but I was dumb and dumber there, 100 points sounded like, so you're saying there's a chance it's, it's, it's at least a possibility at the next meeting. What do you make of that shift in tone? Yeah, it was a real neck breaker getting to uh, the meeting today, essentially, because if you rewind to last Thursday, markets were pricing in only a 3% chance that the Fed would move by three quarters of a percentage point. Of course, the big difference was, first of all, the CPI report that we got on Friday and then a record low print on the University of Michigan's consumer sentiment. Now, of course, the Federal Reserve is quick to point out that when the Fed laid out the game plan for the last five weeks for a 50 basis point increase this week, they caveated that by saying that would depend on the outlook remaining as it was at the time that they offered that plan. So the Fed has always said they've had the flexibility and they're wanting to do the same now. But of course, one natural reaction might be, well, why should we believe you on the guidance for 50 or 75 basis points in the July meeting when you gave us guidance for uh, this meeting and then ultimately scrapped it last minute? That's certainly a valid concern. But the Fed, credibility is not following through necessarily on the forward guidance. Credibility is about the ultimate outcome of getting inflation down, which the summary of economic projections show they hope to do uh, next year by getting inflation down to something closer to 2.3%, 2.2% in 2024. But again, those are projections. Some of that might be optimism or perhaps aspirational from the Fed. But regardless, the Fed hoping they can get this done without triggering a hard landing. Yeah, and you mentioned that University of Michigan uh, consumer sentiment, which he called eye-catching, but then circled back and said, I see no sign of a broader slowdown that I can see in the economy. We just talked to Andrew Levin, who said he finds that too rosy, too optimistic. What about you, Brian? Yeah, well, that's exactly the point of the question that I tried to ask him, which is that, look, at the end of the day, the Federal Reserve is saying we can achieve this soft landing, we can do this, but... At the same time, you're seeing all of these readings on consumer expectations. It's not a lagging indicator. It's a leading indicator. What do you feel in terms of uh, the right now? How much expenditures do you expect to have? The uh, kind of inflation expectations that you have in the future, which remain high, that's something the Federal Reserve has not necessarily squared. But the Fed chairman saying they're aware of the fact that Americans are feeling this. They're aware that their mission is to get inflation back down. But of course, saying that and then actually achieving that through higher rates, that's something that the jury is still out on. And made clear they will do whatever it takes. Brian Chung, excellent job today. And as always, sir, thank you. Coming up, what the Fed's 75-point basis hike means for the crypto market crashing in recent days.
Welcome back to Fed Day here on Yahoo Finance Live, taking a look at all three major indices and how they have reacted to that 75-point hike and the narrative painted there by the uh, Chair Jerome Powell. And it's been a wild ride, folks. It has been a wild ride. Right about the time we heard him say a 50 or a 75-point hike is on the table for the July meeting, we were about plus 160. It shifted into plus well over 600 points on the Dow and now has fallen back down, but still well up on all this news, up more than 300 points or 1% on the Dow. The S&P up 60 points, 1.6%, and the NASDAQ up nearly 300 points or 2.6%. Very favorable reaction to the news from the Fed. And this market check sponsored by Tastyworks. Indeed, a lot to digest there. Well, crypto was once actually hoped to be an inflation hedge and as well as a safe haven amid turmoil during as a way of doing it through decentralized finance. Well, as we've seen, that ship has clearly sailed. But let's take a deeper dive now with Noel Atchison, Genesis Trading Head of Market Insights, to see what we're ha what's happening with crypto. So, Noel, obviously, we saw a lot of volatility going into this. A lot, of, as we see, what's happening with Bitcoin prices still hovering around that 20, 21,000 mark. What state is crypto in right now? Thanks, Rochelle. Very good to be with you. I do have to say that nothing I say is investment advice, obviously. And everything I do say are my opinions and not that of my employer. But seriously, um, very welcome rally on the back of the Fed announcement today, much like the traditional markets. And it's an interesting, in the terms of the correlation, we saw the correlation between Bitcoin and the S&P 500 hit all-time highs in early May. Then with the terror implosion, that started to decouple. It's been trending down ever since, but it's still above 0 0.5, which shows that while less affected by macro considerations, crypto markets are still very largely influenced by macro sentiment. And um, the relief rally is, after what we've seen over the past few days in the crypto markets, as I'm sure many of your viewers are aware, very welcome. Well, Noel, with the crypto market clearly on shaky ground, you can see that from the reaction that we've seen in Bitcoin over the last several weeks. Now we're seeing the Fed get more and more aggressive. Yes, Bitcoin and the equity markets reacting okay today. But what does that mean for a few weeks down the line or looking ahead to July at, for the Fed's next meeting? That's a very good question, uh, Shanna. We have been hit hard by sentiment over the past, ever since the beginning of May, actually, with the terror implosion. And what we're seeing now with some of the unwinding of leverage positions in the market is it's a different crisis, but it's a continuation of that. However, as we all know, we've, we've been through this before. And any crisis, while not to belittle the pain that many of our investors are feeling, and in crypto, the pain can be quite intense, while not to belittle that, any down market does set the market up for upside on the other side. And what is interesting is the differences between this crisis and the last time we were with this with this type of a drawdown, which was back in, in late 2018. Very different market now, very much more institutional. Uh, we're seeing crypto being talked about in regulatory offices at the highest level all around the world. We're seeing crypto being discussed in boardrooms at the highest level all around the world. The diversity of investors, the diversity of use cases is clearer than ever. And that's just Bitcoin going down the stack. DeFi, while it may have issues, let's take a moment to appreciate how well it is actually holding up. Sure, there are some exceptions, but some of the blue chips that have been around for a few years now, they're holding up under the mother of all stress tests. And you hear it in Congress uh, all, very often. You also hear it, of, of course, with fidelity and retirement. But what I hear about those who have stayed on the sideline through all of this, Noel, is what is it? How do I view it? Because we, they were told it was a hedge against inflation. We have now learned that is not the case, and it appears to be trading like a very volatile and very risky tech stock. So those that have remained on the sideline, how should they view it? I love that question, Dave, because it highlights one of my favorite aspects about Bitcoin in particular. And while this is not investment advice, it, it highlights that Bitcoin is many things to many people. That gives it resilience. Diversity breeds resilience. It has a diversity of investor cohorts. It has a diversity of use types. For some, it is a store of value, a long-term emerging store of value. And, and the inflation hedges are not supposed to be short-term anyway. So a long-term store of value, given its hard cap, given the potential changes in the demand. For some, it is a risk asset for some. It is an early stage technology play. And for others, it is a payment mechanism. While you or I may not need it for that, much of the world does. It is still better than what they have. So that diversity of thought around Bitcoin is one of its strongest features. So in the answer to the question of what is Bitcoin, it is, and this may sound hand wavy, but it really is whatever you want it to be. People often ask me, Dave, how do I get my head around this industry? How do I come into this industry? What do I look for? And my answer is always, well, look around. 
any problems that you think might need to be solved in the world, there is a solution being worked on in the crypto industry. There really is something for everyone here. And so my advice, this is investment advice, is learn about it, learn about the market, think about what you need, to, think about what you think needs fixing, and then try and understand what the crypto industry itself is doing about that. And you raise a good point there about sort of classifying it. We know regulators still grappling with that. A big thank you to Noel Acheson there, Genesis Trading Head of Market Insights. Well, do stay with us, Yahoo Finance Live. More Fed Day coverage coming up. Being up tech sector leading the market's bounce as we head into the final minutes of trading. Names like Netflix among the leaders today. Amazon, Tesla, all up big. Dan Halley here on set for us. And Dan, I think there was lots of question going into this when we see the Fed get more aggressive, what that means for tech. Lots of worry that they would actually retreat but we're seeing the exact opposite today. No, yeah, and you know, uh, like like the rest of the market, it seems like everything's popping at this point. Though, you know, it's still worth pointing out a lot of these big name tech stocks are still hovering around their 52-week lows. Uh, you know, you have DocuSign actually, uh, sorry, Google actually uh, kind of pulling away from that uh, at this point. A lot of them uh, seem to be uh, boosted. We've seen news in recent days and weeks that some of these companies are slowing hiring. That's been uh, good for the stock price to a degree. Uh, you know, obviously Apple getting that uh, boost here. I think, you know, it's really going to remain to be seen where this all goes and what it ends up meaning for people. Just because, you know, we have companies like Tesla who said they're going to have layoffs. Intel slowing uh, uh, their uh, uh, hiring. Uh, Redfin, Compass, layoff, layoff. Uh, Coinbase, layoff. Mm -hmm. You know, and then we have the, the big tech companies. We have uh, Alphabet. Not a word about layoffs from them yet or slowing, but Microsoft slowing, uh, uh, Amazon slowing, uh, NVIDIA sort of slowing, finishing onboarding the tons of people that they said they uh, originally had is what we 
we kind of got out of them. And, and Meta, uh, uh, you know, unofficially Meta now, uh, talking about kind of pulling back on some of their spending overall. And that's from last quarter. But, you know, we'll have to see, uh, obviously, what comes tomorrow uh, when all of this is kind of fully digested. But I think for the big tech companies that are uh, out there right now and the smaller tech companies that we saw really explode during the pandemic, it's still going to be a rough ride for them going forward. And Spotify was another name today where we got some news that they were going to be slowing hiring by just about 25 percent. And taking a look at the reaction in the stock today, shares are up just about 7 percent. So. Yeah, it's it's interesting. They're they're not freezing hiring. Yeah. They're right. slowing. And not layoffs. That, yeah. That's... It's, it's a weird kind of way to put it, but obviously it's it's helping them to a degree today. All right, Dan Halley, thanks so much. We are going to take a quick break. On the other side, we'll have the closing bell. All right, we're just minutes away from today's closing bell as the markets embrace this news from the Fed. Let's get to Inez Foray. And Dave, the Dow had been up as much as 600 points while Fed Chair Jerome Powell was speaking. Right now, it's up about 300 points as we go into this final minute of trading. The Nasdaq up almost 2.5% right there. And you've got the S&P 500 also up almost 1.5%. Taking a look at Treasury yields, a two-year plunged while Jerome Powell was speaking. Looking at the five-year, that's at 3.47%. And it's above the 30-year, which is at 3 0.41%. Also taking a look at the U.S. dollar index, that ticked lower while Jerome Powell was speaking. Also looking at the sector action, we are seeing in the green leading consumer discretionary real estate, communication services, and technology stocks, energy stocks. Those have been the laggards today. That XLE is down. And over on the Dow, we're watching some of the Dow components leading the gains. 
So you're looking at Boeing up more than 9%. In fact, over the last two days, Boeing is up 15%. And then just taking a look at the NASDAQ 100, quite a bit of winners here today. You're seeing Amazon up more than 5%. Tesla is also higher. One of the biggest winners today being Netflix, which had been higher today, uh, up more than 7%. And finally, just looking at the bank stocks, those are in the green as well. Here's the closing bell for today, Wednesday, June 15th at the New York Stock Exchange. And there you have it. That is your closing bell sponsored by Tastyworks. Let's see how the major indices settled on this very big Fed day. Well, all three major indices stayed in positive territory after the Fed gave that remark about the 75 basis point hike. The Dow ending up more than 300 points there at 1%. The S&P 500 up 1.46% there, 1.5% up 54 points. And the Nasdaq, the biggest soar on the day, 2.5% there, gaining 270 points. Well, let's break down the market action now with our guests, Christian Hoffman, Thornburg Investment Portfolio Manager, and Jason England, Global Bonds Portfolio Manager at Janice Henderson. So, Christian, I want to start with you because in your notes, you did say that the Fed's credibility was on the line here. Did they live up to expectations? I think they did exactly the right thing, and they had been backed into a corner. You know, previously the Fed had acted like a very cautious parent or a, a corporation that wants to, you know, test everything with a focus group and not surprise anyone or harm anyone. But the CPI print last week and the market reaction to it uh, was violent and brutal, and really put them into a, a tough place. And given the short amount of time between the meetings today and that print, they also didn't have an opportunity to go on the road and, and massage the message to the market. So they did it via a nuanced way, which was leaking it to the media late Monday. Um, the interesting thing is between last week and early this week, you know, we'd already reacted to CPI and again, a very, very violent manner. And at this point, 75 had kind of become a foregone conclusion, even though, you know, two weeks ago it would have been unthinkable. And again, we had, you know, relatively calm markets this morning, you know, post the announcement, there was really no surprise. There was very little reaction, despite being probably the most uncertain meeting because it hadn't been telegraphed due to the back channel nat nature of you know what they had done. You know there was really no surprises. I think really the only surprise that came out of today was the fact that we're more likely to do fifty to seventy five bips at the at the next meeting, and the Fed wasn't going to go medieval. Jason, uh, Powell has asked a few times this afternoon to weigh in about a soft, a softish landing. He didn't bite. He didn't want to say those words. But do you think the Fed is going to be able to orchestrate a soft landing, given the dynamics right now in the economy? I think, he, you know, he did he did avoid it because he, he really doesn't. It's out of their control now. And he did um, highlight that the commodity um, prices and external factors like that are going to be more dependent on whether they can pull off a soft landing. So I think that's kind of why he waffled a little bit on it. I, I think for us, to me, I like to call it a safe landing. One of those plane rides that are very turbulent, even when you're touching down, it's going to be rocky and turbulent along the way. And, and then once you get landed, you, you, you kind of feel like, okay, now you're safe. I think that's kind of what we're looking at right now. Um, you know, the, the Fed really has been backed into a corner here by the mistakes they've made on the transitory inflation. They continue to, to uh, you know, make these mistakes along the way. So I think it's going to be tough for them to pull off the soft landing. And, and they still think there's hope for it, but I, I think it's going to be very tough at this point going forward. Christian, the markets really bounced when the Fed chair left open that possibility, or even leaning towards its 75 points at the next meeting, up more than 600 points at one point. Is that the market just saying, thank you, sir, may I have another? <laughs> I think it's a little bit of that, but I also think you have to think about the mood and the trend that we've experienced over the past week and really all year. So positioning had become so bearish, so short that, you know, I think really anything that can cause a relief is going to cause a significant bounce. You know, some of that is short covering. Some of that is a relief rally. You know, we're clearly not out of the woods. I think, you know, from here, we're going to be watching inflation data extremely carefully. You know, I think the market also probably put 
too much weight on this last CPI print. It's one data print, you know, it can be revised um, and it's really the direction, right? We, we're probably very close to, to peak inflation. And as soon as we start seeing that come down, you know, I think that's when, you know, the true relief, the true buying will, will, will step in. It's gonna be choppy from here though, I think. Again, this is short I mean covering in a, in a bounce. And Jason, we did hear Fed Powell say, look, don't get too comfortable with these 75 basis point hikes. This, this isn't going to be a common thing. But then still leaving the door open, saying it's going to be really determined by what they see with the data points that come out. What, how complex is the picture for the Fed now by going 75 basis points when you keep in mind what we still need to see with quantitative tightening? Yeah, I, I think he decided this time he wasn't going to handcuff himself and, and you know, the last time around, he said 50 at the June and July meetings, and, and he didn't want to, he wanted the flexibility by doing 75 now and putting it on the table that they could do 50 or 75 at the next meeting. They're really going to be data dependent and try to be flexible and nimble, which is tough to do in this environment. You know, as Christian said, it's been a volatile market, um, you know, to start this week after the CPI print. They want they don't want to overreact to these CPI prints, but they also need to take them in stride and realize that they, you know, they were wrong on inflation. So they need to get it under control and do everything in their power. So I think really today was trying to reestablish the inflation narrative for the Fed and trying to get, restore some credibility. And I think they did a good job of that. Jason, what do you think of the bond market's reaction to the Fed decision today? The 10-year pulling back when you take a look at yields, a two-year yield posting its biggest one-day drop that we've seen in just about two years. What is that signaling? Yeah, I think it's that the markets, uh, you know, the, the Fed delivering of 75 and then the communication by Powell was well received. I think you're seeing a little bit of a relief, relief rally that you saw you know, such such extreme sell-offs on Friday and Monday this week and a little bit leaked into yesterday just because of that CPI print and the Fed being behind the curve. So they delivered a message that the fixed income market wanted. So you got a little bit of relief rally. I still think, you know, as Christian pointed out, there's still turbulent times ahead in fixed income. You can still see rates go higher. But at this point, you know, we'll take a little breather and, and, and be happy that the Fed delivered on, on what they needed today. There wasn't a, a huge surprise in anything Powell said, except for maybe this, Christian, that there's no sign of a broader slowdown that I can see in the economy. And earlier, Andrew Levin, former Fed special advisor, said he thought that was way too rosy and optimistic. He actually sees inflation. What's your reaction to that? I mean, we clearly have inflation and have had inflation for a long time, even, you know, when you know, paradoxically, last year we had the you know 10 year close to 1 percent, you know, in the face of you know sky high inflation. Um, Look, I, I think it's going to be hard to orchestrate a soft landing, even though that's roughly what the market is pricing in, you know, at this point in time. If you look at the projections that the Fed puts out, to me, that's not the future. That's that's a mood board. That's something aspirational. Um, they're still trying to please everyone and, uh, you know, not, not scare anyone or do anything too scary. But we've said for years that the global financial crisis was caused by investment banks, and the next crisis would likely be caused by central banks. And I don't think we're at a crisis point at this time, but you can't print money for, for 15 years and please everyone and, you know, not eventually have to pay the piper. Well, Christian, real quick, when do you think we could potentially get to that crisis point? Well, liquidity in the markets is actually incredibly choppy right now. Again, it feels it feels good today, but I, you know, I don't think this is going to be, you know, continue and be lasting. Um, and I'd also highlight that market liquidity and structures have actually changed pretty notably, and that liquidity continues to improve on very small lots. And this is for equity and fixed income markets. So there's an illusion of liquidity. There's a there's an illusion of being able to transact. But in terms of size due to the lack of market makers and risk takers, which again is actually a fallout of the global financial crisis. Um, actual liquidity for size is you know, no, nowhere near what it was you know, 10 or 15 years ago. And I think that creates the risk that liquidity evaporates from the market and uh, dries up and you have you know, very cliffy price action. I mean, at this point we're having you know, incredible volatility on a two-year basis. We had it in 2020, had it in 2018, had it in 2016. Um, I and mean, that's, that's a little too much in my opinion. All right, Christian Hoffman, Jason England, thanks so much for joining us today. We have some breaking news on COVID. The Moderna and Pfizer vaccines one step closer toward approval for use in children. Anjali Kamalani has the details for us. Anj. That's right, Shauna. We got Moderna and Pfizer both voted unanimously by an FDA advisory panel today. Uh, we saw not 
not so much concern about the Moderna vaccine, which is a two dose, 25 microgram uh, vaccine, but we did see some comments about Pfizer's dose, which as we know is now a three dose, three microgram uh, dose vaccine. And that is uh, some concerns about the efficacy data that came out there. Pfizer, Pfizer noting that uh, with just two doses, there wasn't really some strong protection. And we heard from one of the panel members, Dr. Paul Offit, noting that this could confuse parents into thinking that their kids are protected after two doses because there is a two month gap before that third dose. So just to point that out there, we're, we're sure to hear more about that at the next step, which is uh, first of all, a decision from the FDA and then the CDC advisory committee, which is set to meet this weekend and vote on Saturday afternoon, uh, whether or not to advance both of those vaccines for use. We largely do expect those to make it through. And the White House has already made plans to start distribution for next week. So just waiting on those final votes and decisions from both agencies. Meanwhile, of course, speaking of COVID, we've heard that Dr. Anthony Fauci has tested positive for COVID-19. His symptoms are mild. He is a double boosted individual. That makes him the second uh, official from the administration to test positive. We also know that Health Secretary uh, Javier Becerra has also tested positive this week. Back to you guys. We wish them both a speedy recovery. All right, Anjali Kamalani, thanks so much. Coming up next, sky-high home prices and a shortage of inventory are hitting home buyers hard. We've got a closer look at the housing market and the implications of the Fed rate hike when we come back. If you're a home buyer, somebody or a young person looking to buy a home, you, you need a bit of a reset. You, we, we need to get back to a place where, where supply and demand are, are back uh, together and where inflation is down low again and mortgages are, mortgage rates are low again. So this, this will be a process whereby we ideally we, we, we do our work in a way that where the housing market settles in a new place and housing availability and, and credit availability are at appropriate levels. That was Fed Chair Jay Powell noting the slowdown in housing this afternoon, saying that the market does appear 
to be softening. Now, his comments, though, coming as we got data out earlier today showing that mortgage demand is about half of what it was just about a year ago. We want to bring in Debbie Boyd, DLB Financial Services CEO. And Debbie, when you take into account what Powell is just saying, we need to get back to a place where supply and demand are balanced. Where we are right now is a far cry from that. But today's rate hike, what does that mean for housing and how long do you think it's going to take in order for us to get back to where, to get back to what Jay Powell was just talking about? You know, this is the new normal. I don't think we're going back. We may have more houses on the market. You know, we've got a double whammy. We've got seniors staying in their houses longer, so they're not vacating the premises. We've got younger people marrying when they're older and having kids in their mid-30s now. They're starting to look for houses, and they want to be in the $400,000 range. Well, with the Fed changing the rates, they're going to be buying about $100,000 less in a house than they could have at the end of last year. So in the mortgage business, we've been warning people all along that the rate hikes were coming. I don't think they believed us. I think they believe us now. They're going to have to change what their priorities are and what they're willing to do for a new home. 30-year fix north of 6%. And many had hoped if those rates went up, the prices would then come down. But Jerome Powell also said there that he expects prices to increase in the short term. Is that what you're seeing and how long will that continue? Well, you know, there's no reason for the prices to go down. Every house that sells is the new limit for the next house to sell. So builders are typically here in the Dallas area, they're selling two houses in a neighborhood, increasing the price 10%, selling a, a house and increasing the price 10%. Why would they take less when supply are still going up? Labor, we're still short of labor and we're not able to get workers. So those guys are gonna have to start paying people more to show up to the jobs. So it's going to be a problem, not only because of uh, inventory, uh, not a lot of inventory homes, but the builders are building as fast as they can. They don't have all the supplies that they need. We are still back ordered on refrigerators, washers and dryers, windows. So you can't build without windows. Exactly. Uh, we do know that a lot of people really got comfortable with that with that 2% mortgage rate. You know, we, people thought it was going to last forever. So then is it that people just weren't positioned correctly? Were they just not really planning for the future as to where rates would have to go? I don't think they were really paying attention to anything. And, and you know, it is a personal family issue always. So if you're making lots of money and you're employed, what does it matter to you if gas prices go up a little bit? Well, people are figuring out it matters a lot. So, you know, I don't think they were prepared. We have been saying this all along. I went back and watched the videos that I did with you guys last year. And I said, inflation's gonna be over 7% and everybody thought I was crazy. Yeah, I was low. I wasn't even high enough. <laughs> so yeah, we knew it was coming in the mortgage business. We've tried to prepare our buyers not to sit on the sidelines and wait. A lot of people are out of the market now, that is true. That's because they rented an apartment and they're in a year lease. They're not doing loan applications because they can't get out of their leases now. So they're stuck until next year around this time. So we're going to see some more movement again next year. But it's going to be after January. Those people are in leases because they could not fight with the competitiveness of the market back in April, May, June of last year. They, they thought it would end like that for, at the end of the year. And it got very, very competitive. They kind of got lost in the shuffle. Not everybody likes all of that busyness and all of that bidding, a lot of people just bowed out. Debbie, you mentioned uh, home builders, the sentiment, how they're feeling right now. We just got that home builder confidence uh, results, the, the results of the survey out earlier today, falling for the sixth month in a row in June. When we talk about the impact that that eventually has on housing, we already have a shortage supply. Is that going, a, a short, uh, supply shortage, is that going to get even worse? I think so. You know, you can only build. We've got a lot of brand new neighborhoods starting, but all the houses are kind of like in this picture. They're at various stages of starting. And you see some of them sitting there empty, but they're, the lots are sold. The people want the houses. They just can't build them fast enough. So we are going to see a shortage of houses. There's been a shortage for years, and it's really not the home builder's fault. They were keeping up fine with demand. I think, in, in like I'm in Dallas, so we have high to high demand. Everybody's moving here. Well, it's also the age of the people are coming of age now with families that they want to buy a house. This is going to be the largest group of 20, 30 year olds buying since the baby boomers. And they're all wanting to buy now. They should have been buying 10 years ago. 
but <laughs> statistics throw something different. They didn't want to move out early. So now we have them all moving out at once. So we have kind of the a meeting of a perfect storm is what I call it. You've got the older people staying in their house because of reverse mortgages. You've got people with 2% rates. They're not moving anytime soon. Dallas, clearly, I think an exception to the rule at this case now, as is Tampa, as is Phoenix and probably a handful of other markets. But coming full circle to what sure. Jerome Powell talked about, how far away do you think that place is where we do see some softening, as he called it? I, I think it's going to be a long while. You know, the supply chain is still a problem for builders. I work with several builders and I have clients that locked rates with me last week and their house will be done in November so we are still blowing and going down here in Texas, but it's not that way for every state. So if you don't have a lot of demand in your area and you've got people that are sitting at those two and three percent interest rates, they're not moving. So it's going to take new home builders in those areas to get new homes built or people are just going to have to move to areas where there is affordable housing. That means the suburbs. That means changing jobs. And if you can work from anywhere, we're going to see a lot of other people not being able to afford the big cities, and they're going to have to go to smaller cities to live and work. Okay, Debbie Boyd, DLB Financial Services. Good to see you. Thanks so much. Coming up, President Biden demands oil companies explain why they're cutting gasoline production as gas prices hit all-time highs Stick around. President Biden pointing the finger at energy giants as the average gas in the United States has topped five bucks a gallon for the first time ever. In a letter to seven major oil corporations, Biden demanding explanations on their high refinery profit margins. For more on this, let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. Rick, is this a serious policy prescription or is this simply aimed at midterm voters? Maybe it's in between, Dave. Uh, up till now, it has seemed like um, Biden is complaining about the oil companies making too much money, and the oil companies are complaining about Biden bashing them. And they're all talking to a microphone, but they're not talking to each other. So now that at least there's an exchange of, 
ideas, I guess you could call it. So Biden sent these letters to uh, seven big oil firms, and these are uh, refiners. These are not necessarily drill. They are drillers, but he's targeting refiners. Uh, and he said, you know, what's a deal? Your profit margins have tripled. They're at record levels. I know you guys have had some economic difficulties in the past. That's a reference to 2020, the COVID shutdowns, when some of these companies just lost tons of money. I mean, they lost billions and billions of dollars in 2020. Uh, and he's basically said, he kind of asked nice, uh, could you guys please produce more oil? But the, this, and his letter also says, my administration is prepared to use all reasonable, appropriate federal government tools and emergency authorities to increase capacity and so on. So I don't know, is that a veiled threat? Maybe. Uh, and then Exxon actually put out a response to this just a short while ago saying, uh, look, we have been increasing refining capacity a little bit as is appropriate. And they said, by the way, if Biden wants, really wants to do something, there are some emergency procedures he could do. And they named a couple specific ones uh, that would make shipping easier and make it a little bit easier to move uh, fuels around among refineries. Um, so they're, they're kind of throwing ideas at each other at this point. I would not call this quite a negotiation, but at least something's happening. I mean, we did see the American Petroleum Institute, you know, responding, saying, look, the president really needs to prioritize unlocking U.S. energy resources. So between the back and forth, whether it's the president trying to sort of appease voters and oil refiners saying, look, this isn't on us. Where does the actual solution lie for this for the American consumer? Here's the problem. Uh, so for Biden to do the, anything that would actually make a difference, he would have to backtrack on some of his green energy pledges. And that would infuriate uh, progressives in the liberal, liberal wing of the Democratic Party. I'll give you just one example. So uh, at least half of those 10 bullet points in the American Petroleum Institute's wish list are things that would basically undo things uh, Biden's green energy uh, plan. So one example is the SEC forcing all this carbon emission disclosure for any firm, not just in oil and gas, but for any firm. Um, the API says, um, why don't you get rid of that rule? Um, and that would be a that would be a powerful signal to Wall Street that you actually stand behind uh, the oil and gas industry. You're not going to basically try to sabotage the industry once oil prices, oil and gasoline prices go down. So the problem is, I just don't think Biden is going to change his climate priorities. And Biden, for his part, the problem he faces, the corner he's in, is that he's he's trying to get oil prices down without doing the things that would actually make a difference because that would be a major reversal of his total energy platform. It's a tough balancing act. It doesn't seem like he's going to win it. A big thank you as always to our very own Rick Newman. Well, if you're tempted to dip into your retirement fund when you're seeing your finances getting strained, relief could be on the way if the Emergency Savings Act of 2022 goes through. For more now on this, we're joined by Jamie Calamarides, senior fellow at Prosperity Now. So. Get us up to speed on where this bill is and what it would actually do in terms of real world uh, application. Yeah, yesterday, the Senate Help Committee passed out of committee the Rise and Shine Act. And of that is a part of is the Emergency Savings Act of 2022. And the Emergency Savings Act of 2022 allows employers to automatically enroll their employees into a savings plan at about 3% of their salary, and it would increase to about $2,500. That would be invested in a principal preservation fund, and they'd have the opportunity to withdraw it once a month without any penalty. They would be, employers would be able to match the employees' contributions into their 401k plan. And if employees left, they'd be able to roll it over into a Roth plan. This is really exciting because workers have real challenges about emergency savings. Jamie, it's a bipartisan... Sorry to cut you off there, but it's a bipartisan bill. This is something that you don't necessarily see too often these days. Democrats and Republicans both coming together on this issue. Are you confident it will get through the legislative process and we will see it get passed? Yeah, so we saw the House version, uh, the Secure 2.0, get passed 414 to 5. This bill, the Emergency Savings Bill, is sponsored by Cory Booker of New Jersey and Todd Young of Indiana. It passed unanimously on a vote, vote out of committee. It is bipartisan. Uh, it is supported by uh, affinity groups, progressives, 
um, industry, et cetera, worker groups, and pretty confident that this can get through. The next step is the Senate Finance Committee next week for a markup, and then it goes to the full Senate floor for a vote. And I want to talk about this letter that you wrote to Chair Patty Murray and Ranking Member Richard Burr on the Committee for Health, Education, Labor and Pensions, otherwise known as HELP. You indicated that 53 percent of families have no liquid emergency savings or less than a month of income saved for emergencies. Talk about some of the key ways that this bill and this act could really help limit that. Yeah, and the numbers are even worse for Black and Latino families. 85% of La Black families don't have a month's worth of savings, 75% uh, of Latino families, and it's not just about low and moderate income families. It 25% uh, of families earning over $125,000 don't have a month's worth of emergency savings. And so it, it is widespread across the country. And what this will do is it will create a nest egg for someone to be able to tap into emergency savings without having to dip into their 401k for a loan or for a hardship withdrawal. And those solutions where people run out of money, and we saw this in the government shutdown, we saw this in the early days of COVID, people tapped into savings that was really meant for the long term. And the challenge with that is that they're borrowing from their future to finance today. This will create a soon savings account, something that they need to use in the, in the current environment and really help them get through bumps in their everyday challenges in their everyday life. Jamie, in the past, Prosperity Now has partnered with some employers. You partnered with Wells Fargo. You partnered with Prudential in order to help employees increase their savings. I'm curious, what has interest been like for those programs from those employees? Yeah, interest has been really high. Now, all of those programs to date have had to be on a voluntary basis. They haven't been automatically enrolled. Yet, those employers have seen up to 40% of individuals sign up for this plan. And we think with automatic enrollment, we're going to see numbers that are consistent with what we see on the 401k side. 80s, 90% of people automatically enrolling in this. And what we see is, is that people use this. They use it appropriately. They take out money when they need to, and then they start contributing back when they need, when they have an opportunity as well in the next paycheck. The nice thing about this program is that they don't have any hassles or forms to fill out. There's no criteria. It's their money. It's after tax contributions, and there's no penalty to take it out. And I want to ask you, because a lot of times when employers hear about some of these benefits, they're like, look, what is this going to cost me? How, how am I going to be able to run my business and provide this? Separate some of the myth uh, from the reality here. Yeah. So employers, this is entirely voluntary. We're not forcing employers to offer this, but employers have a business case to offer these sort of solutions. That is, their employees are tending to use payday loans, or they're using high fee credit cards, or they're tapping into their 401k. Most retirement providers have an ability to offer this sort of solution for an extremely low cost because they already have the hard wiring set up for various forms of contributions. They already have a principal preservation fund as part of their retirement plan. And this is just allocating and keeping track of the money separately. I don't expect this to be a costly solution at all. It is probably going to be as inexpensive as a normal bank account would be. So no, that'll be welcome news for a lot of people obviously struggling with record high inflation right now. So a big thank you to Jamie Calamaridis, their senior fellow at Prosperity Now. Thank you so much. Well, the crypto community is looking for light at the end of the tunnel. As you can see, Bitcoin and Ethereum still down today. But is that light just another train coming to derail it as Bitcoin stumbles today? Well, Bill Gates has no love for certain crypto projects, especially NFTs. Find out why next.
Let's take a look at where stocks settled today. This market check is sponsored by Tastyworks. All three of the major averages ending the day in the green. Now, the move to the upside coming after the Fed announced that it is hiking interest rates by 75 basis points. You can see the Dow closing up just around 303 points. It was up over 600 points in the final hour of trading, but settling back to up just around 1%. The S&P ending its worst five-day route that we have seen for that major average since the start of the pandemic. The S&P closing up just around 1.5%. The move higher today led by the tech sector. You can see the NASDAQ closing up just around 2.5%. Dave? Well, feels like summer, Shauna, but it looks like the crypto winter is here with more than a trillion dollars wiped away since early April and the price of Bitcoin down more than 25% in a week, 50 plus percent this year. Bill Gates pouring salt on the wounds of the crypto community at a TechCrunch climate summit on Tuesday. Listen. I mean, obviously expensive, you know, digital images of monkeys are going to improve the world immensely. Uh, we all agree on and, that. And, uh, you know, that's so incredible. Uh, anyway, I'm used to asset classes where, like a farm, where they have output or a company where they make products. Yeah. To have an asset class that's 100% based on sort of greater fool theory that somebody's going to pay more for it than I do. Josh Katz is the CEO of NFT marketplace Yellow Heart. He joins us now. Josh, good to see you. I'm sure you're thrilled about the sentiment there from Mr. Gates. It is 100% based on greater fool theory. Your reaction? Uh, I agree. You know, I think that this underlying technology is really what it's all about. You know, profile pictures were a great way to begin the world introduction to NFTs, but it's not what blockchain technology is really all about. You know, the provable scarcity, provable ownership of the blockchain has enabled the profile picture, but it's really just the beginning of uh, the use of blockchain technology and Web3. So Josh, Rochelle here then. So where are we in terms of NFTs? Obviously, when something first comes in, a lot of hype, you see a lot of people get into this space, perhaps not using it, as you mentioned there, for the long-term intentions. Where are we in that cycle? And when do you think we'll really get to see NFTs mature as they were meant to be? So we're just beginning. You know, we had the birth of NFTs last year with the profile picture. Um, you know, Bill Gates is referring to the Board 8 Yacht Club, which is the largest profile picture project by revenue. And that project has done extremely well in introducing the world to Web3. Now we're going to start seeing the adoption of this technology into all types of sectors. And I think that we're going to really see the evolution of this starting now, moving into the rest of this year and onward. So I think we do agree then that uh, digital images of monkeys would not necessarily improve the world uh, immensely. So what is the best practical usage application of NFTs? So it's really what an NFT is, is really a programmable contract. So in any instance where there is a contract um, and you have a middleman population, whether it's a broker, an attorney, any type of situation, it could be a lease, it could be a deed, that is an industry that you will have uh, the use of non-fungible tokens or programmable smart contracts. So then I want to ask you then, because Yellow Heart recently announced its first ever NFT ticketing partnership with global hospitality brand Tau Group Hospitality. Talk about the thinking that went into that and what you hope to achieve there. So Yellow Heart, um, you know, has been doing NFT ticketing uh, for, you know, almost a year now. And this partnership is actually with Tal Group, who is by far the largest nightlife operator in the world, uh, the most forward thinking and innovative nightlife and hospitality group in the world. So we are thrilled to be partnering with them. And what we're going to be doing is really evolving ticketing. You know, ticketing to date has never evolved. It's been stagnant. It's been a proof of purchase, a barcode for entry. Whereas now what we do is evolve ticketing where we are embracing building communities around live experiences. So very uh, excited about this partnership. And so what's next in this evolution and how key is the future of sports tickets tied to NFTs? Uh, it, it is the future. So once again, a industry that 
has never evolved, is going to start evolving. And if you think about the live experience, you know, let's take a football game, for instance. You go to the football game, you tailgate, you're in the parking lot, you know, eating, drinking, hanging out with people, having fun. You go into the game, you're high-fying, hopefully your team wins, you're having a great time, and then poof, the experience is over and everyone scatters. With NFT ticketing, we allow for the building of a community where when you buy that ticket, you now enter the community. You're now part of people that are going to have an experience together and you can interact with them. So now the experience begins and when you're scanned into the venue, you now are further enabled into a community that you could be interacting with, that you could be doing commerce with, that you could be really evolving the overall live experience with. And for those companies that are putting on the live experience, whether it's a artist with a concert, a sports team, it then enables for ongoing reach to those consumers to continue monetizing post-event. That's interesting because with NFTs at first, they really were focused on being collectibles, but this seems to sort of be sort of more of a membership way to get into this. How far do you think that's going to go in terms of growing the NFT space? You know, I think utility-driven NFTs are what's coming now. Uh, once again, we had the birth of NFTs a year ago, the profile picture. Now we're seeing incredibly creative companies use this technology in order to push their um, you know, products further and enable community building through NFTs in this case. Um, a lot of other cases, you'll see what's called utility where these NFTs actually do something for the owners and open up doors and open up commerce and allow for people to then trade them. So. Um, I think it's going to really start evolving quickly now. And I want to ask you about prices. Obviously, when we buy a lot of tickets to things, the fees and the things that get priced into that, can we expect to see any sort of relief if it's sort of an NFT ticket? Well, we hope so. That is the goal. And that was actually the goal in Yellowheart was to actually disseminate uh, third party bad actors or scalpers. See, with the blockchain, every single transaction is transparent. So for instance, people hold what's called a wallet and in that wallet is their non-fungible token. And that could be a ticket or any other type of asset. So for instance, at Yellowheart, we could see if a wallet might have bought 12 tickets but didn't redeem any of them. So that person is immediately flagged or that wallet is immediately flagged. So we try to disable scalping. The other thing that will happen is we're able to essentially send a royalty back to the stakeholder. So in the case of scalping a ticket, if a ticket were $100 and it were go for 200, we could program that 50% of that, for example, might go back to the stakeholder. So that will actually really de-incentivize scalping. Josh, the ears of parents across the country just perked up because they've tried to buy their kids tickets to concerts in recent years. And it is an absolute nightmare out there. Bots are buying up tens of thousands, reselling them at 10x. Can this take Ticketmaster out of the equation? Well, you know, I think that it's not about taking Ticketmaster out of the equation. It's about enabling Ticketmaster to give the fans a better experience. Um, the hopes are that they will embrace this technology as well and essentially offer their fans a transparent experience where right now the way that Ticketmaster works is Ticketmaster releases, uh, call it, you know, 20% of tickets. They'll then call the event sold out and then they'll try to maximize revenue on every single ticket leading up to the event through third party marketplaces, through their own quote unquote secondary marketplaces, preferred fan, platinum, whatever name they might be using. The hope here is that artists and teams will embrace this technology, start working with companies like us and essentially give a transparent experience to the fan, maybe charging more for the ticket, but doing everything up front where the prices don't fluctuate so much and there's, and there's less, um, you know, gray, so to speak. Josh Katz, Yellowheart CEO, you have my attention. Appreciate it, sir. Thanks. We'll be right back with our triple play of stocks on the move.
Welcome back, everyone. It is time for our triple play, and I'm going to kick us off because I'm a bit hungry with Beyond Meat. We did see the stock rallying today up about 14% as it expands its cookout classic pack of patties to over 10,000 retail outlets just in time, of course, for the 4th of July and the summer peak grilling season. Now, Beyond Meat still holds the top spot as the best-selling plant-based meat brand in the refrigerated category, but inflation has been taking a bite out of Beyond Meat's momentum. Now, with the average cost of a pound of beef at $3, $1.95 versus $7.29 for a Beyond Meat burger, according to the Good Food Institute. It's a much harder sell for consumers who are already deciding how to spend their discretionary income. Now, the stock is down more than 60% year to date and more than 82% since the pandemic took hold. But the company is pressing on with its expansion beyond chicken tenders announced in April, and they're also stepping up their R&D spending for new products to try and tempt consumers. Yeah, Rochelle, you mentioned that 60% drop year-to-date down significantly from the all-time high. I think that initial excitement that we saw in Beyond Meat certainly starting to wane. It, it'll be interesting to see how big of a boost this actually provides the company. They certainly have been doing a good job just in terms of getting their product into more stores, reaching uh, certainly uh, strategic partnerships that make sense. Yet investor interest still is not there. You mentioned the fact that it's down 60% year-to-date. So we'll see whether or not this flips Wall Street's view of the stock. I'm just not sure that it's going to do it. All right, moving on. I, my play today is Netflix. Shares climbing after Cowan reiterates its outperform rating on the stock. You can see shares up just about 7.5%. In this call, it's all about advertising opportunity. A recent Cowan survey suggesting that a Netflix ad-supported tier, which we've talked about many times here on this show, they're saying that it makes a lot of sense and it could add about 4 million Netflix members in the U.S. and in Canada next year. Maybe this is the answer to their growth problem, subscriber growth problem. Now, Cowan is calling it a, quote, multi-year revenue opportunity, estimating that it would generate about 17 bucks of revenue per member based on a split of 10 bucks ad revenue, $7 of subscription revenue. Now, Dave, the mm. survey also finds that 41% of existing members would switch to an ad-based tier. That was much higher than I thought, wow. but I guess if it's a fraction of the cost, it would make sense. Sign me up. Be I me. Would, I, yeah, it would not be you. Really, I, I will absolutely. I'll, 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 I'll pay the money. I don't want to see the ads. <laughs> I want my piece. <laughs> I'm with you there, Rochelle. See, I'm, with you. I'm one of those families that has every single streaming service. Well, I can trim one of those I am in. And there's a lot of news to digest with Netflix, Shauna. And one thing I also read today is there, there is talk about whether or not they continue with the binge model yeah. or whether they go to a concept like we used to see growing up where it's one episode per week release, which I think is actually come full circle. Ted Lasso is that way, and you build that anticipation, plus it counteracts those people that sign up for a couple of weeks, binge their shows, and then they move on to the next streaming service. I think that's smart, but I don't know about this um, Squid Game reality show. I never got five, into six, it. It was awful. That's I why. never, yeah. It, I loved it. <laughs> Stop it. I feel I like it was such it. anxiety inducing. I didn't even watch it. Just reading and hearing about it, I couldn't even do it. But the reality show, $4.56 million on the line, largest ever, 456 people. I'd be interested in that as long as no one dies. You really like that show? I love it. I was, I was all in. I was all in. Oh. It's horrible and wonderful, like Black Mirror. I love it. <laughs> I did not get through three episodes of Squid Game. Not my fave. But anyway, uh, my play is Microsoft. They say retirement, folks, is not the end of the road. It's the beginning of the open highway. That's not the case with Internet Explorer. It's gone. The once dominant web browser is no longer a thing after a solid run of more than a quarter century. Said Microsoft, not only is Microsoft Edge a faster, more secure, and more modern browsing experience than Internet Explorer, but it also is able to address a key concern, which is compatibility for older legacy websites and applications. Today, the Chrome, the Chrome browser, that's the one I use a lot, dominates with around 65% of market share. It's followed by Apple's Safari, which is just under 20%. As for shares of Microsoft, up about 3% today, but they have fallen more than 25% this year. My question to you is, Rochelle, when you close your eyes and you think of an icon on your computer, is that the one that pops to mind, or are you just too young? Because to me, and to my generation, that's the one. That's the one icon that we can close our eyes and see. This is just good moisturizing fooling you. No, I was, I was around when Internet Explorer was still out back in 1995. But I mean, 
honestly, when Google came on the map, it feels like all bets were off. I mean, they yeah. still have global market share, 64.9%, followed by Safari. And then, of course, Microsoft Edge just at 4%, just a teeny little bit. So Google is the one that I turn to. It, it's it's got to be Google is by far the best. There's no. I, I was actually surprised that 20% of people use Apple Safari. I remember my mom. I wonder if she still uses that as her well, default, does default this count browser. Mobile? No, I even on her computer. Even on her computer, she would use Safari. I need to ask her after the show. That's still the case. <laughs> she might be one of those 20%. Accident. Yeah. Only by accident, I clicked on one of the other. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, here is my stock to watch for tomorrow, and that is Adobe. Now, the software giant reporting after the close. The stock has taken a beating amid the tech wreck that we have seen in recent weeks, down 43% from its most recent high, but that's on the better end for the industry, putting that in perspective for you. Now, the company did post an earnings and revenue beat in the last quarter driven by digital media. It will also be interesting to see if Adobe follows the strong results earlier this week from Oracle. You can see the stock year to date off just around 33%, closing up today, along with the broader market rally, up just around 1.5%. All right, we're going to take a quick break, but coming up, New York City pools are scaling back swim programs due to a nationwide lifeguard shortage. We'll tell you about it when we come back. Just as summer is heating up, a nationwide lifeguard shortage is prompting cities to sink their swimming plans this summer. Mm -hmm. New York City pools cancelling a number of their swimming programs over the next few months because they don't have enough lifeguards. Now, the New York City Parks Department said starting wages for lifeguards are around $16 an hour. Now, I know both of you have worked as lifeguards before. <laughs> so, Shorter, is that, enough? is that enough? Would that make you, is that enough money for you to want to go back and do that? Yes, I think I was making seven or eight dollars an hour and I did it for four or five years. So $16 sounds really good. But I think this is just a result of the pandemic. We had pools closed, training programs were closed. People weren't trained. They got jobs in retail, got jobs in restaurants, making more money. It's hard to make the argument to go back to $16 an hour. And you know my lifeguarding past. I was a lifeguard for one yeah, we day. Had a very different experience One day with before it. I quit. No, I would not do it for $16 <laughs> an hour. The eyes are on New York City, but this is a nationwide problem. The National Parks and Recreation Association said eight out of ten parks and recs across the country are short staffed, and this could affect a third of pools across the country this summer. This breaks my heart for kids that need to learn the life skill 
of swimming. Foreign workers have also been a big problem. In the yeah, certainly. Lack Especially, thereof. I'm trying to get my three-year-old to swim, so hopefully we're able to find swim lessons you. in the summer. It's you. I know, I know. That's what my parents always make the argument. They're like, you used to teach swim lessons. Why aren't you jumping in there? But I'm going to have to do that. All right, well, that does it for us today on Yahoo Finance. For myself, Dave Briggs, and Rochelle Kufo. thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you right back here again tomorrow. Have a great night.